the next in the series of spacewalks uh, for uh, cosmonauts Artemiev and Medvedev is scheduled for Thursday, April 28th. Uh, during that spacewalk, assuming everything goes as planned today, they will be removing and jettisoning a series of thermal blankets uh, covering uh, the European uh, robotic arm. They will be releasing uh, a series of launch locks on the grappling mechanisms or the two ends of the uh, uh, European robotic arm where the grapple fixtures are located. Uh, they uh, will be uh, also verifying uh, the operation of the roll joints. Uh, they'll be uh, deblocking, as they call it, uh, basically uh, enabling the uh, torque and force sensor rigidization mechanism on the robotic arm. And uh, it will actually take its first movement away from its base point, the arm will uh, to move uh, a few inches away just to verify that it uh, actually is receiving the commands through the uh, control panel that will be installed by Artemiev and Matveyev during today's spacewalk. That uh, second in the series of these European robotic arm outfitting spacewalks is scheduled on Thursday, April 28th, and again, we'll be providing live coverage of that here on NASA television, again beginning at 9 a.m. Central Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Time on NASA television. Set it to one uh, for your um, heat settings. Well, um, it was pretty chilly here, so I set it to one. Okay, it's set to one now. So, and Dennis, for you, the heat setting uh, and the... Settings for <clears throat> your um, hot and cold uh, for the suit are um, comfortable. Yeah, I'm just adjusting them as um, I go, as needed. What do you see on the calendar? Five minutes, 27 seconds for EV-1, and uh, the same for EV-2. All right, then uh, please prepare uh, cue card number six. All right, that's going to be for depressed to 12 millimeters. Okay. So our pneumatic valve is off. Our primary regulator. Primary regulator, what's uh, its status for you, Dennis? Checking. I have the flag on the right. I have it on the right. O2 primary tank. Um, I have the flag on the right as well, and for me too. 
Primary uh, pump. Okay, for us, it's going to be the backup pump. Yes, it's kind of getting chilly. All right, and we are standing by for, for the deep press. Do you have um, O2 open? Set, yes. Now stand by till the counter gets all to zeros, and then you'll proceed with a step 9.2 MRM to deep press. Copy. Station Moscow on Space to Ground 1 for Sergei. Okay, for the uh, pre breathe, we still have two minutes. Okay, we copy. Two minutes left on the pre-breathe. Station Moscow on space to ground one for Sergei. Go ahead. Sergei, uh, we got chairs and you can start with procedure 2.5. So, please check what are your settings for hot and cold. Um, and uh, Sergey, you can proceed with the error activation activities. It's going to be 2.5. That's good. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, we're continuing uh, to listen uh, to the conversations on orbit uh, between Oleg Artemyev and Denis Matveyev in the airlock of the Poisk module on the space-facing side of the Russian segment of the International Space Station as they talk uh, to Russian flight controllers uh, at the Russian Mission Control Center outside of Moscow. The two crew members are suited up in their Russian Orlan spacesuits, ready to begin a spacewalk uh, a short time from now, in which they'll venture outside of Poisk, move down to the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module, and begin work uh, on the outfitting and activation of the European robotic arm that is affixed uh, to the outside of uh, the MLM, as it is called, the Multipurpose Laboratory module. Set to injector manual. Please the uh, Poisk airlock is in the process of being okay. depressurized. Once that occurs, uh, the two uh, cosmonauts uh, will 
conduct checks of their communication systems. They'll conduct a final leak check on their suits and other systems checks uh, with the Russian flight controllers before opening the hatch to Poisk that will mark the official start of the 249th spacewalk in support of space station assembly, maintenance, and upgrades. I need to be a little bit closer. Oleg, if you are ready, you can start with step 9.2. Are you ready? MRM2 depress. O2 flow selected to injector position. It's in the injector position. I have it in the injector position as well. Copy. LED is illuminated. And now we are opening KSD SO valve, and we are dropping to um, pressure of 350 down to 300 millimeters. Copy. KSD SO valve is open. So please monitor the um, suit pressure and then MV pressure. Okay, uh, for EV102 pressure and for The module five one zero. Suit pressure is zero three and zero two, and uh, four eighty is the pressure in the um, module in MRM two. Please monitor if the pressure is in within the range and. If it is in the uh, range, then we will open as the SO. Our right pressure is 420 and for 0 0.38 for EV1 and 0 0.39 for EV2 suit pressures. 400, uh, 400 is for the uh, module depress. Uh, 380 and 0 0.39 is for the suit. All right. And for space to ground one, all the settings are are correct. Okay, please switch to point 2.6 for the error operations. And then please close the window. Copy. 320 is the pressure, 0 0.38 is the EV1 um, pressure, 0 0.39 uh, is EV2 pressure, and um, Oleg, you can uh, open the um, KSD2, KSD, so uh, the pressure is 380. And 0 0.38 is for the suit pressure. Copy. 0 0.38 is for the suit pressure. Okay, that's good. So please stand by for the uh, 20 millimeter points. Uh, when the pressure in MRM2 reaches 20 millimeter points, you will have to close the guys there to 0 0.38 is the pressure in the suit. Copy. 0 0.38. So please, uh, what, what do you see on the counter for the injector? Three minutes. Copy. All right. MRM2 pressure is 200. 0 0.38 is for EV. Two cosmonauts are reporting on uh, pressure readings. Inside uh, the Poisk module airlock, uh, which is being depressurized down to vacuum in a multi step fashion, Artemiev uh, is wearing the Orlon suit uh, with the red stripes as EV1 or extravehicular crew member number one, about to begin the fourth spacewalk of his career. Matveyev, a first time space flyer, embarking on the first spacewalk of several that he will be conducting with Artemiev. Uh, in the uh, conduct of the outfitting and activation of the European robotic arm. Matveyev will wear the Orlon suit uh, with the blue stripes as EV2 or extravehicular crew member number two.
Uh, to the left. Shift to the left. Okay. So, what uh, does the timer say? 127 seconds. 0.38, uh, the pressure is in the spacesuit. Copy. All right, so when the timer uh, starts the direct countdown, so please switch off both switches. So the module pressure is 100 and 038 is in the spacesuit, so the direct countdown has started. Copy. And this, the uh, LEDs are not illuminated? No. So the module pressure is 90 and spacesuit 037. Okay, so you will have to shift uh, the switches to the uh, space suit, unintelligible, but before that, uh, you will receive the message. Copy. Okay, so on the PSS panel, the O2 open EVA message. Did you acknowledge the message? The view of the uh, Poisk module in which. Uh, Module Mar Artemiev and uh, Matveyev are suited up in the process of depressurizing the airlock that will lead uh, to the opening of the hatch that will mark the official start of today's spacewalk. The first uh, for Expedition 67, the fourth out of the International Space Station this year. Injector is deactivated. Yes, I confirm. It is deactivated. 60 is the module pressure. Copy. 037 is in millimeters in the spacesuit. Copy. Copy. Sounds good. Five zero is in the module. Copy. And uh, Alex, stand by for the message. This uh, uh, um, module pressure is 45.45. So stand by for the message that it is in the O2 open EVA position. And I have not received this message yet. I have the message, BSS O2 open ED, 35 millimeters, 37 millimeters, copy. Okay, so once there is 20 millimeters, uh, then you will uh, switch the uh, BSS O2 open EVA. Copy. So when we reach 20 millimeters, uh, then we will uh, put the switch in that position. Copy. The module pressure is 27 millimeters. Zero 036 millimeters is in the space suit. Zero 036 for EV2. EV2 operator copy. 25. 25. The mark mark was passed. Copy.
20 millimeters, so put it in the O2 V position. And at 12 millimeters, we will close the as the depressed valve. Copy. Yes, so first that uh, valve KSD and then um, the uh, another valve KSD SO also should be closed at 12 millimeters. Copy. So far we have 18 millimeters. Unintelligible. Okay, this is Sergey. I am uh, performing the loading of the um, database. What is the pressure on MV? It is 13 millimeters now. Copy. Now we have reached 12. I am closing as the two valves. It is closed, and now as the S or interface is also closed. Zero thirty-seven a point thirty-seven millimeters is the space suit pressure. Copy. Now you will have to perform MRM two final leak check. Copy. So the next Q card will be seven. Number seven is Orlan transition to autonomous power. So you put it on six, and when the cooling down starts, you perform the Q card number seven. So you will disconnect the umbilical, and uh, you monitor that the pressure in the uh, the tanks 
Welch is nominal, nominal, and then you will stand by for five minutes. It is 10. Okay, 10. Copy. How much time has passed already? Four minutes. Sounds good. Copy. Denise, when in one minute you will again look at the MV, uh, please do it carefully, okay? Copy. This is Mission Control Houston, the depressurization of the uh, Poisk airlock. You're looking at the Poisk module on the space-facing side of the Russian segment of the International Space Station. That depressurization is complete. Uh, we're standing by for a variety of different systems checks for Oleg Artemyev and Denis Matveyev uh, before they uh, are declared ready to roll with the uh, opening of the hatch to the airlock that will mark the official start of today's spacewalk. This will be the fourth spacewalk for Oleg Artemyev, the first for Denis Matveyev, who launched it together along with their intravehicular crew member, Sergei Korsakov, on a uh, Russian Soyuz vehicle, the MS-21. That launch occurring uh, some three weeks ago. This thermal conditioning belt to sixth position, yes. And please stand by for my go to continue. Okay, standing by. And it, the uh, cooler dryer is in position six. Now it's a go to perform Q card seven or land transition to autonomous power. Okay, so we're deactivating the pump, the fan. And activate uh, the backup pump and backup fan, copy, in work, and the transmitter, unintelligible. So the power switch should be in autonomous position. So now the EV one is on autonomous power and the time 14.40, to be more exact. EV2 also transitioned at the same time. Copy. And Oleg Artemyev uh, confirming that both he and Medvedev have switched uh, their Orlan spacesuits to uh, battery power 
for a U.S.-based spacewalk. That would mark the official start of a spacewalk, but uh, for the Russians, it is marked from hatch open to hatch close. Mode uh, is being deactivated right now. Yes, the LED is not illuminated now. And uh, so the electrical umbilical is this this uh, demated from Orlan. Yes, and please cover uh, Orlan electrical connector with MLI. So we will cover it and we will stow it now. EV1 demated the electrical umbilical. Copy. And what about electrical connector? It should be covered with a... And the two cosmonauts reporting good leak checks on their suits, so we are on the verge of uh, them being given the green light to open the hatch. Did you demate the... That will mark the official start of today's spacewalk. There are a number of spacewalks uh, that lie ahead uh, over the next several months uh, to activate and operate uh, the European robotic arm in its infantile state of operation uh, at the International Space Station. This will include uh, the next spacewalk in which a number of launch locks will be released and the arm itself will take uh, some baby steps away from its respective uh, grapple fixtures on both ends of the 37-foot-long arm. The arm will be used to transfer a radiator uh, that is mounted on the uh, multi-purpose laboratory module to its uh, fixture point, its final point of operation, uh, to unfurl and be used uh, for heat dissipation, and then also to move an airlock around from its stowed position on the uh, Naoka module to its uh, deployed uh, position. That is where uh, most of the Russian spacewalks will be mounted in the uh, years ahead. Naoka having replaced the piers docking compartment, when it was launched uh, last July, and then added to it the Prichal node module, to which a Soyuz is currently docked, that is a multi-port docking node for a number of Russian vehicles that will be arriving at the International Space Station in the months and years ahead. Copy. And what about fluid umbilical? It should be placed in its uh, place location, correct? So please plug uh, the fluid umbilical uh, with uh, caps and copy of a storage cap and cover a line fluid umbilical controller with MLI flaps in work. So fluid umbilical is covered with a storage cap for EV1 copy. Now please uh, cover a line fluid umbilical connector with MLI flap. Okay. EV1 has kept uh, the fluid umbilical. Copy, Dennis. Now, uh, please cover a land fluid umbilical connector with flap. Yes, it is closed with MLI flap. Alec, what about your uh, connector? It is closed. Okay, so BSS MRM2 should be in position if EV closed, O2 closed. Copy for EV-1 and for EV-2. Two cosmonauts conducting leak checks as the International Space Station flies 261 statute miles over Canada to the southeast of Ontario. 
moving from southwest and northeast on this orbit of the Earth that is inclined 51.6 degrees to either side of the equator. So on the display, uh, on the upper line, so what is the uh, O2 pressure? 410 for EV2 and 408 for EV1. Copy. Sounds good. Now, this view of the uh, Poisk module, uh, alongside of it is the uh, Strela boom, Strela, the Russian word for arrow. This is a 50-foot-long telescoping boom that the cosmonauts and other spacewalkers uh, in the past have used to uh, basically uh, maneuver uh, to various work sites along the Russian segment of the International Space Station. MV pressure reading, please, before we part. MRM2 pressure is 10, 10 millimeters. Well, maybe 11, about 11 millimeters. Copy, Alex, thank you. In this orientation, in this view, uh, the cosmonauts, once they emerge from the Poisk airlock, they'll move uh, from the bottom of the Strela boom to the top of your screen, where they will uh, begin to set up their tools, their tethers, and other equipment that they'll be using uh, during the course of today's spacewalk. So, Denise, now you will have to uh, rotate a little bit. Oh, Alec, Denis, this is Sergei. I am greeting you. Hello, Sergei. We are happy to hear your voice. I hope everything is nominal with you. Uh, and uh, you're in good mood. Yes, that's the most important uh, thing to be ready for work. Okay, so we are standing by for your commands and goes. Now, please uh, check that all the hardware uh, is secured and the tools are secured as well. We are checking that everything is secured. Crew look back is secured uh, by two point in two points, and the long hook is secured to the handrail, and the short one uh, also is secured. Copy. Okay, let me check as well. This is EV1. Okay, I will strengthen this out. Денис, Олег, у нас сейчас прогнозируется прерывание связи минут на пять-семь. Олег, we will have a five-minute LOS. So. Let us wait until uh, the comm uh, is reliable, and then we, I will give you go to proceed. And in the meantime, please prepare the hatch tool, uh, you know, to work with it and uh, check all the tethers and all the hardware. All right, sounds good. So please stand by. 
of after the LOS, we will give you a go. Copy. Now let's see, check the hatch. So, Denis, while we have come, let's continue. So, so look at the four uh, emergency boats and check them. Uh, emergency valves. So, two are open. And I actually checked them before the depress. So the all four are open, correct? Yes, that's correct. Copy. So the uh, handles on the covers should be in the position closed, and they should be directed uh, towards each other. They are covered with MLI, actually. They should be, uh, they are uh, on the same plane and they are directed to each other. Yes, uh, I'm checking. So everything is nominal with the handles. Do you confirm? Yes, they are directed to each other toward each other, and uh, there are arrows that are pointing in the, that direction. Copy now. Let's continue. So we will become, uh, might uh, break any time, but let's continue in the meantime. So should we start opening? All right. Uh, so the adjustable tether. Yes. Uh, yes, I have the tether. It, it is behind you. I think maybe you just, you should disconnect it for me. All right, we'll do. Here you go. And uh, in, in such a manner, so uh, don't hurry up. Okay, now let us start the, op the opening of the EV hatch. So use the, the uh, hatch tool and uh, please make sure uh, that all the rollers are moving in the right direction along the guidelines. Okay, Denise, how are we doing? So this cover should uh, should have been. Yes, that's correct. Stand by, Denise. Stand by. Let me secure it here. With the uh, depressurization of the Poisk airlock and other systems checks out of the way, uh, Artemiev and uh, Medvedev about to open up the hatch to the Poisk module to mark the start of today's spacewalk. I'm not doing anything. Copy. So go ahead uh, and uh, uh, hand over the hook to me. There it goes. 
Олег Денис, как там ситуация по поводу люка? Удалось? Олег Денис, how is it going with the hatch? Have you been able to open it? Uh, it's in the process of being opened. And uh, we're coming up uh, on a uh, loss of uh, signal. Everyone. So that's why I'm uh, dropping out. So the rollers are out, uh, and I'm ready to uh, now start using the hatch tool, the pusher. Uh, okay, so um, make sure that uh, you pull uh, the handle uh, towards yourself to hard stop uh, and hold it there until the, uh, the pressure drops. Uh, all right, uh, it's in work. Is it going down? Yes, okay, that's great. Uh, you see, uh, the uh, uh, vacuum cleaner is uh, working. And uh, we're getting close to zero. Uh, go ahead and uh, start opening the hatch. Did the pressure drop? Yes. Opa, look at it. Uh, the hatch is open. Uh, look at it. hatch is open. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, now remove the hooks uh, from uh, the um, uh, tethers uh, and uh, uh, secure it on the ring. Uh, yes, it is already done. Go ahead and uh, uh, take the ring. Stand by. Okay, I'm holding the ring. And with that call, the uh, 249th spacewalk in support of station assembly maintenance and upgrades officially underway at 10.01 a.m. Central Time, 11.01 a.m. Eastern Time. Artemiev and Medveyev now in the midst of uh, the first spacewalk of several that they will conduct in support of the European uh, robotic arms activation and operation. The uh, start time, 10.01 a.m. Central, 11.01 a.m. Eastern Time. Start installing the protective ring. Yes, go ahead and install the protective ring. Uh, please retrieve uh, the uh, protective ring uh, from its storage location. Uh, yes, we have done that already. You see, there they are. Yes, uh, I can see it now. So take a look. It, it should the uh, mark should be on the other side. Can you see it? Yes. So let's uh, let's give it a try. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me pull it some. All right. So the protective ring is now installed and secured. And the first task uh, having been completed quickly are. Temiev and Madveyev installing a protective ring around uh, the hatch to the Poisk airlock. This designed uh, to ensure that uh, no impacts from uh, any micrometeoroid uh, debris particles impinge on the integrity of the airlock seal. Madveyev will be the first uh, to leave the Poisk airlock. Again, he'll be wearing the suit with the blue stripes, helmet camera number 20. Art, uh, Artemiev will follow, wearing uh, the suit with the red stripes, helmet camera number 16. Uh, let me uh, check where, in what direction we should uh, translate. Okay, so I have installed the short one uh, on the outside. And uh, let me get the long one. Oleg, Denis, Oleg, uh, Denis, uh, Protective ring has been installed and secured, and the Dennis is uh, uh, half uh, way of outside already. All like Dennis, how copy? Yes, we copy you loud and clear. Uh, we noticed that something came out of the hatch. Did you uh, see what it was? It was a piece of Velcro and uh, a piece of uh, rubber from... Well, it wasn't uh, holding anything. It was just uh, sitting there somewhere. 
go ahead and send in the sublimator. I, yes, it's, it is uh, indeed getting hot. Oleg. Oleg, did you install the ring? Yes, uh, just uh, to repeat, the ring has been installed and Denis is halfway outside. We're sending by for uh, the sublimator activation. Did you copy? Oh. Oleg, yes, go ahead. Uh, Oleg, uh, how uh, is the temperature in your suit? Well, it's uh, quite warm. I guess uh, uh, we need to turn on the sublimator. Uh, yes, go ahead and uh, uh, turn it on uh, first. Okay. Uh, sublimator is on. And uh, put it on three. Uh, to begin with. Okay, it is uh, set on three. Uh, okay, so let's uh, just wait now and uh, uh, please report uh, when you feel that it, uh, it has begun uh, cooling down. Uh, yes, we'll do. Denis. Denis, uh, yes, go ahead. I'm half uh, uh, way out uh, of the EV hatch and I'm sending by for uh, your go to turn on the sublimator. Yes, uh, your go. And uh, you can also uh, set it to three. Okay, you said three. Sublimators are on. And now we will tra uh, start translating towards the uh, operator post. Copy. Flying over western Algeria from northwest to southeast. A view of uh, Denis Matveyev outside of the Poisk module beginning the first spacewalk of his career less than a month after arriving at the International Space Station along with Oleg Artemiev, who will be joining him outside momentarily, and uh, Sergei Korsakov, who is inside, uh, who helped uh, the two cosmonauts suit up today. Very reliably, and uh, it is locked with uh, two locks. So it's all well and good. Excellent. Artemiev will be passing a crew lock bag uh, to uh, Matveyev, in which is the uh, European uh, robotic arm spacewalk control panel device that uh, the two uh, crew members will spend uh, a, considerable, um, a considerable amount of time today installing and checking out uh, in the first step on the road to activating and uh, beginning uh, the maneuvering of the European robotic arm, its first motion expected during the next spacewalk by these two cosmonauts and on April 28th. I'll, uh, hand you the, uh, I guess, the control unit. Uh, Denis, you need to move closer to the operator post because uh, uh, Oleg uh, will start translating uh, there as well. Okay, sounds good. Denis, you need to uh, move in the opposite direction towards the operator post, towards the uh, trailer. Boom. Just move up. Uh, 
Denise, let's pause uh, for now and make sure that you have time to adapt. All right, I'm ready now. So now you are in the correct position. Stop. Uh, give yourself some time to adapt. Uh, we are uh, seeing you through the cameras. And, uh, and make sure uh, that uh, you uh, are translating slowly and move about slowly to save yourself the manager. Okay. And Oleg, you can start setting up notable. It is already outside. I have already taken it out. Excellent. So uh, give yourself some time to adapt to the environment, and we'll take it from there. Okay, sounds good. Oleg, inaudible. Say again. What came out through the hatch just now? I wasn't looking there. I'm uh, monitoring the uh, control unit now, but nothing serious, I guess. Because uh, we have everything we need, and uh, nothing uh, for now has uh, floated away. Denis, how are you? Great. Are you hot? Denis, have you adapted to the environment? Uh, we are taking out the Amy. EMMI. And the control pa panel is now outside of the uh, uh, hatchway. And uh, Oleg Artemiev now outside of the Poisk airlock, uh, having joined Matveyev along with the crew lock bag in which uh, are tools, other equipment uh, to support today's spacewalk, and most importantly, the uh, European robotic arm spacewalk control panel box. And uh, make sure that uh, you take out the uh, PRM adapter. Uh, all right, sounds good. Denise, where are you? I'm here. All right. And your equipment tether is now secured. Uh, yes, it, it is secured. So both are secured. And you can see uh, right behind the Strela boom, uh, the rectangular box that Matveyev is holding. That is the enclosure for the uh, control panel box for the European robotic arm that will be mounted and installed and hooked up to electrical cables and data cables on the outside of the multipurpose laboratory module later in today's spacewalk. Uh, it is all secured well. Okay. Excellent. Uh, okay, so I am. Uh, I will now start translating and moving the param adapter. Okay. Uh, let's move it closer. And uh, also, guys, make sure that you uh, visually build the path, uh, the transition path that uh, you're going to use. Okay. Uh, Denise, you will be near the uh, operator post until Oleg is uh, finished taking everything out. Uh, 
Денис, please do not move away. Please wait for me. All right, I'm uh, standing by now. Uh, and uh, so, Denis, uh, take this time to adapt to the environment while Oleg is uh, working with the Ethereum adapter. So, how how does it feel? How do you feel? Can you share? Well, it's uh, interesting. <laughs> So I guess it's just uh, the temperature that's uh, yeah, high. Uh, we, we didn't. Is, uh, we did not uh, copy all it, but I think that uh, it's, it is already cooling down. Yes, yes. temperature, indeed, there is such a criteria, criterion, and it should be lower at this point, but we'll keep monitoring. The International Space Station flying over Western Africa at an altitude of 261 statute miles. On the left side of your screen is the Northrop Grumman Cygnus cargo vehicle. Overall. In the middle is the uh, Rosviet module on the Earth-facing side of the Russian segment of the station, and on the right is the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module. Well, Atop which is the uh, bulbous uh, Prishal node module, and docked to it the Soyuz MS-21 that transported Oleg Artemyev, Denis Matveyev, and Sergei Korsakov to the International Space Station about uh, a month ago. Regulator, uh, it, it should be in the central position in sector three. Also, you can both activate automated thermal control system. All right, activate an ICER automated thermal control system. Mine is also on copy. They're coming out from underneath the panels. Okay. Uh, what uh, what just came out? It's a rubber seal uh, that came out from underneath the panel, and I did see that. So what about the adapter, param adapter is a bit closer now, and I secured it to make sure it doesn't uh, fall away. Well, Start moving now. Yes, uh, you can uh, start uh, translating now. It's beautiful out here. Okay, I need to turn this off. Uh, we, we don't need it. The fixed length tether hook is uh, outside. 
And uh, adjustable um, is also outside, so both the tethers are outside now. And uh, when uh, should we turn on the camera or something else? Well, since you're out now, you can go ahead and turn on the cameras. I got tangled up uh, somehow. Just stand by. The camera is on. Okay. But I can, uh, I, I, I can see it now. Maybe Oleg uh, can uh, check it out later. Do not turn on the camera yet. Do not turn on the cameras yet. Oleg, Denis. Oleg, Denis. Uh, you, you can put the temperature reg regulator handle to uh, zero. For both of you, please uh, put it to uh, zero. Uh, EV2 is uh, at uh, zero. Copy. Now uh, you're going to turn on the cameras. Activating the cameras now. Okay. My uh, sublimator is now at uh, zero. Uh, I mean the uh, heat exchanger uh, handle. Copy. EV2 uh, confirms that uh, two camera LEDs are illuminated. Oleg, yes, go ahead. Big one is uh, below, and the small one. Is not able. I just can sit here. Are they illuminated? Yes, so so both cameras are on. Is that correct? Yes, so cameras for EV1 and EV2 are on. All right, so I'll start securing the equipment. Uh, and uh, please secure uh, crew log bags on uh, your, your tethers. The uh, oxygen uh, flow rate is 80, inaudible. Again, I go ahead. Isn't there anything in the way or not? There's a short tether here. Okay, here it is. And uh, you can uh, also secure EMI on your short tether as well. This view uh, from a balcony camera in the Russian Mission Control Center outside of Moscow. We are 23 minutes into uh, today's spacewalk by Artemiev and Matveyev. Artemiev still passing equipment out of the Poisk airlock to Matveyev as they stage all of their equipment, including uh, the enclosure box uh, in which uh, the European Robotic Arm Spacewalk Control Panel is located. That is uh, the focus of attention in the early portion of today's spacewalk uh, in which the two cosmonauts will attach and hook up that uh, critical control panel uh, to uh, a base point 
an operating point on the uh, Naoka multipurpose laboratory module. They will use the Strela boom uh, to make their way uh, from the Poisk airlock all the way up to Naoka, which will be their workstation for the entire spacewalk today. Uh, Tether with the large uh, hook is uh, installed, uh, is secured on the uh, suit tether, and then the other one is uh, uh, now secured on swing arm. Will it work? Yes. And and I'll uh, install the EMMI equipment tether on uh, your tether. Yes, I can see it. It's right here. And also uh, make sure that uh, you check the uh, adapter on the outside. Yes, I can see it now. And the wind nut is uh, uh, also tightened. And Oleg, inaudible, please monitor the EMI position. Uh, yes, I, I'm holding it. And a view of uh, Oleg Artemiev uh, wearing the suit with the red stripes outside of the Poisk airlock at the early uh, portion of his fourth spacewalk of his career. The two cosmonauts will soon make their way up that Strela boom that you see between them to the uh, workstation, the work site on the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module that arrived at the International Space Station with the European robotic arm last July. The other hook is now secured on the fixed length uh, tether. Copy, and uh, EV2 confirms the same config. Copy. Uh, copy, Oleg. And Denise, are you holding it? Do you have it? Uh, yes, I uh, do. And if you are ready, please uh, start moving towards the uh, STU. Uh, so, uh, start uh, moving. Uh, towards uh, the uh, MLM on S7. Uh, uh, Oleg and Denis, uh, just heads up, we're coming up on an eclipse in about two to three minutes. Yes, uh, and my uh, adjustable length tether is secured on the ring. Copy. And what about the ring? The ring is uh, on the tether. Okay, that's good. This is Mission Control Houston, as is uh, often the case uh, with the Russian spacewalk. The uh, start time of today's spacewalk has been slightly adjusted. The official start time that we've just received from Russian flight controllers at the Russian Mission Control Center, now 10 a.m. Central Time straight up. 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So we are coming up on the 29-minute mark in today's spacewalk for about uh, uh, five minutes or so. So just continue translation uh, towards uh, the uh, ML MRM. Copy. Okay, uh, move closer. And, uh, and I'm just going to uh, hang here for now uh, to make sure that uh, it works for you. to turn on uh, Orlan or U.S. Uh, lights. 
uh, to for better illumination. Well, thank you, Moscow, for that. The uh, two cosmonauts uh, about to uh, turn on their helmet cameras and then begin uh, to make their way up the Strela boom to the uh, Naoka multipurpose laboratory module now that they've collected all of their equipment, including the European robotic arm control panel box that will be installed uh, on a uh, equipment point, a base point, on uh, the multipurpose laboratory module and hooked up electrically with data cables and electrical cables so that uh, the Russian flight controllers can conduct a systems check and a health check of that new equipment. Again, the uh, start time of today's spacewalk slightly adjusted. We are now officially marking uh, the start time with hatch open at 10 a.m. Central 11 a.m. Eastern Time. There you go. Where are you? I'm right here. Don't push it. Don't push it. Okay. I've got the um, French hook. Stand by. And I have it attached to the ring. Great. And let me give you my small short tether. Are you, uh, do, you've got the EMMI? Yes. Hold it. Holding it. And I have you secured to the ring. Now we need to um, open up the ring. Well, let's not forget about the lights. I turn them on then, meanwhile. Stand by. We need to take off this um, tether. And where do you want me? Leave it somewhere. Somewhere you have a place to secure it to. Oleg, this is Moscow. Dennis Oleg, have you opened up that ring? Yes. We have it free. And now we are rolling. Okay, so you are moving on to MLM. Please do not forget to secure your safety tether to the ring. Dennis, hold on. There you go. Dennis has the EMMI. And I am checking along and moving. Now, we need to round it out. Hold on, don't move. Guys, be careful about the Pahoa. There is a target there, so please be aware. Dennis, stand by. I'm not seeing it. Don't, no rush. I'm standing. Artemiev and Medveyev now making their way up the uh, Strela boom, the 50 foot long telescoping boom that is used uh, as a uh, translation path for cosmonauts uh, conducting spacewalks out of the International Space Station's Russian segment. They will arrive at the work site on the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module shortly and uh, will begin to set up all of their gear at that work site for the uh, temporary stowage of the uh, European robotic arm control panel box prior to its installation onto the surface of Naoka. Wow. We're kind of far. Now, move up a little bit. Hold on. Why do I, I don't need to go all the way up? And that very top is pretty far away. Okay, guys, we've got the video back. When you get to the Strela, boom. And we see that you are almost at MLM. Yes, we are almost there. We're almost there, and we are receiving video from your cameras, right? And we have the lights. And uh, the first view from the helmet camera of Oleg Artemiev, 
who soon will become the commander of the International Space Station. Okay. The day prior oh. to the Crew 3 undocking, he'll be taking over command of the station from NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn. You need to and secure the tether from the crew lock bag and secure it to the uh, MLM handrail. Well, I'm thinking that first first we need to kind of dock here. Right, of course, you need to stop till full stop and then secure the tether. Right. So I am secured with one tether to the MLM module. It's uh, blinking here. We should probably need. Uh, we should probably secure it in some other way. Hold on. Hold the MMI, Oleg. Oleg, if you have the time available, let's think how we can secure it better. And now, please continue moving. We are on the same page. I'm not saying anything here. I'm just uh, securing uh, the crew lock bag a little bit better so that I can take the adjustable tether. Copy, Oleg. Dennis, I'm here. Hold this ring here. And we're securing it with a to the handrail. Okay, let me hook it right here. Now we've got it all secure. And I'm thinking, should I connect, should I leave it here or to the handrail over there, or should we stick to just one handrail? Well, just uh, make sure that the ring doesn't slide. Okay, we have the ring secured. Perfect, Oleg. Okay, we got one less thing to worry about. And now... Now we'll continue moving. All right, our legs are going to be in that direction. Understood. Uh, we are at handrail 4,100. Okay, can you unhook my French hook? Thank you. A big thank you. Now, let me secure it a little bit further, and I'll come back to you. There we go. We see it, guys. It's a little bit tangled, like it got a little bit tangled up here. So, I am switching the ring to over here. There, there. Let me move a little bit further. Now, look. It's tangled to this little thingy here. There. And uh, that's really convenient with zero G. Do you have the EMMI? Here is the EMMI. Slow, slow. Okay, that's uh let me see. Okay, could you hold the MMI for now? Got it. Thank you. Okay. 
people. Unintelligible. And we'll hook it right here. Hold, hold. Okay, I'm holding it, and you start translating. So, Oleg, both of you are on MLM right now. Is that correct? No. I am currently handling the EMMI, and Dennis is switching to the handrails. Um, and once he's there, he will be able to take over, and I will translate as well. Go ahead. And Oleg, please don't forget to about the safety and that you need to be secured. Okay. No. Hold the MMI. Got it. Hold on. And let's move it a little bit further. And let's use this little handrail, teeny. There. Okay, I got it. And let's uh, switch the hook to here. Okay, so Oleg, you are we see the you are on MLM and you are ready to translate. Yes, we're taking it slow and steady. I am on forty one. Zero three and Dennis is uh, forty one zero one. That's where he's um, secured. Copy. You got the MMI. I got it. Dennis, Oleg, how are you? Dennis, could you check that you have both lights on? Dennis, please check that you've got both lights on. All right. We only have one light for U.S. lights on. Uh, I only have the right one. And I have the Russian light, the other one lights on. Is it enough light for you, or do you want to take a break and make sure that all of the lights are working? Oleg, would you be able to assist Dennis? Of course I will be. No, 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 don't worry. I'm fine. So, do you need more light, Dennis? I'm fine. 
Нам свет -то. Зачем Why do you... This is Mission Control Houston, 45 minutes into uh, today's spacewalk that began at 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The two cosmonauts, Oleg Artemiev and uh, Denise Matveyev, are at the work site along the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module that arrived at the International Space Station last July. Artemiev, uh, currently at the top of your screen, is currently holding uh, the European robotic arm control panel box that will be installed and tested today during the spacewalk. This is the 249th spacewalk in support of space station assembly and maintenance, as well as upgrades. Uh, AC system and the temperature is very, very comfortable and really good temperature controls. How for you, Dennis? Uh, we're glad. I'm going to 4107 and I'm monitoring the um, EMMI. Dennis is here. He is handing me the kit over and will continue to translate. Copy. Hold on. There is a little, it's a little tricky here. Be careful, don't um, touch the antenna with your head. Okay, I am one more flight down, so to say, a section. All right, 4110. And we got the Oleg. And 4109. That's where I am. I am. I am here next to Bedel Three Aero Base Point Three. Be Oleg. Be mindful how much you are spending the battery. I'm uh, forty-one um, eleven and forty-one twelve, and I'm monitoring the. Whole process, okay. I got it. The EMMI. Now here, be careful. This um, this path here is pretty challenging. So mind the tethers. How goes it? Not bad. Right there, this one. And we can just uh, move there straight away. This is Mission Control Houston, a good view up the uh, Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module. Did you leave it too? Artemiev in the red stripes uh, at the top of the two cosmonauts, Matveyev at the bottom. There we go. They're holding uh, the uh, European robotic arm control panel. And you can see uh, All right. Hold this. two of the base points, as they're called. Uh, this is where uh, thermal covers are currently covering uh, grapple fixtures to which the European robotic arm ultimately will be affixed to uh, during the next spacewalk when it uh, begins its first motion away from its stowed position on the multipurpose laboratory module. Lightning. At the very top of your screen is the Prashal node module that arrived at the International Space Station last November. And uh, out of the field of view, but uh, docked to Prashal is the Soyuz MS-21 that transported Artemiev, Matveyev, and Sergei Korsakov to the station about a month ago. Take it over from you. 
Dennis, while Oleg is translating, please check that uh, you should have a BTL there, and it needs to be secured. Yes, there is this like a bow tie that's securing it, so I can just untie it if need be. Copy. Okay. Let's uh, let's deal with that later. Also, guys, be careful. Solar arrays, solar arrays. Yeah, we'll deal with the battle later. Yeah, agreed. Now, I've got the um, EMMI 4114 and 4559, and we are at UFP payload interface 2. And we are almost at the pressurized adapter. And Dennis is translating, and I am monitoring the um, EMMI kit. The uh, reference that you're hearing through the interpreter to EMMI is the acronym that is uh, attached to the uh, European Robotic Arm Spacewalk Control Panel. They will soon be is installing that uh, on a tray adapter along a handrail on the uh, Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module as the two cosmonauts work in tandem approaching the one hour mark into today's spacewalk. Over the um, EMMI to him. There we go. Oh, and here are the thrusters. Pretty clean. Guys, try not to try and not touch them. No contact with any of the thrusters. We'll do our best. But it's so tempting. Okay. Now, I'm at 4400, 4562, and 4562. And give me the EMMI. Hold on, hold on. Let me get it from you. Now, I've got it. And I'm translating. Sounds good. 4400, and it's going to be strut number three. And the thrusters are so shiny and like so tempting to touch them. So we are in yeah, support three. Okay, Dennis, turn turn your legs back, turn, turn your feet back, and move over to me uh, head first. Wow, that's beautiful. Dennis, uh, be mindful. Um, of the thrusters, Oleg just told us that um, there is some lubricating oil on them. Okay, so Dennis is secured to 4561, and I'm on 4562 handrail, secured. Now, um, please take this Olympic torch from me, the EMMI. There we go. Slow and steady makes it. Uh, 
4564. Uh, 4401 is a no-go handrail. Yes, and just uh, be careful. Mosque is unintelligible. Okay. Oleg. All right. I I meant this hand right at forty four zero one. Dennis. Maybe it's best if you uh, switch to SBT. So ahead of Oleg. No, no, no. Hold on, and don't let the EMMI go. And don't leave. Okay. Sergey. Which tether do we leave? Do we leave the adjustable tether red or just the red? You leave a safety tether on handrail 4401. So two locks that are securing the cover, the top of the cover. Okay. All right, let's turn it towards me. And where is the handrail? Okay, we're getting to the handrail. Here is the handrail. Hold it. Stop, stop, stop. Turn it in such a way that uh, both locks of the uh, top of the cover are towards PHO. Copy Moscow. So let's uh, switch to 4400 meanwhile. We will have time to orient it, as you are telling us, but let's figure it out what we are doing with the tray adapter for now, like uh, do what we need. Okay, you've got it. I got it. Hold it. Oleg, Dennis. So... There is about five minutes left in the eclipse, and then you will be in the sunrise. Now hold it, and we need to switch the point where we are secured, where we have it secured. Okay. Так. There. Так, okay, and now the tray adapter, and the tray adapter is secured. Okay. Oleg, you have it secured, right? Of course. We have the EMMI secured to 4401. And now we are looking for something to secure the... So, so you are ready to start working with the tray adapter? We are getting ready. Copy. We will... We're getting ready to work with the tray adapter. Coming up on the one-hour mark in uh, today's spacewalk, Artemiev and Matveyev about to install a tray adapter on a fixture outside of the uh, multipurpose laboratory module upon which the European robotic arm control panel will be installed. And electrical and data cables will be hooked up to that control panel for the initial testing of its operability 
by Russian flight controllers uh, at the Russian Mission Control Center. So the adapter uh, tray adapter is removed uh, from the handrail. Copy, Alec. We install it on the handrail. Forty-four-zero-one. And the equipment tether should be between the adapter and the bracket. So, what about the wing nut? Uh, in what uh, direction it should be oriented? You know, it is actually at your discretion, Alex, so that it is convenient for you to work with it, with this wing nut. Okay. So you will remove it, and uh, the um, all the pin should be directed at you. Okay. And, uh, should I use the ratchet wrench here? Yes, uh, you should tighten it. Uh, a few rotations with the ratchet wrench. I copy. So I am retrieving the ratchet trench. Dennis, and in the meantime. No, you don't have to do anything, Dennis. Uh, disregard. Okay, just one minute before the uh, sunrise. So I am removing the ratchet wrench. It is removed. Copy, Alec. Alec, and don't forget to red, which was attached to the adapter to Alec, don't. Forget uh, to retrieve also the red tether that is uh, used to secure the tray adapter. Just over an hour into uh, today's spacewalk, Oleg Artemiev and Denis Matveyev. Artemiev on the bottom of the two uh, cosmonauts in this view, Matveyev uh, just above him as they work to install a um, adapter tray upon which the European robotic arm control panel will be installed as the first uh, major task of today's spacewalk, the first of several, perhaps up to a half a dozen or more, that uh, will activate and operate the European robotic arm in the first uh, also, phase of uh, its activity to augment uh, the Canadarm2 robotic arm and the Japanese robotic arm that operate on the U.S. segment of the International Space Station. This European robotic arm was uh, launched on the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module. The next spacewalk, 10 days from now, on April 28th, will see these two cosmonauts uh, releasing a number of launch locks and launch restraints and begin the process of uh, monitoring the arm's first tentative steps away from its launch and stowed position to uh, other base points upon which uh, it will grapple on either end of two grapple fixtures. Uh, basically uh, the same concept as the Canadarm2 robotic arm with two end effectors that can uh, grapple uh, various grapple points uh, along the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module to provide uh, additional robotic capability to move people and payloads around the Russian segment of the complex. The station is about to enter an orbital sunrise over the Pacific Ocean, moving from southwest to northeast. The uh, two spacewalkers, after a slight delay in getting out of the uh, Poisk airlock, are right on the timeline of their activities uh, from that point uh, on. That is pulling me here. 
just a minute. Unintelligible. It is secured uh, with a magnetic lock. Good. Now we will connect it. Now, Alec, you will have uh, to move to SBT a launch base point area and unfold uh, uh, MLI and uh, then work with the connectors there. Okay, I guess we don't need the lights here. The light is off, OFF. Okay, I'm uh, moving away uh, to give you space, Dennis. Yes, just like that. Will you be able to squeeze in, Dennis? Please be careful with your feet so that uh, don't uh, break the panel. Stand by. So my kit is in the way here. That's it. That's it. Now go ahead. Here you go. Excellent. Alec, uh, so please check whether the adjustable tether uh, should be used here. Stand by one, I will check. Adjustable tether. So that it does not uh, move er about. Yes, that's correct. And the hook is uh, secured to the handrail 4401. Maybe it will be best uh, to secure it to a different handrail. So we will take it with us, correct? Or we will leave it there? No, you will leave it there. Actually, both deserts, deserts should be left there for during the EV number 54. We will need uh, those in order to uh, move the panel. But it will be later on, much later. All right. So I am leaving these deserts in place. So, you will uh, connect the connector H2, but uh, first of all, you will have to release them, and uh, there is a locking wire there that you will have uh, to cut, because they are right now behind, uh, beneath uh, the MLI cover. Unintelligible. Dennis, you will have to translate to SBT launch base point area. Dennis, you are too far away. You are too far up. You will have to move. Okay. I am giving you. I'm moving in order to give you more space, Dennis. And I am uh, unfolding the cable. 
Then it's so this MLI flap uh, should be moved upwards and uh, so that you can see the H2 connectors there. One hour, ten minutes into today's spacewalk, Matveyev and Artemiev working uh, at what is called the launch base point, where the uh, European robotic arm uh, was stowed uh, during its launch, affixed uh, to the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module when it took off on a Proton M rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan last July. They're in the process of opening up uh, thermal covers and uh, the cover to the European robotic arm control panel box so that uh, they can begin uh, to hook up uh, the first of several connectors that will provide electrical and data capability to the box for commanding from the Russian mission control center outside of Korolyov. The commanding capability also is routed so that uh, cosmonauts working inside the Russian segment of the station can maneuver that arm around once its outfitting is completed over the course of several spacewalks. Unintelligible. So there are some two, uh, two marks, yes, uh, but also there should be a number two. Please look uh, at the other side. And on the opposite side, uh, there is the barcode. And the view you're seeing of uh, Artemiev and Matveyev working uh, on the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module is from a camcorder set up inside the Zvezda service module by cosmonaut Sergei Korsakov, who is acting as uh, an intravehicular crew member supporting uh, the spacewalk from inside the Russian segment of the station. Yes, now I can see number two. Copy, Dennis. Now please get from Alec the connector uh, 510 and then mate it to the connector H2. Yes, I'm standing by for Alec to give me this part of the cable. So just one wire, lock wire is left. I'm working with it. Copy, Alec. So the cable is uh, untied now. Copy. Alec, a reminder. You are in the area of these thrusters, and please, uh, under no circumstances, touch the thrusters. Dennis, hold it. Don't, don't pull it. Please now show me where are you going to connect it. Yes. Yeah, you will have to do it uh, in such a way that it is routed properly and connected well. Maybe it should be rotated a little bit, moved around. Now I am holding it. Yes, that's great. That's exactly. Okay, sorry. I took it from you again. Now. You saw a wire tie here. Before you connect the cable, please make sure that uh, all the markings are proper. Yes, the big contact is opposite the pin. 
Well, Denise, that's exactly the configuration that we need. All right, Dennis, it's a go to mate the connectors. Alec, in the meantime, you can op start opening the MLI. You know, I think I should secure this wire tie beforehand so that cable does not move around a lot. Yes. You can do that, and after you are done with that, you can start opening the outer cover. So I secured it with a hook. Yes, Dennis, you're doing everything correctly. I'm opening the upper outer cover. Unintelligible. One hour, 15 minutes into uh, the spacewalk by Artemiev and Matveyev. Artemiev uh, at the bottom, Matveyev at the top as they are in the process of now opening uh, the uh, suitcase-like EMMI, that's the acronym for the European Robotic Arm Spacewalk Control Panel Box that will be mounted on a tray adapter. They're in the process of installing on the outside of the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory Module. Please make sure that They'll be uh, hooking up a number of connectors uh, for both electrical and data capability that will be tested uh, during the course of today's spacewalk with uh, some <coughs> preliminary commanding that will be uh, provided by the Russian flight control team uh, outside of Koryov. At the very top of your screen is the Prashal node module, the six docking port bulbous module that arrived at the station and docked to Naoka last November, <coughs> and uh, upon which the Soyuz MS-21 spacecraft is currently docked. In just a few minutes, uh, the media channel of NASA television, uh, we're currently simulcasting on both the public and the media channel of NASA TV. The media channel is gonna go down to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida <coughs> for today's arrival of the crew for
Mexico? На каком из свободных карабин? Uh, to some uh, available uh, hook in the cap keeper. Okay, we'll do. So, Denise, how are you doing? So, please go ahead on the space to ground one. Sergey, we ask you to answer on space to ground one. You know, they are looking for Sergey, uh, uh, maybe somewhere doing in the uh, mess room or in the kitchen. Okay, you can, in the meantime, uh, you can take pictures of the panel. We are flying over Canada, this is Oleg. This is Canada below. So you mean to take pictures, you mean to activate the camera, Sergei? Yes, that's correct. If, uh, uh, you know, you, you want, uh, you can do it. Well, I'm working only on your go and your command. Yes, Alek, we give you a go also to take a uh, pictures of the cable, uh, and also we will, would like to see how the uh, external panel is installed, the installation configuration. All right. Denis, uh, uh, okay, never mind, I can see it now. Well, uh, it was tightened in a knot, uh, and uh, did you uh, cut it off? Yes. Отлично. Теперь смотри, как тебе удобнее. Или на Aviacap Keeper. And uh, uh, now uh, you can uh, do what works best for you. You can either use the Cap Keeper or you can stow in the trash bag. The weather is so nice today. Yes, I'm filming you. Okay, this is Denise. Uh, you okay, this is Denise. Uh, I have removed it from the uh, SBT launch this point. Okay. Move to uh, the second point, and you please remove two covers there. Uh, should I film the connector as well? Uh, yes, Oleg, uh, please go ahead and do that too. So let me open up the cover then. There it goes. Okay, let me uh, go back there. I forgot to uh, take pictures of the connector. Well, actually, I'm doing that already. Okay, so I'm going to proceed with the second one then. Okay, it is uh, very well connected. And uh, we're going to have to remove these covers at some point, right? Uh, yes, Oleg, uh, we're going to remove these covers during the next uh, EVA. Uh, well, I see that uh, uh, there are no ties or anything uh, else here. Okay, yes, uh, we'll be able to uh, open it up easily. All right, Oleg.
Так, ну что, будем экономить батарейку. Uh, so I guess uh, we're going to save battery power. Uh, yes, uh, you can go ahead and turn it off. 22, 23. It is off, uh, and uh, also I checked that uh, it uh, got turned off. Uh, copy all. This is Mission Control Houston, an hour and 33 minutes and change into uh, today's spacewalk by Artemiev and Matveyev. They are right on the timeline, in fact, uh, slightly ahead of the timeline, even though they began the spacewalk a few minutes uh, behind schedule. They uh, have already uh, connected uh, the European robotic arm control panel box to a tray adapter on the uh, Naoka multipurpose laboratory module. It is receiving power. They are in the process of uh, checking out uh, self-diagnostic health messages and are beginning the process of removing some protective covers from the area and uh, the launch base points upon which the uh, European robotic arm was affixed during its launch on Naoka back in July of last year. Uh, go ahead and stow uh, the cutter in the tool kit. Uh, we aren't going to need it during uh, this uh, uh, operation here. Uh, we're going to need it to at uh, uh, the next uh, point. Okay, copy that. Uh, Denis, uh, would it make sense to... Uh, yes, go ahead. Maybe it would make sense to uh, drop the uh, small hook uh, on the uh, cap keeper uh, case. Yes, I guess that would work. Otherwise, it's just uh, not that uh, convenient here. And uh, did you have a question about the uh, hatch? The, the time of uh, hatch opening was uh, 1501. Uh, so uh, we've been outside uh, 1.5 hours. Uh, yes, and to be exact, it's been uh, one hour and 35 minutes outside. All right, Denise. Uh, and uh, now, please uh, proceed with uh, taking photographs. It's in work. Oleg, and uh, you can rest for about five minutes now. Should I help Denise? Uh, no, Oleg, uh, please stand by for now, and uh, we will uh, start your activities soon. And Denise, as soon as you're done with taking photographs, so maybe it would make sense for you to uh, rest as well. Well, uh, yes, I guess I could take five. All right. So uh, let's wait for uh, Sergey's confirmation, and once uh, he hands it over to Oleg, he, when he hands the control over to Oleg, uh, we will uh, proceed. Hope you all.
Denise, uh, take a look. This is uh, our Soyuz. Uh, let me look around. Oh, yeah, I can see it now. Uh, Denise, uh, you're holding onto the rail uh, that you will use for translation to the parallel uh, handrail near the base point, too. So just take a look around now uh, to make sure that you know in what direction you will uh, be translating. Uh, yes, I can see it uh, from here. They are uh, across from me. Yes, uh, that is correct. They're in front of you. Okay, let me... The uh, view from uh, a variety of different cameras of today's spacewalk that is now one hour, 38 minutes in duration as Oleg Artemiev and Denise Medveyev have made quick work of the installation and initial checkout of the European robotic arm control panel. This is the control panel through which uh, commands will be sent to operate the arm, either from the Russian Mission Control Center or from the cosmonauts from a workstation inside the Russian segment of the station. Artemiev on the left, Matveyev on the right, and at the top of your screen, the Prashal node module to which the Soyuz MS-21 vehicle is attached that brought Artemiev, Matveyev, and Sergei Korsakov to the station a month ago. Okay. It's just uh, the fact that the sun is shining right on the car and uh, really not let me see anything that I guess I'm going to wait for it to um, go away. Oleg, please repeat your last. What I'm saying is that the sun is shining right on the cue card, and the filter is not sufficient. Well, uh, we follow uh, the activities uh, by the two cosmonauts in today's spacewalk, the 249th, in support of space station assembly maintenance and upgrades on the NASA TV media channel. The crew four astronauts, Chell Lindgren, Bob Hines, Jessica Watkins, and Samantha Christopher Reddy have arrived at the Kennedy Space Center for final pre-launch preparations. You can follow that activity on the NASA TV media channel. You can start the exact same actions that you uh, just did. And then uh, we will be also working with uh, Oleg at that point. Denise, did you copy? Uh, yes, copy all. Uh, this is Denise. Oleg, uh, make sure that the external control uh, unit is in the manual mode. Uh, yes, I uh, confirm that it is in manual mode. Manual mode, excellent coffee. And Russian flight controllers instructing the two cosmonauts to configure that uh, robotic arm control box into what is called the manual mode so it can uh, transfer to an automated sequence from uh, Korolyov, uh, part of the diagnostic testing of the control box and its functionality. Meanwhile, the International Space Station is flying uh, from northwest to southeast, approaching uh, the coast of Africa over Senegal. Uh, yes, I'm ready to uh, start the uh, activity with the control unit now. Okay, copy. Oh, okay, Oleg, uh, we'll put it in work now. Uh, please confirm again that uh, the unit is in manual mode. It is in manual mode. The LED for manual mode is illuminated. Copy. Switching to the second one, the uh, switch is uh, inaccurate in position, and uh, 
Fenn vai kopi. Tak, zamykal jsem to divot. The LED is blinking, and I'm now waiting for the standby mode and inaudible. And did you get the message? Uh, yes, uh, I uh, just got the message. Message inaudible. Copy. Uh, I pressed on start, and the LED is now illuminated solid. And also, uh, Denise, uh, be careful with the uh, cutter cord. Okay. All right, go ahead, please. Шестой шаг. Теперь седьмой. После одной минуты на дисплее режим. Now number seven. I should get the SB OPG message after one minute from when I first got the message on the display. Yes, we're standing by for that. Сообщение режим ера. I see the message about the era mode. RP OPG. And also I said operation, standby. Standby, well, let's see. And Dennis, uh, uh, please assess if it would make sense now to uh, stow the crew log bag, uh, the covers in the crew log bag. Uh, yes, uh, I confirm that the LED is illuminated, the standby LED, and switching to uh, step nine in the table. Inaudible. I, I should see the messages in the middle uh, window, but they're not. Oleg, please uh, repeat your last. What have you seen? In, in, step, in step nine, ten, uh, five, ten should be in the middle window. And now it says step four, ten. Uh, yes, it should be a uh, four ten. Okay, so is there a, an error then? Uh, we uh, updated it prior to the EVA. Okay, so I will uh, press on on the right, and it just switch to the left window. The selected task should be in the left field. So this is done. 11, step 11 is done. Switching to uh, 12. Okay. The LED is blinking. Pressing on start. Uh, copy. Uh, go ahead and press start. Uh, I... I uh, was uh, holding it for two seconds, uh, and the uh, LEDs are solid, and I will press it then. Let's see what happens next. I see that the task is in progress. Task 4 uh, is complete now. And I see the following uh, in, on the display C5 uh, in the middle window, and the Q card says T619. And I will press it with uh, step 15. Scroll to the right, selecting uh, the command. Task 5 is selected. 
has switched to the left field. I think your uh, sound was close to the emergency switch. Okay, copy that. LED is blinking near uh, the uh, start button, sending the start command uh, to execute task 5. Is that correct? Can you confirm? Uh, yes, go ahead and uh, uh, press on start. At the uh, one hour, 48 minute mark into the flight, as uh, the International Space Station crosses the west coast of Africa, a great view of the Earth uh, from the helmet cam of uh, one of the two cosmonauts, Artemiev and Matveyev, working uh, in tandem outside of the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module, conducting a series of diagnostic tests on the newly installed European robotic arm spacewalk control panel. Oh, all right, and you just uh, saw it uh, for now uh, with the cap keeper, uh, and then Oleg will uh, help you to put it in the bag. Okay, and uh, you can go on. Oleg, uh, go ahead now. Uh, task 5 is now complete. I can now select task 6. Copy. And uh, I am uh, selecting the commands on the right, that's correct. Task 6 is selected, and uh, I should now press start. This is step 22. Actually, 23 already. Go ahead and press start. All right, it's done. Okay. Uh, well, let's see what we get now. The two cosmonauts uh, are in the process of uh, pushing a series of buttons on that control panel that you see here in the field of view that uh, essentially is a health check of various commands that uh, will be given in the future by either the cosmonauts from a control panel inside the Russian segment of the station or by Russian flight controllers at Korolyov uh, as they operate the robotic arm for a variety of tasks uh, to move payloads and people around on the outside of the multipurpose laboratory module. Denise, uh, you can also take five. I will start translating slowly now. Well, uh, Denise, uh, if you feel tired, you should pause and rest. Denise, how is it going? I am now at uh, this point four, and now I'll start taking photographs. Well, I can't see you, Denise. Denise, inaudible. Near the MLM. Okay, copy. Denise, do you have it in your hands? Yes. So, 
What about the kit with the covers? Is it in the way? No, not really, if I move it slightly. I think you should uh, push it away uh, from yourself while uh, translating. Okay, Denise. So to make sure it works better for you, uh, try removing the small cap first. Well, it doesn't really make much difference. Anyways, uh, uh, proceed uh, per your discretion, whatever works the best for you, but make sure uh, you take pauses uh, to rest. Uh, Denise, uh, and just a reminder, of, of please make sure you're monitoring the cutter. Make sure that it is inside its case uh, while you're translating. Okay, copy all. One hour, 54 minutes into uh, the spacewalk. Uh, the reports continue to come in from the Russian Mission Control Center, and they're all good. Uh, with uh, the diagnostic tests all so far having been completed successfully in uh, testing out the uh, health and uh, responsiveness of the newly installed European robotic arm control panel box. Once you're done cutting, please stow the cutter away in its uh, case. Well, it's uh, not that easy uh, to cut it uh, with it. Uh, it's sort of bunt. Well, we're going to sharpen when we get back. Uh, Denise, just uh, make sure that you're careful with it. Just go ahead and put it in its case right away. Okay. Ready uh, to start sending the commands. Copy. 
Готовлюсь. Getting ready. Маску из Анальбу. Так, маску ушел. Горит. Так, маску ушел. Горит. Fashion is illuminated. Do not press anything for now. Uh, stand by for the command. Okay. And uh, Denise, uh, what we have left to do is just to remove uh, the cover uh, and uh, um, uh, from, from from the grapple picture. Yes, correct. We're about to hit the uh, two-hour mark in today's spacewalk. Denise uh, Matveyev is removing protective covers from uh, a variety of payload interfaces on the uh, outside of the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module. The uh, European robotic arm, once it's fully operational, yes, which uh, will unfold over the course of the next several spacewalks by these two cosmonauts, will uh, move uh, various payloads to and from uh, their deployment points on the Russian segment of the International Space Station over to these payload interfaces to affix them to the outside of Naoka so that they can gather data. To uh, continue with the EMMI starts using uh, the internal bus. The moment you are ready, please um, let us know. I am ready. And I'm working per uh, card three. Dennis. Please um, make sure that your hacker camera is uh, in correct position and is on. The little one, yes. All right, uh, send the reset and EMMI initialization or start uh, using the internal bus. Okay. And I'm switch manual? No. We would like to be in the auto mode, right? Correct. So please put the switch into the manual uh, mode. It's in the manual mode. Okay. And I'm getting to step two. And please confirm that the LED for manual control is illuminated. Yes, I confirm. And I'm switching to step two. E EMMI will be using the uh, middle monitor. Sharpie. EMMI is it on the middle monitor. And I'm scrolling to the right, performing step three. All correct. I'm done with step three. And I 
EMMI reset is on the left screen. I confirm. Copy. I'm scrolling to reset uh, on uh, screen number three, on monitor number three. Also, Oleg, just FYI, we are uh, get, you're entering e eclipse in one minute, so please don't forget to, it will be orbital night, uh, please don't forget to turn on your uh, lights. Lucina. Definitely. They're on. Okay. So RSS is in middle position, and I'm putting it on the left uh, screen, uh, scrolling over there. Affirmative. And the switch is um, on the right. Correct. And our set is reset is is it blinking? Is the LED blinking? Yes, the LED is blinking. And I'm pressing start. And that's going to be for step nine. And I'm done with step nine. Uh, nothing is illuminated anymore. Oh, we just see the power LED and all right, um, Oleg, it's looking good. Please press on. I'm going to the configuration menu. And I'm pressing stop. Correct. And I can select the language. I'm pressing start. Start is confirmed. And I see that the configuration for bus 1553 is available. That's a me the menu. And I'm pressing stop from the table. Done. It's asking me for ID. I'm pressing start for step 17. All correct, Oleg. All right, start has been pressed. I see the update menu for EMMI, and I'm pressing start. All correct. Press start. Denis, you first need to more remove the covers, and I checked if it's correct or not. Oleg, please continue. We're standing by for the end of the checkouts, and I confirm that all um, indicators lit up and then went out. And I'm selecting display parameters. And I'm selecting English. And on the 
menu CPC English and then on the um, checkout menu it's uh, asking me to press um, start that's correct select start and now it's asking me to press stop Oleg, are the LEDs illuminated? Yes, they are. Era shows three green ones. Grapple and grapple uh, is in green. And it's also suggesting that I can press stop. Okay, uh, Oleg, you can press stop. It's asking me if I should press, uh, it's suggesting that I press emergency. Press. In work. Command sent. And then it's telling me release emergency and suggest to go back to the um, original configuration. Go ahead. Done. Uh, the LED um, is illuminated and no longer illuminated. And I see the video and caution messages. At the uh, two-hour, nine-minute mark into uh, today's spacewalk, uh, Oleg Artemiev and Denis Matveyev reporting that uh, the European Robotic Arm Control Panel has checked out in normal fashion. Uh, you, you can see a, a good view of that uh, control box that has been affixed uh, to the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module. The uh, two cosmonauts are just uh, completing uh, a few final diagnostic checks the, um, of the box that will uh, ultimately be used to route commanding cover. from either the Russian mission Take controllers uh, outside of Moscow then, or uh, from cosmonauts inside uh, the Russian segment of the station to move the uh, European robotic arm to and from various uh, grapple points on the outside of the multipurpose laboratory module in support of payload and uh, people moving capability. Oleg, you should have a message on um, SPSS RED in, in the error mode. Come again. I told you. Okay, what you what you see is correct. Just uh, check what's in the mode uh, error mode. Yes, we are in the error mode. And, Oleg, please check what you see in the uh, era mode. Stand by. Manual. There is a star SP, SB, OPEGER. That is correct, Oleg. Uh, this is what we want to see. Stand by. With the uh, European robotic arm control box uh, having checked out uh, in nominal fashion, 
The uh, two cosmonauts are going to be uh, setting uh, a variety of buttons on that uh, device to uh, place the control box in what is called stowage mode. They'll then close uh, thermal insulation over the box before the next uh, spacewalk that is planned for April 28th. Next up for the cosmonauts, once they complete this work, we have uh, will be uh, the start of the installation of three handrails on uh, the robotic arm itself. There will be a number of handrails uh, that will be installed uh, to facilitate uh, spacewalkers in the future uh, moving uh, about uh, the robotic arm itself and uh, to temporarily house uh, some payload equipment that will be used uh, for the uh, robotic arm to uh, move payloads around uh, the Russian segment of the International Space Station. Oleg? Yes. Gennady, this is Gennady. Uh, Gennady, for whatever reason, my um, hot cold settings are pretty cold. I was just thinking maybe we can make it a little bit warmer in my suit. Well, if you are taking a break and if you are... Um, in orbital night, then you can try and put the switch for um, the um, heat exchanger to um, the warm position. It's going to uh, increase the temperature by about a couple of degrees, but if you are pretty chilly, you can uh, turn off the pump temporarily and then turn it back on. Okay, the pump. All right, uh, the pump is off. Copy. And the hot, hot cold switch. Put it in the hot position. Yes, it's going to be a little bit warmer. Right. But to be honest, it started getting pretty chilly even when we were in insulation. That This happens, but it's all in our hands. We can even turn off the uh, pump. Okay. All right. Dennis, how are you? Oh, I'm happy and comfy. Neither hot nor cold. That's good. That is good. Dennis, how are you? Are you tired? Just a little bit. But it's no surprise. Oh, you can take a break. All right, taking a break. 
Are we sticking to our timeline, Sergey? You are absolutely like on time per the timeline. That report uh, from uh, the crew and the Russian flight control team in Karolyov outside of Moscow at the two hour 18 minute mark in uh, today's spacewalk. The International Space Station flying to the south of Australia from southwest to northeast. And once you recover. The uh, European robotic arm control panel box has been successfully installed and checked out. The uh, two cosmonauts will be moving uh, on to the next series of tasks, which is the installation of three handrails on the arm itself. The European robotic arm is 37 feet long. It is essentially folded in place on the side of the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module in an inverted V if you will, if you saw it, on the side of uh, the module itself. On the next spacewalk on April 28th, the uh, protective covers uh, on various points of uh, the arm itself will be removed, launch locks will be released, and the arm will be commanded to make its first tentative motion away from its uh, grapple fixtures it has two end effectors on either end of the arm, very much like the Canadarm2 robotic arm does. The Canadarm2, along with the Japanese robotic arm, service robotic tasks on the U.S. segment of the International Space Station, but cannot reach as far as the Russian segment. Hence uh, the need for yet another robotic arm, this one uh, provided by the European Space Agency. All right. Once um, our IDA is done with his steps, you will have just uh, a little bit left. Oleg, get ready. We are going to uh, put uh, the EMMI in the um, storage mode or stowed mode. Get ready. Oleg, what do you see in the error status? Error status, two X's, two X's, a one, zero. Come again. I see XX dash, one dash, dash, zero. Do you see, Oleg, um, that there is mode no TM, uh, and then star no TM error mode, and then it, it's X X one zero. That's good. So the brightness switch. Uh, toggle it twice and then put uh, EMMI in the stowage mode. Copy. 
All right, the brightness has decreased. Should I do it one more time? Yes, please. Okay. The displays are off, and we only see the power on indicator. Copy, Oleg. Now we will um, get the confirmation, uh, and we'll be installing the protective cover. And Oleg, you have a go to close the protective cover, close the lid. Copy. I'm closing it all. Okay. We have it closed. The cover. And the lid. So the lid is closed, the cover is closed. And we see that. And I have, all right, and then I can confirm that EMMI is in the storage mode. Um, and we copy all leg. Right on the timeline, the uh, two cosmonauts have now closed the cover to the uh, European robotic arm control panel box, placing it in its so-called stowage mode until the next time it is used. Now uh, they'll press on for the beginning of the work to install three handrails on the arm itself. to plane three, is that correct? Yes, towards plane three. All right. We have two reds left, and a cable that's attached with a wire tie. So, do you think it's enough um, to install that handrail on the ERAM, just with one wire tie? Yes, one wire tie will be sufficient. Okay. Dennis, be careful with the cutter. I'm in no hurry. I'm very careful. What genius is, has tied it all up like this here? Dennis, I can see you. Now we see that you can see each other. Is it so? I am translating to 43. So what handrail should I be looking for? 4336. Oh, uh, so is which which handrail do we need? It's 4336. And this is where I am. I've been traveling and traveling, and now here I am at 4336. So now. You should open the MLI blanket where you have the um, support for handrail number four. So you want me to kind of open it up a little bit, right? I'm doing that. It's opposite handrail 4336. Okay. And we can see it, Oleg. I am opening it a little bit. Well, that's such a good Velcro here. There we go. This is the spot. It's um, number four. 
So completely free and empty and ready. Great. That's the um, location for the handrail. Now, Oleg, once you are ready, retrieve the handrail, and that's where we want you to install it. And Dennis, I can see you again. I'm not opening it up um, completely because it's going to be pretty difficult to uh, close it later. Two hours, 28 minutes in the spacewalk. Uh, you're looking at uh, the first view of one of the two limbs of the 37-foot-long European robotic arm, which is folded in place as uh, Denise Matveyev uh, removes thermal covers in uh, advance of the installation of the first of three handrails on the two limbs of the arm. Yes, I did. That's good. Okay, so I installed handrail number four on the lock. Great, Oleg. Now uh, put back the safety and uh, uh, retrieve number six. So the locks are just locked by themselves automatically. Yes, there should be an indicator. The indicator should uh, uh, crop up. Yes, uh, I can see it. So everything is nominal. All right now, what uh, handrail is next? So, and what, uh, which one do you have? I have number one and six. Okay. All right. Uh, let's retrieve six. So are you going to secure it with a safety tether, or uh, are you... Matveyev has now installed the first of three handrails on the European robotic arm. Two more to go for this particular spacewalk. Yes, I do. Here you go. It's a good one. Hold it for a while. Okay. 
Here it is. Uh, no, go ahead and take it. It's uh, like a suitcase for the handle. Okay, so should I uh, show it, Alec? So if the cover is holding, you don't have to uh, uh, put MLI over it because during the next EDA we will work with it. So again, the indicators should be visible on the locks. And the handrail should be installed uh, tightly. You know, the locks are locked, but the indicators are not visible. No, look carefully. No, the indicators are not uh, visible here, so I guess you will have to hold it now. So let us take turns in holding it. Okay, so there is the uh, line here. Would you take uh, pictures of uh, each handrail with the indicators? Yes, yeah, we'll do that. You know, there is a space for handrail number five. We did not take it with us. Well, it's not time to install it yet. So in a minute and a half, uh, you will have sunrise. Guys, copy. All right, take a picture of handrail. Go ahead. You know, Alec, the specialist are telling me that the indicators uh, indicators should be in the sun position, like Dennis had. You know, I didn't have it on the left one, but on the right, uh, it is visible. So should I press it down? You know, Alec, actually the indicator should be in the sunk position, uh, in the press down position. So well, then what should I do with mine? Well, as far as uh, we can see, uh, the marks are aligned. You know, they are aligned on one side, but not aligned on the other. Okay. Uh, have a look. So they are aligned, the match, and here they are not. Maybe it's uh, just the handrail itself. Maybe the uh, area for it is not suitable. Alia, could you please retrieve the wretched range and uh, uh, just Try to use it uh, on uh, the indicator. Very carefully, just knock on it. Okay. Dennis, and your indicators are in the sunk position. Yes, all four of them. Okay, so Dennis, your handrails are installed nominally then. So, Dennis, you have a go to uh, the area of the era elbow and start working there. You know, this is, I look, I think that uh, the mounting plate is not even here, because on the right, 
the natures are uh, the marks are aligned and the lock is sunk but on the left you know uh, there is the um, misalignment here that's why the handrail uh, was not uh, correctly installed but I am taking video right now so you will see hopefully by the way can you see it uh, via the cameras you, you mean number four yes number four I guess you know the seating uh, was missed for that one Body, all right so let's complete handrail activities uh, retrieve the wretched wrench and translate uh, to the uh, era elbow joint. Uh, you will remove the cover. Yes, I can see on handrail number six that the marks, that the lines are matching on both ends. And on mine, uh, they are not matching on one end. But you have taken pictures of everything. Yes, that's correct. So I'm re re retrieving. I am uh, correction. I'm putting back the wretched trench. All right, Alek, let's not waste our time. Uh, we will analyze the pictures. And uh, this locking wire, you know, is not visible for you yet. You cannot see it. No, we can see it, but uh, not in detail, unfortunately. All right. I will uh, uh, can actually do a close-up for you. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see it. That the, uh, that it is sticking out. And again, on this bracket, the lines are aligned, and on that uh, are not. Yes, I can see that the bracket is uh, the culprit. Actually, the mounting plate is culprit. So maybe it should be on to the left, more to the left. I copy all. Uh, let's uh, complete this activity with the handrail. And translate to the elbow joint uh, to start the removal of the cover uh, from the joint. All right, in work. Let me close uh, it with the MLI first. Олег, but in your opinion, it is installed tightly, right, the handrail? Yes, uh, it is very tight. I did a pull test, and I knocked on it, and it looks like it is stable. I guess I should deactivate the camera, right, Moscow, so that uh, I can save some battery juice. Yes, Alek, that's right, and please translate to the elbow joint uh, location. Okay, the camera. Okay, Denise, what about the cover? Uh, are there any issues? Okay, there are ties there that need uh, to be cut. Okay, Dennis, and could you please secure uh, the cover to the big uh, red hook? I will do that, but it is actually quite tight here. All right, and uh, unintelligible. Yeah, when you uh, put back the cutter, yes, I am uh, putting back the cutter. This is Mission Control Houston, two hours, 41 minutes into the uh, spacewalk. Just to recap, uh, the first spacewalk of Expedition 67, the fourth of the year out of the International Space Station, the fourth for Oleg Artemiev, and the first for Denise Matveyev got underway at 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The two cosmonauts working uh, very efficiently outside of the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module, installed and successfully checked out the European robotic arm control panel box. It's uh, up and running in good shape for future commanding of the uh, robotic arm in the tasks uh, that we'll undertake in the months and years ahead uh, to move people and payloads around 
the Russian segment of the International Space Station. The uh, first of two of three handrails today have been installed on the arm itself, the second in the process of being installed by Artemiev and Matveyev. Medvedev also in the process of removing protective uh, thermal covers from uh, launch uh, base points and payload interfaces. Soon we'll be removing a thermal cover from the elbow of the robotic arm itself. The next spacewalk these two will uh, conduct is just 10 days away on April 28th when they will also uh, release launch uh, locks and other constraints uh, that held the arm securely in place during its launch. Uh, from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan last July, affixed to the Naoka module so that it can take its first tentative steps away from its uh, grapple points. There are two limbs to this arm, once unfurled, uh, can reach uh, 37 feet in distance with a pair of uh, end effectors, just like the Canadarm2 robotic arm that services the U.S. segment of the International Space Station. Okay, do you have a tie there? Yes, I do. And there is a handrail on the ear arm that you can use. Okay, first I will try to untie uh, this ribbon. Alec, don't waste your time, cut it. Unintelligible. But I will first try to untie it. Yes, actually, I succeeded. I untied it. Okay, you know, the, the uh, guy who tied it uh, was a very uh, conscientious guy and industrious. All right, so please, again, be careful with the reflectors. Now I can see the first wire tie here, okay? Fold uh, the MLI cover in such a way so that uh, it will be convenient for you to put it back later on. Well, uh, so maybe we should debag it. All right, so, you know, uh, do it in such a way that it is convenient for you to tie and untie it. All right, I will have to rehook my tether here. Stand by one. And what handrail should I use? Uh, is it a 4351 handrail? Uh, okay, it's 36. All right. Okay, so uh, have you completed your MLI activity? Uh, I'm asking Alec. I'm asking Denis. Uh, so, Alec, so what about the cover? The cover is secured. This is Denis. Uh, I'm not uh, done yet. We are doing it uh, simultaneously with Alec. Alec, there is some kind of a thread uh, there, so please make sure that it is not uh, just moving about there. All right. Uh, we will do that right now. Don't worry. Here you go. Everything is ready. All right. I will rehook my tether towards the handrail where I will be working. Right, so we are rotating it here and turning it and rotating it. 
fold it it up. So what is the best way to fold it? Another tie uh, here that I discovered. And a good view from a camcorder that's mounted in a window in the Zvezda service module. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, Denise Matveyev, Oleg Artemiev at the top of your screen as they continue to remove thermal covers from uh, the European robotic arm and its two limbs. They're installing uh, a trio of handrails on the arm after the uh, completion of the work uh, to install a control panel for the operation of the arm that went uh, by the book as we are closing in on the three hour mark in today's spacewalk. You know, uh, for Denise, maybe it is uh, uh, dangerous. For me, it is not. It is in the sheet now. Now, Alec, unintelligible. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, you know he has some kind of uh, MLI cover beneath there as well. So below there we have another cover. No, actually you should not remove anything below. Only, uh, you know, the one that you have already folded. But I just uh, want to tell you that uh, there is another cover below. Yes, this actually is um, a suit uh, to the hull. Well, it is tied. Alec, do not cut anything else. Yes, uh, that's important. I know, and I don't know anything without, I don't do anything without your command, Moscow. All right. Let me move away from these reflectors here. Denise, have you completed your side of the cover? Folding. Yes, I have. Now, could you please take a, a camera and uh, take picture of the sun reflectors in the area of the elbow joint. And I'm moving away uh, from those reflectors. This is EV1. All right, I am activating the pump, of course, now I'm uh, on the hot side, kind of. And Alec, I'm, uh, I'm giving you advice to use a few wire ties uh, to tie that up. Exactly, uh, I'm doing this right now. Олег, another suggestion for you? Uh, you know, after you have secured the cover, could you please uh, translate to handrail number four and uh, uh, see, uh, look at the brackets 
and uh, try to do a pull test, maybe, you know, during the installation, uh, it uh, got heated and uh, please check whether it is still installed tightly. Uh, of course, after you are complete uh, with the cover removal and folding up. Well, I can do it, uh, you know, both at the same time. All right, it's up to you, Alex. A good view of the uh, two limbs of the European robotic arm, flanked uh, by Denis Matveyev on the bottom of your screen and Oleg Artemiev at the top, as they continue to remove uh, thermal covers you can take a breather. and uh, install handrails on the arm itself to facilitate its uh, future use by spacewalkers uh, in the conduct of payload and people moving activities. And uh, an excellent view of the arm itself. At the very top of the arm is the elbow. Uh, that thermal cover will also be removed. On the next spacewalk on April 28th, Artemiev and Matveyev will be releasing a number of launch constraints and restraints, launch locks, if you will, that have held the arm securely in place since it launched uh, on the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module uh, last July. Two of the three handrails scheduled for installation today uh, have, in fact, been installed. One more to go. Alec, you know, the kit looks uh, tight as it is. Alec, don't fold. Uh, the We're just a few minutes shy of the three-hour mark in uh, today's spacewalk. A great view of the Earth below, 261 miles below, as the International Space Station approaches uh, British Columbia and uh, the West Coast, just north of Vancouver. Denise, can you please tell me whether I live to reach handrail number one uh, from where he is right now? Unintelligible. Let me see. Suggestion. We will ask 
Denise to take some pictures, and uh, you will install on your side, uh, you will install handrail number one. All right, we'll do that. Okay, so what should you install? That handrail, yes. And now, as for the handrail number four, could you please knock uh, with a, a wretched wrench on the plate, on the mountain plate? Right? All right, I will do that. And what about the timeline, where we are? Uh, we, you are moving exactly per the timeline, on time. The report uh, from the Russian flight control team informing the two cosmonauts, they're right on the timeline. They uh, began uh, the spacewalk a few minutes behind schedule, but uh, have made up time and uh, are working quite efficiently outside of the Russian segment of the International Space Station, approaching the three-hour mark in today's spacewalk. And I will give you instructions. So you will have to translate towards Handrail 4306 towards the MLM cone uh, in the direction of Peho. I can see uh, the handrail 4309, and uh, this is Oleg. So, uh, do you think one YSI will be sufficient? Denis, so please translate towards Peho, uh, towards MLM cone. All right. Will do. And once you reach the handrail for 300, uh, you will report it to us. Now, Alec, regarding the wire ties, uh, so do you have two wire ties? Let us try two. Well, actually, I can use all 15 that I have here. Alec, no, 15 is not necessary, just two will suffice. All right. And uh, the plates. They are detaching uh, gradually. Okay. Okay. You know, I think the two wire ties will be quite sufficient. All right. And also I see the uh, red tether on the camera uh, and uh, Yes, I guess it got tangled up uh, somewhere. It's uh, okay now. And uh, let me uh, wrap another wire tie. So what should I pick? What wire tie should I go with? Uh, let's uh, pick this one. Uh, Oleg, don't do too much work at this point because during EVA 53 you're going to have to unwrap it all. Okay. Uh, would it be sufficient like this? Uh, yes, I like uh, that. Will do. Okay, should I uh, tap again? I don't think it's going to work, but I can uh, give it a try. Oleg? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Oleg, if possible, please, please adjust the gauntlet of your uh, right glove. Try to uh, pull it up uh, to cover the connector.
Uh huh. Спасибо. Okay, thanks. Okay, it's covered now. Thanks. Uh, Sergey, uh, this is Denise. Uh, I'm at the handrail of 4300. Copy all. And uh, Oleg, uh, 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 go ahead and uh, uh, open up the uh, handrail. Uh, tap uh, on the bracket using the wrench, and also you should translate uh, to handrail zero, uh, 4004. Uh, which is closer to the PHO. Uh, go ahead and uh, translate down uh, to uh, 424 first and then slightly to the right. Your uh, work site is the uh, area of the uh, antenna uh, to say, and uh, your task there is uh, to take photographs uh, of this uh, antenna. Uh, Oleg, uh, please uh, tap at the base uh, from the inside, uh, on the inside of the handrail, uh, in that uh, uh, area where the indicator wouldn't fit. Yes, I found it. So did it uh, pop out? Did it come out? Well, uh, yes, uh, but the uh, handrail uh, came out uh, of it. Uh, uh, so, so could you please remove the MLI uh, flap? Uh, no, this is not what I'm trying to show. So this is, this is the uh, handrail. Uh, it uh, came out, uh, as you can see, uh, from... from a point where it was uh, secured. As you can see, there is a line here, and that's where it uh, came out from. So, Oleg, could you please uh, photograph uh, this uh, handrail? Okay. All right, I'll take photos now. Let's see. So if I understand it correctly, uh, the handrail uh, came out of the station. Yes, uh, by about four millimeters. Just uh, uh, exactly... Uh, that same uh, clearance that uh, um, we saw earlier that uh, we lacked. Okay, Oleg, I see it now, and you can continue. Good view of uh, the European Space Agency's latest contribution to the International Space Station. It's a uh, long-awaited European robotic arm that is attached to the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory Module. As you uh, are looking up almost to the top of Naoka toward the uh, Prishal node module uh, and attached to it, uh, docked to it, if you will, Soyuz MS-21 that delivered uh, Artemiev, Matveyev, and Sergei Korsakov to the station a month ago. Any uh, picture through the camera? Yes, uh, I am. And I know what you're talking about. I can see it in the camera. And uh, what about the handrail? Is it installed reliably? Uh, yes, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it was installed reliably before, uh, but now uh, it fits. Indicators fit. So it's fine now. So the handrail uh, came out from the station uh, just by uh, the same uh, clearance that uh, we saw that didn't match. Uh, okay, so Alec, can you confirm that uh, it is installed uh, reliably? 
Yes, I uh, confirm. And, of course, uh, you always need uh, the confirmation, just in case. Okay, I'm taking a break. Oleg, Dennis, uh, uh, we're back from LRS. Okay. Uh, we're taking a break now. A quick break. All right, go ahead and take a break. Dennis, look. Uh, MLM. MLM and MLM is underneath uh, your uh, right uh, hand, so please make sure that you do not touch anything in that area. Uh, Denise, can you confirm that you see the antenna? Uh, no, I see many antennas. This is Oleg. Let me help you, uh, Denise. Uh, please, please wait for me. I'll uh, get over there. If possible, could you please tell me where it should be oriented? It should be oriented towards the uh, PHO. Uh, Denise, uh, please turn to the right uh, to make sure that uh, we can see you as well. This is the antenna on the MLM. Okay. Uh, now up. Denise, that is. Uh, Denis, did you uh, photograph the reflectors? Or, uh, so I don't have to do that right now. Okay. Okay, good. Oleg, and uh, uh, once you're done with your break, uh, please tr uh, translate towards the uh, handrail one. In Norival. Dennis, please turn to the right. And uh, uh, please turn your head up now. You should be looking right at it. Basically, it's a big round dish. Okay, copy that. Okay, let me try that. So, trackers should be on your right. So make sure that you don't uh, touch them as well. Copy. Denise, would it be possible to turn your head in such a way that we can see what you're doing too, to make sure that we're looking at the same antenna? So, okay, I will try that now. Denise, uh, it should be uh, to your right on the MLM. There it is, there it is. You're looking right at it now. 
Is it this one? The camera uh, was turned towards it. It's not this one. It's uh, the one to the left and more to the left. It's uh, next to your left hand. This is the, the antenna that you're supposed to photograph. Yes, I uh, did take photographs of this antenna from uh, this um, angle specifically. And while Oleg is installing the handrails, uh, please uh, take detailed photographs from different angles as well as the general view. Okay, copy that. Because if you do this now, uh, it's going to make uh, EVA 55 much easier for you. Uh, uh, Denise, uh, you're still working in this area uh, where there are some cable connections and make sure that uh, you don't touch them. Okay, I'm um, doing my best. Denise. Uh, all is going great. Uh, you uh, did take the uh, right photograph. Uh, and let's go ahead and start translating towards uh, the handrail uh, 4005, towards the uh, SL transition uh, ring on the transition ring. And uh, you'll wait for Oleg uh, there. Also, uh, I wanted to tell you that hand, uh, handrail uh, 4005 uh, is named uh, after uh, Pyotr Dubrov. Copy that. Did he break it or something? We were able to install this handrail uh, on the second attempt during the uh, second EVA only. And uh, uh, Herter did all he could, all in his power, to install this handrail because it was not an easy job. Uh, so, and uh, the same for handrail 4 on ERA uh, uh, arm. It will be named after Oleg Artem Artemyev. Well, I see the exact same handrail, uh, I, I think, here again, the exact same situation. Oleg, no, uh, so should I uh, tap on it? Uh, yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, Okay, well, it is installed uh, securely, reliably. Denise, uh, Please be aware of the cables. Okay. Denis, I didn't copy. Please repeat your last. Yes, I was saying that I uh, am uh, careful. So, 4005. Yes. 4005. Now, please translate towards handrail 4006. Uh, okay, so uh, I did a couple of taps, uh, and uh, I uh, can only see that it came out by approximately 0.5 millimeters. Excellent, Oleg. So the, mar the marks, they're, they're like halfway there, so not fully there. What about the indicator? Is it uh, all the way in? Uh, yes, uh, on both sides. And uh, I can uh, make a video, if you'd like. Uh, I'll just uh, photograph uh, everything. Okay.
This is Mission Control Houston, three hours, 19 minutes into today's spacewalk. Oleg Artemiev and Denise Matveyev continue uh, to work on uh, the installation of a third handrail on the European robotic arm and to take pictures of uh, various points on the arm for documentation in advance of their next spacewalk on April 28th to continue the outfitting of the arm and the release of launch constraints and launch locks uh, that will enable the arm to uh, flex its muscles for the first time uh, since it was launched on the uh, Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module last July. The camera is off. Copy, Oleg. And I uh, checked that it is off. I'm moving towards Denis now. Oleg, they need a reminder on the translation path. Uh, so once you start moving, uh, you're basically translating towards the PHO copy. So I'm going towards Denise. Oleg, could you check if uh, Erka uh, LED is on? Uh, it's um, very bright here, so I can't really see. So is it not working? So, do you think it's working so uh, how long uh, have you started suspecting that it wasn't working for for a while but we didn't want to distract you with that well you should have uh dennis was next to me and i could have forward cycled it uh, so you will translate uh, towards denise and then you can check it again I can see it now. What do you see? Denise, you can see your leg, correct? Denise, can you check all the cameras that would be? I do not see you. You should have uh, translated towards the uh, FTU uh, using the circular handrail for zero zero five. Well, I did not expect to see you there. Look at this sensor. Stand by.
Это вот этот поручень Петрова? Is it this, Andrew? 4005. 4005? Uh, yes. Correct. So should I remove it? No, please do not do this. This is the handrail that's named after Petro Dubrov. And uh, you're supposed to be moving along uh, plane 4 for this to... This is uh, where we're, we're going. And also, could you uh, please check the LED, uh, check what? The camera's LED. And, uh, careful here. Uh, do n make sure that you do not uh, uh, cut anything. Please be careful. Do you see this uh, sharp uh, corner here? Okay, so let's move away from the antenna and then you can uh, check uh, everything. I don't think that uh, I can get through. Here, please, please wait, stop, wait. Well, let me uh, get through first. Okay, so go ahead and uh, hand it to me. Slowly. So how are you doing? Did you get stuck? No, I'm uh, getting through now. It feels heavy. Okay. Uh, go ahead and move away from the antenna. So can you check if uh, my LED is uh, illuminated or not? So one is on and two more are on. So this is the light here. One is on. Because this one is on. I uh, switched to cameras. Is it working now? Uh, I think uh, one of your LEDs is not illuminated. Could you please turn? This is the one uh, work light, the U.S. light. Uh, yes, uh, I uh, kept it uh, here. Okay, so there it is. So regarding the work site for the upcoming EVAs, would it be possible? Uh, would it be possible uh, to reach the uh, SM uh, weight seven? Uh, from MLM. Okay, place seven. Stand by. Uh, there it is. Yes, I can see it now. There it is. One, two, three, four. So, are we supposed to uh, work in that area? Uh, yes. Uh, this uh, will be in the future. Uh, we'll be doing some work there. And so, what about the antenna? Uh, it's uh, fine. I don't really see any uh, obstacles. So, yes, uh, we can reach it, no, no problem, or uh, we can go from the uh, handrail named after Peter Dubrov. 
Okay, Oleg, uh, you can take a break now since you just finished uh, translating along this fast. And also, uh, can you film um, now? Well, you should have told me earlier. I can uh, film Denise uh, only. So, uh, Denise, please move back, uh, actually, towards your feet. Uh, yes, move over there, and uh, I'll start taking pictures now. So we're not getting any pictures now, so I, I can't really uh, give you any recommendations. I guess that will work. It's not an activity, it's not a task, it's just taking pictures. All right, and there you go. As if you just got here, and you are at um, plate seven. And from the side of the handrail of Pyotr Dubrov, you have arrived and you are working. And try and make like a general overview of the whole setup. And here is the general view. And here is what we came from. And that's the whole translation path. How are you? Are you guys tired? Uh, EV2? I'm okay. That's good to hear. Oleg, thank you so much. We just uh, wanted to say a big thank you because it's going to be very um, beneficial for later EVAs. And on the camera, we still have four bars. So we've used up only one third. That is a plenty OLED. All you need to do is to take pictures of the adapter. And then you will be moving, going back home. Oh, but no rush, just taking pictures and, uh, the, and imagery. Uh, you will be in orbital night in three and a half minutes, so please turn on your lights. Copy. Okay. And here's the French hook. There we 
we go. Unintelligible. This is Mission Control Houston, three hours, 34 minutes into today's spacewalk. Oleg Artemiev and uh, Denis Matveyev uh, continue to work uh, diligently and efficiently along the timeline, having installed three handrails now on the European robotic arm, having removed thermal insulation from the elbow of the arm, and all is going well as uh, the crew is working uh, per the timeline. Meanwhile, up on board the International Space Station, we're just a few minutes away from the daily planning conference now. as uh, the remainder of the uh, International Space Station crew nears the end of its workday. So we are passing by one rather necessary antenna. The one that's rotating. Copy. And we got to the ring. And 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 we're translating to the ring. And Oleg, just a reminder, please make sure you do not touch that antenna with your left hand. Okay, so I can't touch it with my left hand? Well, neither left nor right. Just don't touch it. All right, I won't. Страница 8, радиограмма 2541, шага номер 10. Okay, I'm at the ring. And here is the French hook. Okay, stand by for a second. Let me get myself secured here. Give me your French hook. Wonderful. I got it. Let me secure it here. Stand by. Don't unhook yourself. No, I'm I'm staying where I am. All right, I have it secured to here and then there. Yeah, we got too many cloths here. Stand by. Okay. And it's on here, right? Unintelligible, I on too. Stand by. Maybe you need to take a break. Oh, well, if you say so. Yeah, take a five minute break.
Так, ну мы распектируем кольцо. All right. We're freeing up the ring, and that's where we take the break. And the French hook should be connected to the ring, right? Yes. You need to secure the French hook to the ring. Okay. Or transportation ring. All right. Let's take a ride. This is Huntsville, Munich, Subra, Moscow. Expedition 67, USOS is ready for the evening DPC. Good evening, Expedition 67. It has been a great pleasure for me to work with you on Orbit 2 uh, here in Houston. We have uh, four topics from Houston this evening. Uh, the first one is for Larry. We would like to uh, give you a heads up that we will be conducting a Dragon Centerline uh, camera checkout. Uh, the camera is not pointing inside the Dragon, but I uh, just wanted to give you a heads up. Larry copies with a thumbs up. Okay, another one is for Larry and also for the entire crew. For your awareness, SpaceX will be conducting thruster firing test at around 0600 GMT for uh, 10 minutes. Of course, that's on the uh, Endeavor. And uh, so you will hear some thrust of firing tomorrow morning for about 10 minutes in Dragon. Yeah, 0600, and we'll hear some uh, thruster firing from Endeavor. That's a good read back. And the uh, third topic is for Kayla. You asked us about the uh, Autoscope Specula. Um, we have no more new specular on board until MG18, so there's no action required for you at this time. Roger, thanks. Okay, and the last is uh, for everybody. Um, as for the um, Axiom 1 Endeavour undock tomorrow, 1430 GMT undock is no-go due to weather. And we are looking at the 0200 GMT on dock to see if weather improves to support landing. And uh, more details you will see on the timeline when you wake up tomorrow. Copy that. 1430 uh, tomorrow is no go, and 0200 uh, still to be determined whether that's good or not. Appreciate the heads up. Okay, uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Huntsville, Munich, and Scuba have no topics. Uh, this And as uh, the Russian uh, spacewalk continues, you heard the call from uh, spacecraft communicator Koichi Wakata here in Mission Control up to the crew on board the International Space Station, all crew members, that uh, a weather briefing was conducted uh, a short time ago uh, between SpaceX, Axiom, NASA, all interested parties, unfavorable weather uh, at the uh, splashdown sites off the coast of Florida have resulted in a postponement of the undocking of the Axiom-1 crew. It had been scheduled for 9.35 a.m. Central Time, 10.35 a.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday morning. Instead, uh, the crew will receive a new timeline for their activities on Tuesday with pending weather, an undocking opportunity at approximately 9 p.m. Central Time, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, Tuesday night. That would result in a splashdown shortly after uh, 2 p.m. Central Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, April 20th. Another weather briefing is planned uh, for mid-morning on Tuesday to determine whether or not uh, the new undocking opportunity will be favorable or not, as uh, SpaceX continues to evaluate weather conditions at the splashdown sites that are available. So again, the Axiom-1 undocking has been postponed from Tuesday morning to no earlier than Tuesday night, pending another weather briefing in the morning to determine whether or not uh, the weather at the splashdown zones can support a return to Earth for the Axiom-1 crew on Wednesday. Working. Meanwhile, we're three hours and 44 minutes into today's spacewalk. 
Handrails have now been installed on uh, the European robotic arm that has been the focus of attention for Oleg Artemiev and Denis Medveyev throughout the day today. All of that work has gone uh, by the book, including the removal of thermal covers uh, from uh, the elbow of the 37-foot-long arm that it remains folded against uh, the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module. Also, uh, thermal covers uh, were removed from uh, base points, as they're called. These are the points to which uh, the arm can ultimately uh, maneuver around and grapple to on uh, the multipurpose laboratory module once full activation is completed of the arm. A uh, control panel box called the uh, European Robotic Arm Spacewalk Control Panel was installed and activated and checked out thoroughly uh, with the uh, Russian flight controllers of the Russian Mission Control Center outside of Moscow as uh, work continues in the early stages of the activation and operation of the arm, which will continue over the course of the next several spacewalks. If you get a chance, you can start taking off the covers. be much uh, more convenient if we went underneath a Estrella boom. Do you want to go in? No, I can actually reach it. Yeah, it's bright and nice and cozy in there. All right, crew lock bag, we're leaving it behind. Yes, you leave the um, kit with the covers there. And you are standing by. Seems like it's a full moon today. Can you please push my feet up? You mean, like, push you? Yes. Give me a push so that I could get in there. I, you do want to get in there, right? Yes, because I wanted to um, secure a few items in there, too. So, do you want to get the PDM? Uh, well, yeah, and I would like to get a little bit um, further so that I could secure the crew lock bag. Okay. And I got it, and where do you want to put it? Well, I have a tether. Let me give you the crew lock bag. Hold on, let me secure the trash bag first.
Денис, когда будешь снимать Денис. не забудь его застраховать. So when you're going to be taking the trash bag off, please don't forget to secure it. Of course. But it doesn't want to to be untethered. So, could you secure the French hook here? The safety one? Do you have it secured? Yes. Please stand by one. All right. Let him, let, I'll give you a hand, and then you will. So what do you have? The trash bag. Okay, I can see it. And there, let's put it here. There. And you can secure it there. You can sign up. Hook it up there like a garland. This is Mission Control Houston. We're closing in on the four-hour mark in today's spacewalk. Denise Matveyev in the field of view, along with Oleg Artemiev, are stowing uh, okay. items uh, that uh, no longer are needed for today's uh, remaining spacewalk tasks. They have completed everything so far that was uh, scheduled uh, on their workload. The uh, installation and connection of a European robotic arm control panel box. Up. The removal of protective covers from payload interfaces and uh, base points, right. which uh, the arm will use uh, to affix itself to various points along the multipurpose laboratory module in the future. The uh, two cosmonauts installed three handrails, right removed uh, thermal cover, from the elbow area of the European robotic arm and are soon uh, to install a portable workstation adapter on a payload interface uh, on uh, the uh, multi-purpose laboratory module near the arm, which uh, will be used uh, to house uh, payloads as they are being staged to various points uh, to be affixed on uh, the Naoka module for payload data gathering in the future. This one? Mm -hmm. Got wrapped around you? Are you unwrapping it? It's a small rat there. How is it working? Okay. Great. And where are you going to put it? 
Where do you want to put it? Uh, I don't know what to do it. I couldn't figure out what you were going to do with it. Do you need any help? Where is the PRM? The PRM is behind me, behind you. Can you secure it with a short safety tether? Okay. There you go. Oleg, do you have the crew lock bag secured? Yes. But we need to push it a little bit uh, further in. Yes, and please make sure that um, it's secured. Where is the PRM? And actually, uh, grab all those cloths and like stick them underneath the rubber bands so that they're not floating all over. Okay. There, look. Really nice and tight bungees, and we can uh, push everything underneath them. Oleg, Dennis, you have plenty of time, so take your time. Uh, placing all the um, kits that you brought in in such a way so that it's convenient for you to um, get back in. There you go. Looking great. And I'm going to take a break. Okay, sounds good. And Dennis, take a break and make sure that the French hooks are secured and the covers, the trash bag and the crew lock bag are all secured with... Um, Yes, they are. Great. Now you can definitely take a break. You did work a lot. So the PRM portable workstation adapter is behind you, Dennis. You are passing me one hook, and I'm shifting it to the left. This is EV1. Towards the boom. And uh, now I'm ready to receive the second one from you. Sounds good.
Dann weiß, dann weiß. Yes, dann stand in bei. Stand by one, I will move closer. Yes, go ahead. So give me one hook. Yes, I am ready to receive it. Okay, now uh, I'll move it here. Alex, Denise. So the EVA duration is uh, four hours up to now. Copy. So you are moving along very nicely, a little bit ahead. And so you have plenty of time to take a breather to have a rest. All right. You, they, they are telling us to take a breather. Well, it's not easy here. We did not use those. Well, but uh, the ones that we have are working nicely. Well, Denny somehow is said that that the current cameras are still working. Uh, he sounded sad about it. Well, actually, that was his most joyful voice that he uses. Okay, so one uh, hook is outside. Uh, yes, we give you a go to proceed, guys. This, that one is heavy, thingy. All right, so we are moving it. You, we cannot uh, attach it to ourselves. Yes, it is a very heavy kit. You're right. You cannot attach it to yourself. Yourself. So please take turns in moving it and uh, monitor it closely. Okay, will you hold it? Uh, I will locate my uh, hook. Yes, I'm holding it. Now, Denise, please uh, egress 
Slowly. All right. Okay, so you can rehook your tether so that the uh, tether is not on your way when you are aggressing. And I can hold it in the meantime. Yes. You can use it, use the hook. To hold. Yes, I'm holding it. Now uh, you will need to rehook your tether. Okay. Right, so the kit is now outside uh, the hatch, the EDA hatch. So Dennis is egressing, and I am uh, holding the kit. Dennis, please look out. Uh, make sure that your tether is not in the way, maybe to the left a little bit. Well, that's great. Guys, in a minute and they have uh there will be sunrise where you are. Copy Moscow. Denise, how are things? Unintelligible. I am turning around. Do you need my help, Dennis? Now I'm looking for my short feather.
Okay, the short one. Right. Unintelligible. This is Mission Control Houston, four hours, 11 minutes into uh, today's spacewalk. Oleg Artemiev and Denise Matveyev now working on the final planned task of today's spacewalk as they uh, take a uh, payload adapter installation mechanism out of uh, the Poisk airlock and will move it uh, to the area of the uh, European robotic arm on the uh, Naoka multipurpose laboratory module to install it. It will be used in the future for uh, payload activities and the staging of payloads that the robotic arm will move uh, back and forth uh, to various locations on Naoka for data gathering. The uh, crew has uh, completed all of the rest of the work for the day uh, with complete success. The installation and connection of the European robotic arm control panel on Naoka, the removal of protective covers from payload interfaces and base points to which uh, the robotic arm will affix itself for future operations. They've installed three handrails on the arm itself and removed a thermal cover from the elbow of the European arm. So what's the matter? It's behind, below your right hand. Yeah. All right. Okay, the kit. I'm holding it. Right, it is uh, moving away. Uh, stand by, I will rehook my data. Yes, I'm holding it. So I rehooked one tether uh, to the ring. Stand by one. I will receive uh, the kit from you. I am holding it now. Okay, I will rehook my tether as well. This is Dennis. So do you need this second tether? Stand by one, Dennis. Unintelligible. Okay.
to kill for us. Sorry, sorry. Did you hook it up, uh, stand by one? Yeah, is something on the way? Yes, uh, there is this uh, mobile ring uh, over your head. No, no, you you have to do it in the opposite direction. So you will have a short LOS, guys, soon. And then we will, it will be an extended uh, video loss of signal. So you can proceed with the translation in the meantime. Go ahead. That is excellent. So the PRM adapter is on the translation ring already secured. And uh, Dennis's hook is on the ring as well. One uh, tether of Dennis. Guys, do you copy me? Yes, go ahead. So we might have a short LOS. Yes, we copied that. So please continue. So we are not receiving any video right now. So you can translate on Strela Boom. We are on the Strela Boom, and I'm disconnecting here. From from the boom here. And uh, let's roll. Oh, stand by one. Is everything fine with you, Dennis? Yes. I thought maybe you should move uh, a little bit towards me so that uh, you do not uh, touch antenna. The antenna is behind you, behind your back. If you turn a little bit towards the, the side, it will be great. Excellent. Okay, now let's roll. Guys, be careful. There is an antenna on the module. All right, let's roll. So we are uh, casting anchors here. We have arrived. All right, copy that and please secure the ring, the translation ring here in work. So where is the hook? It has a hook here. I cannot see it. Oh, here it is. The new one, the brand new. Right, we secured it. Now we are translating. OK. 
Okay, this is number one. Now uh, let's do it with number two. I will move a little bit further, further. Now. Why is it uh, kind of free afloat here? So let us uh, make it uh, more stable. Okay. It should not move move about like that. Here you go. Now uh, it will be easier to uh, attach. Now, so let us work with the kit. Let me reach it. Right, I need uh, to untie it here first. Stand by one. I am holding it and it is secured with one tether hook so you can try to untie it. So you are now in the location where the comm is unstable and please continue providing your reports. You might not hear me for about three minutes. All right, so we are rehooking the ram on the handrail of MLM. Copy. And the same thing with the second one. Stand by. Okay, it is done. Now I have to untangle that one. Okay, let me do it. Oleg, all right, so let me rehook my trousers first. I move a little bit uh, away from you. So that we don't uh, have to be tethered to one handrail. Now I'm holding it. Now uh, you can hook your tether there, stand by one. Oh, you mean to this location, on the handrail? Yes, you hold it and I rehook my tether. Yes, I'm holding it, Oleg. I will move away a little bit first. Now, 
The handrail is uh, on your left, a little bit uh, over your left hand. That one? Yes, that one. Now you hold it, Dennis. Okay. Alec Dennis, we had a short LOS. Uh, now we have recovered calm. Uh, yes, Moscow, go ahead. Well, it's good that we have recovered calm. So we are rehooking our tethers and we are uh, keeping an eye on the kit at all times. What about your uh, what about your fatigue? Are you fatigued? Uh, are you tired, guys? No. No, we even haven't started the real work, you know. Copy. Uh, let me hold it, Dennis. Uh, you rehook your tether, okay? Yes, uh, I'm holding it. Okay, sounds good. Mm -hmm. So they're twisted somewhat. All right. Okay, so um, this uh, uh, will be turned backwards. Uh, and uh, this is uh, going to be uh, turned uh, with the front uh, side facing us. So wait, hold on. Okay, I'm holding it. Is everything well? Uh, hanging there, just a little bit left. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we are uh, seeing you guys. Так, 
Все, это хорошо. Так, держишь, да? Do you have it? Uh, yes, all right. So I will uh, move forward then. So the antenna is here, and uh, uh, we need to go around it. Uh, going around it. Uh, okay, so I uh, go ahead and uh, hand over this uh, kit. It's on the right, and also uh, make sure that you are careful with uh, the equipment on your right. And the hook is uh, installed here, inaudible. And I'm holding the kit, and Dennis uh, is uh, uh, translating now. Uh, Henry, we're one zero eight. Copy, Oleg, and the uh, EVA lapse time is four hours and thirty minutes. Thank you. Uh, for the update. This is Mission Control Houston, four hours, 33 minutes into uh, today's spacewalk. Oleg Artemiev and Denise Madveyev continue uh, to work on uh, the final planned task of this spacewalk, the installation of a uh, portable workstation adapter on a payload interface uh, near the European robotic arm on the Naoka module of the uh, International Space Station. The crew uh, has completed everything else planned for today, the installation, connection, and checkout of the European robotic arm control panel, the removal of protective covers from payload interfaces and uh, base points, as they are called, to which the arm uh, has been attached since its launch on a Proton M rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome last July. The uh, cosmonauts also installed three handrails on the arm and removed a thermal cover from the elbow of the arm. I'm uh, translating uh, over this ravine. Uh, and uh, I'm now at handrail uh, 4110, uh, next to um, BTL base point 3. Copy. And uh, uh, Denis uh, is uh, still securing his uh, tethers. Okay, Denis, stand by. I'm almost ready to uh, take it from you. Can you push it a bit? Okay, I have it now. I have it now, uh, and I'm holding it. This is the um, kit hook. Keep moving it. Okay, that's uh, all right now.
Wow. It's sunny enough here. Okay, let me hold it, uh, and then I will press the ravine. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so um, please hold it, hold it, uh, and careful, uh, the radiator is here. Denise, how are you feeling? Do you feel tired? Well, I feel tired slightly, but overall I feel well. Never mind, uh, he's not tired. Denise. I copy, Oleg and Denise. Well, uh, basically we have just started working, right? So is it the location that we need or not? Okay. Okay, so you're going to have to rotate the handle now, uh, and uh, uh, we will press it down. So Dennis uh, should come from the other side, and uh, you should be next to the handrail. Oh, like, well, we haven't reached it yet, but I was just asking. Uh, the tail to uh, best uh, point to is it the uh, location that uh, we need? Uh, I guess uh, our goal is near. Excellent. Uh, really great. Okay, uh, let me twist it a bit here, stand by, uh, uh, let me uh, grab it, okay, I'm holding it, okay, and also uh, let me switch my uh, terror hook. Everything is new and shiny, beautiful. So many people uh, worked uh, on it. Okay, I have crossed the ravine now. Okay, and move a bit closer. Okay, give this one to me, okay? Excellent. Uh, please stand by. Uh, do not move uh, right now, otherwise it's going to go underneath you. Just move a bit, and that's it. And uh, I will take it from you now, and let me make space for you. Uh, so how exactly are we going to position ourselves? I guess I'm going to switch to the circular handrails. And uh, also make sure that you do not touch the uh, target near uh, point two. Please repeat your last. So, well, you just touched the uh, target, the one with the black cover. Please do not touch it. Okay.
Так. Сейчас я все вот расположусь. Окей, okay, let me uh, position myself here. Начнем. And we're gonna start. All right, so let me uh, grab the handrail. All right, I'm uh, holding it, so you can go ahead and start translating now. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, let me hold it. Uh, so uh, I guess we've reached our destination. So hold it, please. Uh, do you guys need a break? Uh, you've just finished uh, translating uh, to uh, this area. Well, uh, uh, what's the uh, work order here? Remove the uh, cover, position it. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, remove the cover and then uh, position the uh, one target next to another. And uh, before we start doing that, just a quick question. Uh, aren't you tired? Uh, no, we... Uh, don't want to uh, waste time. So, Oleg, the uh, tether going from your kit got stuck, but it's uh, fine now. Uh, okay, guys, uh, if you're ready, go ahead and start removing the cover. And make sure that you secure it first. So where is it? I have it. All right. Are you holding it? Uh, yes. Small uh, red hook is uh, attached. A copy, and I'm removing the cover now. There it goes. And let me reposition it. Uh, yes, we need uh, to make sure that. Uh, <coughs> One target is oriented towards the other. And the target itself, is it on your side? Yes, it is on your fault. So should I uh, switch my uh, tethers? And I'm going to give this one uh, to you. Uh, Oleg, uh, Denise, uh, we just had an LOS. Uh, so you should uh, install one target next to another. Yes, well, first we removed the covers, and now we need to uh, switch our tethers to make sure that it is positioned uh, uh, better. Okay, let me hold it, and you will pass this to me. So. 
I'll just secure the portion and put on the display. So you can uh, secure it on the handrail, uh, and uh, I will rehook it later. Okay, so I'm holding it. Papa, so. There it goes, that's it. Stand by. So the target is oriented towards me now, correct? Yes. Okay, so let's uh, go slowly. Uh, yes. Uh, do not rush. Uh, just go slowly and uh, position the uh, kit and the target, etc. All right, Godspeed. Uh, let me take a look at the target now. So, um, should we go this way? Where is the target? So I see it now. Uh, it's on the top there. It should be there. No. So I, I think we're, oh, we need to move, move it more. Just like this. So what's going on with the tethers? Should it go here? Like this. Stand by. Wait. More. And uh, rotate a bit more. Go uh, counterclockwise. Okay, now uh, it is uh, correct. And, uh, this is Mission Control Houston. Outside of uh, the Russian segment of the station, in the vicinity of the uh, European robotic arm on the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module, Sure Oleg Artemiev and Denise Matveyev continue their work to install a portable workstation adapter at a payload interface that uh, will be used to, to stage payloads for the European robotic arm to grab and uh, move to various uh, points in which uh, those payloads will be affixed on the surface of Naoka in the future. Now, uh, yes, we can see it now. This is the uh, final planned task of today's spacewalk, which is now four hours and 48 minutes in duration. The two cosmonauts emerging uh, from the Poisk airlock at 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, as they open the hatch to the airlock to begin this spacewalk, the 249th, in support of space station assembly, maintenance, and upgrades. Uh, yes, could you go ahead and... Uh, which uh, uh, this uh, hook. And Oleg, I think you can uh, reach it with this tether. I think it would be sufficient. Yes, it should be fine. Uh, yes, take a break. Uh, take a break, and uh, you will then proceed with uh, connecting it all. So right now, or should I go clockwise? Uh, yes, uh, clockwise to uh, retract it. All right. Denis, is the uh, PRM adapter too heavy to hold? Because Oleg is taking a break and you're holding it. This is Oleg. I'm also uh, helping to hold it uh, from the top. And this is Denis. Uh, this thing is uh, fine. And Denis, so before you start rotating the wrench, make sure that 
uh, that the um, uh, PRM adapter uh, is uh, sitting tight against the uh, bishop. Like this. So let's uh, uninstall this uh, wrench now because if we start doing it right away, then uh, this can be detached. It should go here. Uh, yes. Yes, and one more thing. Yes, yes. Yes, one more thing. The socket should be flush in such a way that. What was that? Can you pull it back to um, operating position? And when I uh, try lifting it, it comes out. Alex, put it back to um, operating operation, and then uh, you can uh, push again. Okay, uh, it is uh, in place now. Should we start uh, rotating? Uh, yes. Uh, push down and uh, uh, keep rotating until uh, it clicks uh, and uh, uh, it should be retracting. Okay. It should be approximately uh, 70 turns. I guess uh, uh, we should have brought some uh, rubber tie. Yeah. So we didn't think of that. Oleg, please repeat your last. Uh, it's loose. So we should have brought a uh, rubber tie uh, to secure it. To secure it in place. Yes. Because it's loose. Well, it's uh, loose and inaudible. Uh, all I got didn't copy. So I start rotating it, and uh, it uh, feels loose. Okay, I guess it's going to work. Yes. So what's going on here? I guess it's a mess. Uh, we should have brought something to secure it with. Yeah, I 
вот так вот делать, вот так, а я, а я буду двумя руками. Yes, it should be positioned like this, uh, and uh, I'm, I am going to uh, hold it down with uh, both hands. Okay. Uh, yes, we uh, really need that uh, rubber tie here. Yes, indeed, it uh, uh, would work great here. Yes, I'm holding it. Let me try it. Uh, yes, I'm holding it. Stand by. Okay, uh, I guess I'm in a good position now. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, it is in place now. Are you holding it? Uh, I guess we need some slack here. Okay, uh, let me uh, untwist it. Uh, Oleg, uh, you are rotating it in the wrong direction. Uh, it is supposed to be retracting. Please wait. Okay, go ahead. Hold on. Started to go up. Stand by. We would like to ask you to secure the uh, French hook of the red closer to yourself. So you would like to have it a little bit tighter, right? Well, you know, when we are trying to rotate it, uh, it's coming up. Is that how it's supposed to be? Well, you made too few uh, rotations, turns, uh, to for us to be sure that it's secure. Okay. Oleg or Dennis, actually, Dennis, maybe you can have that this rope above or over your um, glove, not on the side of your palm, but on the outer side. Stand by. Okay, then hold on. And now let's try. I I got it. Go ahead.
Hold it. This is Mission Control Houston. We've just passed the five hour mark in today's spacewalk by Denise Matveyev, wearing the uh, suit with the blue stripes on your left, and Oleg Artemiev, wearing the suit with the red stripes on your right. The two cosmonauts uh, working very efficiently on the final task of today's spacewalk, the completion of the installation of a portable workstation adapter on a payload interface point on the outside of the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module. This work coming after uh, this spacewalk uh, began the first in a series of such excursions to activate and operate the European robotic arm that was launched on Naoka last July when uh, the module itself was launched uh, from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on a Proton-M proton rocket docking uh, to the port that had previously uh, been uh, occupied by the Piers docking compartment for a number of years. Today's work uh, involved the installation and connection of the European Robotic Arms spacewalk control panel. That all checked out in great shape. The uh, two cosmonauts removed protective covers from a series of payload interfaces and base points for the arm to which it will ultimately walk off and attach itself uh, for the operation of uh, payload uh, placement and uh, spacewalker uh, movements around the uh, Russian segment of the International Space Station. The two cosmonauts installed a trio of handrails on the arm itself and removed a thermal cover from the elbow of the arm. The next spacewalk that uh, Artemiev and Matveyev will conduct is on April 28th, in which they'll go back outside the Poisk module airlock to remove a number of launch locks that held uh, the arm in place during its liftoff and transit to the International Space Station and uh, begin uh, the first uh, monitoring of the task to uh, have the arm actually move away from its uh, fixation point right now on Naoka to uh, ensure that uh, it can actually uh, operate and move, uh, albeit in very slow fashion, in its initial stage of its checkout activities. The arm will be used to ultimately uh, place a radiator uh, from one location to another for its deployment on the multipurpose laboratory module for heat uh, dissipation, and uh, will ultimately uh, move an airlock that is currently uh, located on Naoka to its final uh, uh, operational destination on the multipurpose laboratory module so that uh, the Russian segment will have two different airlocks from which spacewalks can be conducted. So where are we? All right, we have the most of it secured. Try and rotate it. All right, it's not even wobbling. Great.
Да прошел человек. Да прошел человек. Unintelligible. No, not yet. All right, let me hold it for a second. It's probably too many. Almost 70. Hey. Sergey. Sergey has said his goodbyes, right? Yes, he did. All right, let me uh, turn it a few more times. Okay, there we go. Now, please secure the uh, tool, the wrench. With the wire tie, right? Yes, and then take a break, please. Okay. Well, you little wrench, let me secure it. You. And uh, on telemetry, we see that the PRM adapter has been successfully installed. Hooray! So it's, this work definitely wasn't in vain. That's right. One red, two red. Stand by for a second. Are you moving to the right? Does it need to be... Uh, well, it needs to be um, at the bottom. Then it's probably going to be enough. And here and now in this direction. All right, we have the handle secured, and we're taking a break. Take a break, because it's a manual drive, and you will proceed to in the direction of MRM. I think it's too much. Okay, and they haven't floated away. No, they have not.
Wow, this is so beautiful. Unintelligible. Oleg, do you have a chance to... Oleg, could you um, verify what's the status of the MLI, of the fueling uh, units, um, just to make sure whether it's... Uh, stitched down or not, or sewed on. Uh, do you want me to check the area where the valve is? Yes, uh, the valve specifically. Well, when we're on our way back, we'll definitely check. Well, we can go and check it now. And do we want to leave the um, tethers? No, we'll need to take the tethers back. And the adapter needs to be um, secured to the manual drive. So now you need to unscrew two wing nuts and put it in the open position. Okay. This is Mission Control Houston, five hours, 14 minutes into today's spacewalk by Oleg Artemiev and Denise Matveyev. The two cosmonauts are currently wrapping up the final task of today's spacewalk, that being the installation of a portable workstation adapter on a payload interface to which future payloads will be mounted near the uh, European robotic arm on the outside of the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module. The two cosmonauts uh, completed everything on their uh, task list for the day. The installation and connection of the European robotic arm spacewalk control panel near a base point to which the arm is currently mounted. The uh, full checkout in all modes of uh, that uh, Control panel were completed uh, by Russian flight controllers of the Russian Mission Control Center in Karlyov. Everything checked out in great shape. The two cosmonauts removed protective covers from a series of payload interfaces and base points to which the arm will be affixed in the future. They installed three handrails on uh, the arm itself, removed a thermal cover from the elbow of the arm that uh, was temporarily stowed and will be jettisoned during the next spacewalk this pair of cosmonauts will conduct on April 28th. And uh, again, uh, they're wrapping up work on the final task of the day, the installation of a workstation adapter for payloads on the outside of the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module. The next spacewalk, again, uh, that's planned for April 28th by Artemiev and Matveyev, will see them uh, remove additional thermal covers uh, from the uh, European robotic arm. Yeah. They'll release a number of launch locks that have held the arm in place on Naoka since it lifted off uh, with the laboratory module on a Proton M rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome last July. And uh, they will watch as uh, commands are sent uh, to actually back the arm off of its two uh, grapple points, very much like the uh, K-1 
Canadarm2 robotic arm on the U.S. segment of the International Space Station. Unintelligible. There are uh, two end effectors on the European arm, yes. which, when unfurled, measures 37 feet in length. The uh, European arm uh, always was designed uh, to augment the operation of the Canadarm2 robotic arm and the Japanese robotic arm on the Kubo module on the U.S. segment of the station. Since uh, both Canadarm2 and the Japanese arm uh, cannot reach the Russian segment, so this now will provide three robotic arm capabilities for the International Space Station in the future. Well, this activity uh, has been ongoing throughout the course of the day. Uh, mission managers uh, representing uh, the International Space Station program, NASA, SpaceX, and Axiom met uh, in a weather briefing and concluded that the uh, first undocking opportunity for the Axiom 1 crew on the Crew Dragon Endeavor tomorrow morning would not be acceptable from a splashdown weather standpoint. And so the decision was made to waive off the morning opportunity and point uh, to an evening opportunity on Tuesday night, weather permitting. The way uh, the programming uh, will work for tomorrow is that the uh, farewell remarks by the Axiom 1 crew will be broadcast on NASA television at uh, 6 a.m. Central Time, 7 a.m. Eastern Time, right after the completion of the Crew 4 virtual news conference that will take place uh, from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The Crew 4 astronauts, uh, Commander Chell Lindgren, Pilot Bob Hines, and uh, mission specialists Jessica Watkins and Samantha Cristoforetti of the European Space Agency arrived at the Kennedy Space Center several hours ago for the final phase of their uh, pre-launch training that will lead to a liftoff on Saturday morning from the Kennedy Space Center at 5.26 a.m. Eastern Time. Getting back to tomorrow's activities, the farewell remarks will stay where they are on the timeline for the crew. That will be followed by uh, the crew members on board taking a nap at midday and then reconvening on Tuesday night, weather permitting, for uh, the closing of the hatch that is scheduled around 8 p.m. Eastern Time and an undocking at approximately 10 p.m. Eastern Time to uh, begin the trip home for the four Axiom 1 crew members with a splashdown scheduled at mid-afternoon on Wednesday, April 20th. This all is contingent on uh, the weather being acceptable for the next splashdown opportunity uh, and uh, the next undocking opportunity for Axiom 1. Another weather briefing is planned for Tuesday morning to assess conditions to support a Tuesday night undocking opportunity. Although here, we probably want to have it more secure. And is it this one that we will be working with? Yes. And you can close it. Thank you. It's closed. Sergey, this is M. Crosstalk, Moscow called Sergei on Space Ground 2. Right. And let's tighten this. Uh, we not sighting it. Yeah, 
Okay. And we'll just make sure you we can't, it can't be unscrewed. Yes. And please make sure that the tab is in the open position. It's in the open position. So that's the light kit, right? Is that what we call a light kit? Yes. What did you... Don't forget to... Don't forget we... We actually um, would always attach a barber when we were training to it, when we were training in the NBL. Oh, really? All right, so we need to get that French hook, right? Let me um, get there, get get to that spot. Yeah. And I'll, um, try to be here. And here is the hook. I should probably attach it to myself. Um, short red. Or maybe... Um, an OTA. Well, I'm uh, securing it to my... Um, Short, right. And the other one can be secured to the um, handrail, from one handrail to the other. Sounds good. I got my hand caught in there, my left hand. Can you help me out? Well, not with the late left one yet. Okay, and I got untangled. So I would attach it to myself then. Yes. Attach it to yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Так. Okay. So you'll be going first, and I will follow you. Sounds good. And... The second red or umbilical should be secured to us. So the um, EVA time is uh, five hours twenty five minutes. Uh, well, what else do we um, need to to do? Переход тоже время займет. So. And you will have to come back uh, again. And we just wanted to let you know that probably you won't have enough time 
for the camera because um, you will have spent some time translating. And I think um, it will be enough. And we could have done that. And at the uh, five hour, 27 minute mark into uh, the spacewalk, the two cosmonauts have completed uh, the final task of the day, that being the installation of a portable workstation adapter on a payload interface to which payloads will be mounted in the future for movement uh, via the new European robotic arm. With that, uh, Artemiev and Matveyev will begin to clean up uh, their work site, collect their tools and other equipment that they've used during today's spacewalk, and uh, shortly will make their way back down uh, the Strela boom uh, to translate uh, back toward the Poisk airlock where they will conduct a final inventory of all their equipment before uh, moving inside of the airlock and closing the hatch that will mark the official end of today's excursion. Okay, and we are translating. All right. We are translating along. Okay, when are we going to have the installation time? 10 by 1. In about in about twelve minutes, one two. Okay, I understand. Thank you.
Да, в это место у нас установки радиатора, да? So this is the radiator installation location? Да, вот он, слабом защитник. Yes. It is here uh, the protective and intelligible. So we have reached this trailer boom. So one tether is already attached to the ring. Copy, Alec.
testimony. Okay, so I will be on this side and you will be on the opposite side, correct? Here you go. That is I'm holding it. Right. So we both are on the Estrella boom, on the ring, copy, Alec. So we have removed the hook, and now we are, can start rolling. Copy. You know, the ring uh, is uh, uh, attached to the wire. Right, this is the telecamera, just in one step away from me. It, it was. Alec, uh, we will perform this activity next time. Don't worry. We still have an hour, even an hour and a half, till the end of the day. Alec, do you copy me in Moscow? Yes, we do. Unintelligible. We could have actually performed uh, uh, this activity. Next time, Alec, you will have this opportunity to unscrew it. So I have an extender, and I think it will fit to the ridge. Yeah. I, yes, it's just a little bit uh, short. Alec, in one minute uh, you will have installation and uh, uh, you will be able then to take pictures of uh, the surroundings. All right. Yes, we have time for that. 
Five hours, 42 minutes into the uh, spacewalk. Artemiev and Medveyev are wrapping up uh, all of their activities around the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory Module, now in the vicinity of the Strela telescoping boom that they will shinny down to uh, return to the Poisk Module and uh, the uh, airlock from which they emerged at 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time today to begin uh, this 249th spacewalk in support of space station assembly, maintenance, and upgrades. Okay. We had a good uh, translation. Uh, now we can take pictures of the surroundings. Okay, Dennis, have a look. Uh, I'm uh, uh, taking pictures and video. Yes, yep. 
we are starting to translate towards the hatch. Well, maybe we should clean the window here. But, you know, Sergei wants letters. You know, the windows are uh, not clean. You know, you will have plenty of opportunities and plenty, plenty of work uh, during the next EVAs, guys. Okay, Dennis, uh, let's move. So what what is the matter there? You wouldn't you don't want to leave, Dennis? Okay, so try to move. Unintelligible. That is, you know, I cannot, uh, I cannot move you. You know, you your weight like uh, about 200 kilograms. So could you please push, uh, and uh, then you will be able to move. Actually, you you can even get stuck here. There is a plenty of uh, chances to do that. Mind the batteries, the arrays. Okay, the station wouldn't let us go. It says, I don't want to let you go. Stand by one. I am at this side once again. So, you know, you can actually squeeze behind the boom. Okay, please secure everything. Yes, don't worry, we will do that. Now, the sun is so bright here. I think, uh, you know, these bunches got stuck here. I think we should have done it uh, differently. Right. So 
this is not a coach at all. Okay, so where is this safety tether here? It's uh, not far from you, so the, where is your hook? Okay, I am securing it. Here ago I found it. This is done. The ring is secured. Copy, Alec. Now I need to translate. The second hook, copy, now the kit, so, you know, the interference in comp, you know, a lot of uh, background noise. So the EV-1 uh, is controlling the kit unintelligible. That's a lot of background noise. Can you, do you copy me? Well, uh, hardly. How do you copy me? We copy you, but now the the noise uh, is gone. All right, copy. How do you copy me now? Well, it's uh, the background noise again. So what about now? I. I can hardly hear you. I can hardly hear you, Moscow. So, Dennis? Okay, please uh, go ahead. Okay, so when you are ready, Alec, uh, uh, Move the manual drive, unintelligible. Well, I said, Dennis. We can use another handrail. So we are both, uh, we got off uh, from the boom, both of us. 
popping. Yeah, and there's a lot of noise. Okay, so it looks like some kind of a motor is working. Yeah. I don't know. I have no idea. It's a, it looks like it, uh, it's near the progress vehicle. That's where it is coming from. Well, don't worry. So should I first uh, put in the manual drive, or should I ingress first myself? Moscow is inaudible. So could you please come again? You can secure the manual drive to the handrail, and then uh, after you ingress, you can take it in. All right. And also, you should inspect your spacesuits. Okay. One hook from the kit is inside. Copy, Oleg. And the second one will be there shortly. All right. Let's get in the manual drive and then proceed with the checkout of the suits. All right, you've been exactly six hours. Um, you've been outside exactly for six hours. Okay, we copy. That's good. We should have stayed a little bit longer and done something else. Денис, if you're ready, then all right, uh, Dennis, Oleg, if you are ready, start with the suit inspection. This is Mission Control Houston, six hours, two minutes into the uh, spacewalk by Artemiev and Matveyev. You uh, are looking at Denis Matveyev, who is wrapping up the first spacewalk of his career for Artemiev, the fourth of his career, a completely successful spacewalk in which uh, the two cosmonauts began the outfitting 
of uh, the European robotic arm on the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module, installing and connecting a control panel, removing protective covers from payload interfaces and base points to which the arm will move about uh, the outside of Naoka. The two cosmonauts installed three handrails, removed a thermal cover from the arm's elbow, and uh, installed a portable workstation adapter on one of the payload interface areas on the outside of the multipurpose laboratory module. The two cosmonauts uh, will climb back inside the Poisk airlock momentarily. Uh, they'll spend about 10 minutes uh, inspecting each other uh, to make sure their suits are clean and then uh, we'll wait uh, for their sublimators or cooling uh, apparatus uh, to uh, bring them back to the proper temperature inside the airlock before they close the hatch that will mark the official end of today's spacewalk. Also, just an FYI, you still have the ratchet wrench uh, attached to, to your uh, French hook and secure it with your French hook. Uh, make sure that it's actually secured. It is. I have it secured. It seems like it's just floating next to you. I may have may have just gotten caught on something. Sure. All right, I got it. Do you see anything else? Anything off nominal? No. One of my gloves is looking good. The other one is not so much. Um, so... If you see... Do, do you want us to wipe down the uh, suits? Well, if you see contamination, uh, some dirt in any um, of the areas, you need to grab the towels and uh, wipe it all down. Do you have it ready? Yes. And uh, let's check. Uh, could you check me too? Yeah, it's also yellow. All right, my left glove is covered with something yellowish, and Dennis's right one is covered with the same something. No, we copy. Grab the towels and wipe it all down. Will do. From somewhere on top. All right, one French hook needs to go here, uh, close to you. So, where should I uh, secure it to? Well, actually, maybe the hatch cover. Are uh, you holding it? Got it? I'm getting the towel out. All right, I got the towel.
All right, and here is the wire tie. And oops, it floated away. Give me the towel. Uh -huh. It's on your right side. And let's get it secured. And we have the handrail uh, next to us, right? Yes. Use the external surface handle, of course. Yeah. We understand. It's not funny. Dennis, did you manage to wipe down your gloves? Yes, yes, definitely, we did. Okay, we are ready, and we have secured the wire tie. Bobby, now let's do the all the um, the inspection of the uh, USOS tools and OTAs. Okay, uh, Dennis, since you're going to be first, let's start with you. Six hours, 11 minutes into the uh, spacewalk, Artemiev and Madveyev uh, have wiped down uh, their suits and gloves. One of the towels used uh, for that uh, wipe down uh, is being uh, affixed with a wire tie to the outside of the Russian segment. It likely will be jettisoned uh, during the next spacewalk. This pair of cosmonauts will conduct on April 28th to continue the outfitting of the European robotic arm. They're now performing uh, the expected uh, inventory of all their tools uh, before they make their way back inside the Poisk airlock as they uh, begin to wrap up this spacewalk, highly successful spacewalk, that uh, initiated uh, the activation and uh, outfitting and commissioning of the European robotic arm on the Naoka multipurpose laboratory module, the arm having launched with Naoka last July from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. I still have it. Trash bag? A small trash bag is still attached to me. Copy. Looking good. Now, you also Three small, small reds. Three small, small reds. And one small, small 
rest with the uh, 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 for the tray adapter. I have one small rest for the ratchet wrench, and the other one is for the camera, and the other one is for uh, the um, knife, and the other one is for the adapter. That's right. Also, you should have a large small rest. A large small rest. I have it. I have one large small rest. And you also should have an adjustable tether. And the adjustable tether has been accounted for. On the crew lock bag, right? Oleg? Yes, it's attached to the crew lock bag. Copy, Oleg. Now, you have a go to ingress. And we will perform uh, the same inventory for Dennis, then. Uh, could you please update the IMS, guys? Of course. Just as a memento. Dennis, are you ready? All right. I have one. Okay. Dennis, there was an LOS, a short LOS. Let's uh, do it one more time. And let me, like, I will just name the items, and, and you will, uh, and get, uh, you will confirm the gap keeper. Um, do you have it? We do. A large trash bag. It's inside. Copy. An OTA. The two caddies in place. Two caddies in place. A swing arm is in place as well. We copy. And you should also have three uh, French hooks for small, small rats. Have one uh, for the cutter. Another one is for the GoPro. And I took one um, safety tether from the large trash bag. Okay, and what about the, adjust, uh, the adjustable tether? It's inside. I actually didn't even take it outside with me. Keeper. Um, is in one kind of bundle with other items. And a large, small red. Yes, it is there. And present. Copy. Dennis, Oleg, please turn off your hacker cameras. Okay. Large camera is off. Oleg, could you please confirm the uh, camera has been turned off? Hold on, hold on. You just caught me mid-stride, so to say, as I was uh, translating. I'll answer in a second. Stand by. Dennis, what was the handrail that you used to secure the uh, towels to? Uh, 
that's the handrail. So both towels are on this um, handrail. Is that right? Is that correct? Maybe. Yes. Correction. Yes. Oleg, please report once you have the camera off. Will do. Maybe you can get closer to me, all right? Can't really reach you that easy. Oh, wow, you... You're pretty far, are you? Yes, I'm pretty far away. Stand by. Maybe we can you can use just one inside. This is Mission Control Houston, six hours, 19 minutes into the spacewalk as Oleg Artemiev and uh, Denise Matveyev wrap up their spacewalk for the day, about to enter the airlock following uh, an inspection of their suits and an inventory of all of the tools they used in this initial spacewalk, the first of at least about a half a dozen such spacewalks in which they will and have uh, outfitted uh, and begun to activate the European robotic arm. That robotic arm, 37 feet in length, is uh, ultimately going to be used to augment the Canadarm2 robotic arm and the Japanese robotic arm that uh, have serviced the USOS segment of the International Space Station for many years now. Those two arms uh, can't reach over to the Russian segment, hence the need for yet another robotic arm, this time uh, supplied by the European Space Agency to enable payloads and people to move about and be installed in various locations of the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module. And uh, Dennis's camera is off as well. Great. Now, Dennis, you can get inside. Copy. All right, two uh, French hooks are inside, and I am ingressing. We copy. Dennis. Once you are inside, get the protective ring ready, but please do not close the hatch, uh, not just yet. I copy. Oleg, Denis. Oleg, Denis, go ahead. Well, when you situate yourself inside, before you remove the protective ring, we are going to turn off the sublimators, and while the sublimators are drying, uh, that's when you can start working with the uh, protective ring. Okay. 
All right, that sounds like a plan. And we'll be situating ourselves meanwhile here. Where do you want my head to go? Towards the hatch, because you'll have to close the hatch. Oh, sorry. You okay? Good day. All right. No, no, no. Don't go backwards. Maybe we should take it with us, or should we leave it outside? Well, I am inside. All right, and grab this uh, tether with you. Will you reach? Can you reach it? No, that one. The um, orange one? Yes, the orange one on the left side. That's kind of going outside. Dennis, Oleg, since you're inside, we should follow Mr. Glazov's advice. Okay. Oleg, Dennis, this is Gennady Glazov. Could you please turn off your sublimators and put the hot, cold um, handle uh, in the open position and the uh, ASTR um, can be turned off already? All right, it is off. The STR system is off. We copy. Hmm. So, this is Mission Control Houston, now six hours, 25 minutes into the uh, spacewalk. Artemiev and Madveya back inside the Poisk airlock. The hatch is still open as they uh, wrap up a few uh, final tasks before getting the green light from Russian flight controllers to close the hatch that will mark the official end of today's spacewalk. Copy. So uh, the counter will start up now. Uh, so it may take about 10 minutes um, for the dry out. If, but uh, if uh, it dries out earlier, then it will let you know and tell you, basically show you uh, that uh, it's all nominal and norma or normal. And then you can, and meanwhile you can work with the uh, protect, uh, with the protective ring. Okay, and if you are Oleg, Dennis, if you are ready, you can start with uh, removing the protective ring. So, please uh, rotate uh, the handles 90 degrees. Hold on, let us remove the protective ring. All right, let's uh, try and remove it. I got my side free. And let us fold it. And put it behind the handrail, right behind the handrail, right here. Let me turn it like this, okay? And me too. There we go. Perfect. And could you help me pull it a little bit down, or out and out, or down and outside? No, just down. Uh, 
Elizabeth Lucas. All right. So where are you going? I just got tangled up a little bit. The camera got tangled up. It's okay. Well, you have your visor still down. Isn't it too dark? Like, is it not too dark for you? No, it's not too dark, and it's not scary. Then. Let me push you up a little bit. Oleg, Dennis, once you stow the protective ring, please let me know. I will have some recommendations for you. Okay, we have it stowed. And what's your recommendation slash request? So, did you want us to unscrew any screws, bolts? Okay. I just uh, wanted to say that our cartridges are limited. Our cartridge is eight, uh, eight hours, 30 seconds. It, it's past eight hours, so you will get this message anyway, and Dennis is going to get it pretty soon as well. Oleg, Dennis, please. Review and inspect, uh, please inspect your gloves uh, one more time so that you definitely have your gloves cleaned and there is nothing left. Well, it, they are a little bit yellowish, but we have uh, plastic, um, but we have uh, bags to um, stow the gloves in. For mine, it's the right glove, and for Dennis's, it's the left one. In, in, but in general, they're looking okay. Yeah, they they just a little bit dirty, dusty, but other than that, all right. Uh, we're going to clean it up later. You can rest now. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll be sending by uh, for head, EV hatch uh, closure confirmation copy. Uh, EV last time is 6 hours and 30 minutes. You have completed all the tasks, and all the tasks have been uh, completed Perfectly. This is EV2. Um, the tail drying uh, is uh, in nominal position. Copy. The temperature, both temperatures should not exceed uh, 15. They do not exceed 15, but they should be uh, above 15 for both water and uh, gas mixture. So what should we do? Uh, no, the pump uh, uh, is actually doing the drying because it circulates warm air and uh, it accelerates uh, the drying process. I can see the bolts from here. Oleg, I can hear you. And uh, he said that will be always. Uh, Oleg, from now on, uh, you're going to see these bolts in your dreams. Uh, well, we needed to make sure that you will be seeing them in your dreams. Yes, I can see it here. Uh, Oleg, don't you worry. Uh, the, uh, I'm already dreaming about this uh, EVA. I know that. 
I know that uh, uh, you are a very responsible person. Six hours, 33 minutes into the uh, spacewalk, Artemiev and Medveyev uh, drying out their spacesuits, as is common practice in the airlock. Before they uh, begin uh, the procedures to close the hatch, they've removed the outer protective ring along the uh, circumference of the hatch that uh, kept it nice and safe and secure during the course of the spacewalk that began at 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And the eight Russian EVA is marked uh, in terms of elapsed time from hatch open to hatch closed, so we'll be standing by for that, as well as official word from Moscow and the Russian flight controllers on the official hatch closure time, after which we'll uh, provide updated spacewalk statistics for you. has not been updated, so it is still on. Uh, using the nine hours. Okay, copy all. And uh, Oleg, uh, what do you see on your uh, counter? They are uh, drying 6.47 on the left and nine minutes on the right. Copy. 6.47, uh, this is the time when you switch to internal power. Yes, and nine minutes is the drying time. So once, once you see 10 minutes, uh, you will see the message that the drying is nominal, and then you're going to close the hatch. Uh, okay, copy all. Олег, посмотри, could you please check the status of your uh, GoPro, uh, which was secured, yes, it was secured near the hatch, and the other one was also secured, so uh, everything is uh, fine in that regard. Copy, Oleg. Uh, Denise, so how do you feel about your very first EVA? Well, he uh, did not unscrew the bolt. So, uh, Oleg, did you get the message that drying was nominal? I missed it. I think it uh, went away. I, I guess I did get the message. Okay, your goal to uh, close the hatch. Copy. Oleg, Denise, uh, you can uh, loosen your tethers now. It's in work. And the hook is also on panel 201. Uh, yes, uh, correct. And we don't really have another one here anyways. Okay, go slowly. Uh, and now you can close it. Uh, so please drop the hook on uh, the handrail, uh, and uh, start closing the hatch. Uh, make sure that uh, there, there is no fog around uh, the hatch. Remove the hatch cover, and uh, please rotate the, uh, the handle to hard stop uh, along the uh, arrow pointing to closed position. Uh, well, the, the cord got uh, wrapped around the uh, handle here or something. So I'm closing it. I'll keep closing it now. And uh, put it underneath the uh, guide rails. 
Okay, so the hatch is closed. All right. And please still the hatch tool. Okay, thanks. So we need to still the uh, hatch tool. The hole is closed. Uh, thank you, Sergey. Uh, Oleg, Denis, uh, thank you very much for your work. Uh, EV uh, time is 8 hours and 37 minutes. You, you've got to be kidding me. Do you mean 6 hours? Yes, 6 hours, 37 minutes. Uh, okay, so the uh, hatch tool is filled. And again, thank you very much, guys. You did an excellent job. Thank you. And we will continue next week. Of course, and during this week, uh, we will be working together, and then there is another EVA coming up next week. And uh, I guess we'll be waiting, looking forward to get the new timeline. Uh, sure, I will uh, send the new timeline this uh, week for you guys. Timeline, the right diagrams for all the upcoming uh, prep activities. Uh, thank you. Sergey, thank you very much. And uh, uh, also, uh, congratulations on your first uh, EVA, uh, Sergey. And uh, 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 it, you really did an excellent job uh, supporting the EVA. Uh, it was great. Uh, it, it was uh, really uh, unprecedented. Thank you, guys. Uh, you also performed at the uh, highest level. And, uh, uh, Denise, congratulations on your first uh, spacewalk. Uh, everything was just great. And uh, uh, it's time for me to sign off or uh, hand over to the other specialist here. And... Uh, um, I'm wishing you success uh, in your mission and uh, in all that you do. Thank you, Sergey. Uh, good luck to you. All the best to you guys. Uh, uh, goodbye. Good luck. Okay, so uh, who's going to talk to us now? Is it going to be Dima? Uh, well, I guess I need to uh, position myself closer to the deck area. There is space here. There is one hook that got underneath a tether. Oh. There it is. Oleg, Denis, how do you read me? This is Dmitry. Uh, I uh, will be guiding the repress. Yes, uh, Dmitry, hello. Uh, we are uh, uh, glad to hear your voice, and same here, guys, and Oleg, Denise, please uh, position yourself comfortably for uh, repress, and uh, please uh, um, make sure that you have uh, all the cue cards for repress. It should be page 4, page uh, 42. All right, so uh, uh, cue card 10. Step four, and uh, we will start on my go. Copy. Uh, uh, Sergey, uh, for Dmitry, uh, for repress, uh, Sergey from MLM, uh, how do you read me? Loud and clear. Uh, Dmitry, how do you read me? This is uh, Sergey. Uh, Sergey, uh, we uh, can hear you, but you're coming in with interference, and I guess Dmitry uh, cannot hear you now. Uh, Dmitry, this is Sergey for repress. How do you read me? Loud and clear and help me. Loud and clear as well. 
And if I understand it correctly, you are ready to proceed. You have everything that you need. You have the electronic version of the uh, EVA 52 procedure in uh, PDF, and it is already opened. Yes, that is correct. Copy. And please confirm that all PECO hatches are now closed. PECO hatches are closed. Copy. And also I wanted to check if hacker cameras are off or uh, they're still running. They're off. They're already off. Okay, hacker cameras are off or FF. Copy. In that case, uh, let's start with uh, step four. Uh, MRMT repress to 260 millimeters from PHO. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, we've now confirmed the hatch closure time that completes uh, today's spacewalk. Hatch closure confirmed by the Russian specialists at the Russian Control Center occurred at 4.37 p.m. Central Time, 5.37 p.m. Eastern Time to bring uh, this spacewalk to a close at six hours and 37 minutes, six hours, 37 minutes for today's spacewalk. We will uh, have complete stats for you in just a moment uh, as uh, Artemiev and Matveyev uh, begin the process of repressurizing the Poisk airlock uh, that will precede uh, them opening up the hatch back uh, to the International Space Station and uh, climbing out of their Orlan spacesuits. Okay, got that. KVD PHO is still standby. Press uh, on KVD PHO is to open. Okay, uh, it's in work. Uh, please note the time. LED is illuminated. And uh, uh, please report on uh, MRM2 and uh, your seat pressure on the DSK 15. And the uh, seat pressure is uh, uh, 0.34. Uh, please repress to 260 millimeters. 40 uh, is the current uh, pressure in the module and 0.3 in the suit. Copy. Uh, thank you. Module pressure is 80, uh, and the suit pressure is 0 0.26, 0 0.27 for EV2. Copy. The module pressure is 130, suit pressure is 0.2, and 0.2 for EV2 as well. Copy. That's good. Module pressure is 160, suit pressure is 0.16 for EV1, 0.16 for EV2, copy. Uh, so uh, what uh, pressure uh, should we reach? Okay, it's 260. Module pressure is 180, suit pressure is uh, 0 0.13 for EV1, 0 0.14 for EV2. Copy. Module pressure is 210, uh, suit pressure for EV1 is 
Point one and point one for EV two. Copy. Module pressure is 230. This is Mission Control Houston uh, with Oleg Artemiev and uh, Denise Matveyev safely back inside the Poisk airlock. Here are uh, the statistics uh, associated with today's spacewalk. This was the 249th spacewalk in support of ISS assembly, maintenance and upgrades. The fourth spacewalk out of the ISS this year and the first for Expedition 67. This was the fourth spacewalk of Oleg Artemiev's career. He now has accumulated 26 hours and 57 minutes of spacewalking time. And, uh, of course, uh, Denise Matveyev, a first-time flyer. This was the first spacewalk of his career, 6 hours and 37 minutes. The spacewalk, by the way, began at 10 a.m. Central Time and ended with hatch closure at 4.37 p.m. Central Time. Of the 249 spacewalks conducted in support of the space station, that has now accrued a total of 1,576 hours and two minutes, which is equivalent to 65 days, 15 hours, and two minutes of spacewalking time. This was the first of uh, what is expected to be uh, numerous spacewalks during Expedition 67. And again, the first uh, today conducted out of the Poisk airlock on the Russian segment of the station for six hours and 37 minutes. 260, and uh, uh, now you guys need to wait for five minutes for the stabilization. And what was the um, um, the pressure, uh, Sergey? Let me check that. Seven. This is the pressure on um, the pressure gauge uh, copy. Uh, that's good. So five minutes for stabilization. And uh, Oleg, uh, you will keep uh, using uh, cue card 11, step 5, uh, switching uh, to onboard uh, power supply copy. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, the repressurization of the Poisk airlock uh, has begun as uh, per... Uh, nominal procedures uh, that uh, repressurization paused momentarily and will resume in just a moment. Today's spacewalk uh, by Artemiev and Matveyev began at 10 a.m. Central Time, ended at 4.37 p.m. Central Time for an elapsed time of 6 hours and 37 minutes. The uh, two spacewalkers will be added again 10 days from now on April 28th in which they'll venture back outside of the Poisk module to continue the outfitting and checkout of the European robotic arm, which they worked on today, installing a control panel, uh, as well as uh, handrails and uh, taking thermal covers off critical points along the 37-foot-long robotic arm, which remains folded at the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module. The spacewalk coming up uh, on April 28th, again scheduled to begin uh, with our coverage at 9 a.m. Central Time, 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, with the spacewalk itself to begin a short time later, is designed to release launch locks and uh, to actually uh, observe the first motion of that European robotic arm from its stowed position along the Naoka Multipurpose Laboratory module will carry all of that for you on NASA television on Thursday, April 28th. And before we sign off, two programming notes for tomorrow on NASA television. 
The crew four astronauts uh, who arrived at the Kennedy Space Center earlier today for final pre-launch training and preparations will conduct uh, what is called a virtual news conference from their crew quarters down at KSC. That uh, will be aired on NASA television at 5.30 a.m. Central Time, 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow morning. Immediately uh, after that uh, is over with, at the top of the hour, at 6 Eastern, uh, 6 Central Time, I should say, 7 a.m. Eastern Time, we will uh, bring you the farewell remarks of the Axiom 1 crew members uh, from the International Space Station in a day in which uh, they are targeting now and undocking from uh, the International Space Station and their Crew Dragon Endeavor for Tuesday night at 9.05 p.m. Central Time, 10.05 p.m. Eastern Time, with a possible splashdown, if weather permits, on Wednesday, April 20th. So stay tuned. Lots of activity ongoing at the International Space Station. We don't want you to miss a moment. In any event, uh, today's spacewalk successfully completed all of the objectives having been accomplished by Oleg Artemyev and Denise Matveyev. Thanks for joining us throughout the day today. This is Mission Control Houston. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Good evening, folks, wherever you may be. I am Brian White from JPL's Office of Communications and Education, and welcome to the Von Karman Series. The Von Karma Talks are a monthly opportunity to engage with you, the public. This is your space program. Now, as a reminder, as we're going through tonight, if we have any technical difficulties, we ask your patience as we get them sorted out. Tonight, we'll be exploring the outer moons, what they're doing out there and what their orbits have to do with us here at home. As always, you are a big part of these discussions and joining us as our questions co-host tonight is Lindsay McLaurin. Hi, Lindsay. Hello, Brian, and welcome, everybody. As a reminder, this is your space program, and we want you to be involved with tonight's discussion. So for wherever you're joining us, please use our chat feature to ask questions, and members from our amazing social media team will pass them along to us. If for some reason you don't see the chat feature, please refresh your page, and it should be there shortly. Let's get started, Brian. Thank you very much, Lindsay. I'm looking forward to hearing those audience questions here in a bit. 
Now our speaker tonight is a radar scientist and an orbital dynamicist from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Dr. Brozovich observed hundreds of near-Earth asteroids with the Goldstone and Arecibo planetary radars. She was involved in the discoveries of binary and triple asteroid systems, 14 moons of Jupiter, and several trans-Neptunian objects. A main belt asteroid, 7295 Brozovich, is named after her. Her research also involves tonight's subject, orbital dynamics of the moons of the outer planets. And she worked on NASA's New Horizons mission to the dwarf planet Pluto, as a part of the hazards team. She received her undergrad undergraduate degree in physics at the University of Zagreb in Croatia and her PhD in physics from Duke University. She spent several years at Caltech as a postdoc before joining JPL. Please welcome Dr. Marina Brozovic. Hi, Marina. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Brian. Thank you for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for being here. And we're gonna start with the basics. What is it that we consider satellites of the older system? How do we find them? Where do we find them? What is their origin? Well, the most basic definition of a satellite is just a small body orbiting a large body. And the small bodies that I want to talk about are actual natural, planet, natural satellites of planets. And we find these objects within planetary hill sphere. And planet's hill sphere is just basically region of space where planet gravity dominates the sun gravity. And the size of these hill sphere, it depends on how massive the planet is. And actually, let's go to our first slide. And so it depends how large the planet, how massive the planet is and how far away it is from the sun. So here we see kind of visual comparison of the hill spheres of the planet. Um, Jupiter, despite being the most massive planet, does not have the largest hill sphere. That goes to Neptune which is still a fairly large planet and it's very far away from the sun and so it has this really large region of space where it could potentially have its satellites and you see that the size of its hill sphere is almost three quarter distance from earth to the sun so really really large space um, and going back to your question about origins, well, um, their orbits and the sizes of satellites, they tell us, they kind of give us a hint. Um, so let's go to perhaps next slide, where I'm just going to go um, over three basic groups of what, of the planetary satellites. So we have the regular satellites, we have the inner satellites, and we have the outer moons, or sometimes called the regular moons. Um, and I'm going to start with basic. We are all familiar with the regular satellites. Those would be like the Galilean satellites of Jupiter. So these are kind of massive spherical bodies that are orbiting the planets in almost perfect circles. And they're along the equator of the planet and they orbit in the same direction as the planet spins. And they form with the planet itself from the circumplanetary nebula. And then inner to these uh, regular satellites, uh, we have the inner satellites and we sometimes call them the collisional shards because um, they probably used to be regular satellites that are ground down to smaller pieces, but they still have these nice circular orbits. Uh, and then uh, when you see these weird orbits marked in red, these are the irregular satellites. Uh, they orbit from huge distances from the planet. Their orbits are anything but circular. They are you know, very elongated. They're not anymore aligned with the planet's equator. And they know to orbit the planet in the opposite direction that the planet is revolving around the sun, which kind of gives us a strong hint that these are not native to the system. These are actually captured objects. Um, presumably, you know, they used to orbit the sun and at some point they came too close to the planet and it's just basically planet gravity caught it. And dynamicists are still kind of debating exactly on which mechanism is the best to capture an object. And also we are, there are a lot of puzzles about their, their kind of source region. You know, we don't know whether these are captured asteroids from the main belt or these are perhaps Kuiper Belt objects, or, or you know, there's something in between. And, and, I, and I really hope to kind of tell you a little bit more stories um, about the irregular satellites as we, as we go through our kind of chat today. Yeah, well, as you talk about how there's still some uncertainty with how they get captured, have we found all of the planetary satellites in our solar system so far? Uh, 
well, it's safe to say we definitely find all those big regular satellites, but we're probably missing uh, a some number of the inner satellites, and we're missing a lot of the outer satellites. So the current head count is we have 213 moons. These are acknowledged by the International um, Astronomical Union. And our job here at the Solar System Dynamics at JPL is to keep track of their orbits, so to calculate their orbits. So we're a little bit like, you know, flight control for the solar system. And we depend on astronomers to observe them. And so let's, let's take a look at the next slide. These are images uh, from where we get our data. So uh, to your left, you're seeing this is example. These are inner moons of Neptune. And so what astronomers do, they have to kind of block this bright glare of the planet. And then they work really hard to dig out these really you know, tiny specks of light from the background. And they report to us measurements of their position with respect to central planets in time. And they have a little bit easier time with the outer satellites. Uh, you see here to your right, this is an outer moon of Jupiter. And you see this little bright glint as it's darting off uh, across the, the, the stellar background. And in this case, you know, they don't have to deal, deal like with the bright glare of the planet. They just kind of measure its position in time with respect to the stars. And now we have kind of, you know, beginning of, you know, we have all the data, all the ingredients that we can, we can start doing our orbit fit. You started to hint at your group and, and the people you work with. So let's talk a little bit about you and the solar system dynamics group. How do you calculate these orbits? Yeah. So, um, Basically, it's just physics. Um, so I try to let's go to the next slide because this is where I kind of try to visualize the 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 our orbit fitting, uh, what orbit fit really is. So 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 basically, you start with a dynamical model. So this would be an equation of motion that takes into account all the forces that are acting on the satellite. So this blue circle that you're seeing here, this is your dynamical model. And then what we also have are, you know, look at these little balloons. These are our free parameters. And objective of the orbit fit is to adjust these free parameters so that your starting position and velocity of a satellite, that this blue dynamical model can correctly propagate it in time so that you can reproduce your measurements. And, um, you know, we go through iterations and we have these algorithms that are uh, minimizing the difference between our orbits and the measurements at hand by adjusting these parameters. And you'll notice that some of the balloons are larger than the others because some of these parameters end up being more uh, important than the others. And so once when all this is done, I'll show you how, um, uh, you know, the, the on the next slide, please. Uh, this is kind of how we evaluate the, the quality of our orbit fit. We are looking at the differences between our uh, simulated data and the real data. And this is something we call residuals. And as an orbit fitter, we love our plots um, with residuals. Um, and, um, you know, they, there is no better way to, to, to show this. And, and I know when I give my, you know, technical talks, if I show more than three of these, I, I know I can put half of my audience to sleep. So I'm not going to do that, um, but I just want to mention that, um, you know, the orbit fitting is important because um, you need to know orbits in order to tell a story and to understand the system. You mentioned to me before we did this tonight that you've got some great animations of planetary systems. Um, they show, they're showing the real position of the satellites in time. Which one do you want to start with tonight? Yeah, so what you're going to be seeing, I made some I made some visualization and and these are real orbits. So so you could be, you know, pointing your telescope or flying a mission based on orbits that you're going to see. Um, we have to start with the system of Jupiter. So let's go to the to the next slide. And so here is Jupiter and it really has it has 80 natural satellites. Um, and what you're seeing here first, you have four Galilean satellites, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And then inner to these, you have these four inner satellites. 
And they're also connected with the system of faint rings that Jupiter has. Um, they're, they're strange objects, you know, some of them kind of resemble asteroids. Um, and there are even some theories that they could be captured, but it's very difficult to explain how something captured could end up in this well-behaved circular orbit along the planet's equator. And what you're going to soon see, you're going to see where Juno spacecraft is right here. It's currently exploring the system of Jupiter. And then here, far beyond orbit of Callisto, this is where party starts. This is the realm of the outer moons of Jupiter. And there are 72 of them that we know of. So the ones in yellow, they are what we call the prograde moons. Basically, they're revolving around the planet in the same direction that planet is revolving around the sun. And the red ones are revolving in the opposite direction. So these are the retrograde moons. And the largest representative of these um, moons in yellow, it's called Himalaya, uh, quite large. It's about 140 kilometers in diameter. And it's related to some other members of this group in yellow. Uh, basically, the idea is that once upon a time, this was a larger object that collided with something. And then we're looking at these shards that evolved into the, or, or own orbits. And similar story, you're looking at this yarn of red satellites. So believe it or not, there are like three, there are three families there that also presumably once upon a time were a much larger body that got collisionally disrupted. And, uh, um, you know, we, at um, SSD, we um, calculate the current orbits of these satellites, but there are dynamicists out there that spin these orbits um, backward and forward in time for millions, even billions of years, because they, they, they want to answer questions about their origin and their ultimate destiny. And there are always some interesting stories to tell. So um, I really want to draw your attention to this moon in white. white. It's called Valetudo. And that one is the outermost prograde moon. Basically, it is orbiting in a region of space where everybody else is uh, retrograde. So, so it, is, it is kind of driving against traffic. Um, and what dynamical studies are showing is that sooner or later, it's going to cross paths and have head-on collision. And another thing we know about this moon, it's very small. It's about only maybe uh, one kilometer in size, perhaps smaller. Um, and there is no, it doesn't have any other piece that, that is related to it. So that kind of brings an interesting story, and that is that it's perhaps the last surviving member that got ground down to this tiny little piece and that ended up uh, creating perhaps some of these big retrograde families in a head-on, past head-on collisions. I, I love Jupiter, but personally, yeah. I love looking at Saturn. And I know that Saturn has more moons than Jupiter. First off, am I right about that? And how could, how do the rings of Saturn fit into this story about the satellites? Yeah. Okay. Well, funny that I have an animation about um, about Saturn. So so let's go to the next slide. So you're correct. Saturn has 83 moons, uh, natural satellites, while Jupiter has 80. Uh, the most obvious thing at Saturn are this huge system that you know its rings. Uh, we think they originate from a disruption of a small moon some hundred million years ago. And even the current moons in the system, they still play a role in the life of rings. They're either um, responsible for these gaps in the rings, or they're actually source of material themselves. So um, let's take a tour here. You are seeing there are 24 regular satellites of Saturn. So the blue colors are the large satellites. So those would be like um, Rhea or Titan. And then in these light colors, these are tiny little guys. Um, so that would be like Daphne or Atlas. And um, moon that is actually really interesting here is um, Enceladus. You probably know about Enceladus. Uh, it's spewing these icy particles and it's a source of this very faint drink, which is stretching from the orbit of Mimas all the way to the orbit of Titan. So that is, you know, the moons are really kind of interconnected and interleaved with a system of rings. And you're going to see, yeah, this is where Cassini used to orbit the system toward the end of its mission. And again, we are entering the realm of the outer satellites. Uh, the 
yellow ones, those are the prograde satellites, and this crowd of red ones are the retrogrades. Similar to Jupiter, uh, we have several dynamical families. So again, presumably something much larger got collided and, and it, the shards evolved into their own orbits. And we have another traffic offender. Uh, there is another little moon, this time with a, uh, a poetic name, 2004 S24. So this one is the outermost uh, prograde moon. Uh, it again, probably, you know, dynamically, it could collide with some of the retrograde moons and, and, and perhaps, you know, it formed some of these retrograde families. And in fact, actually, you know, the, the, when you mentioned how it kind of how Saturn overtook the number of satellites uh, from Jupiter, that, 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 occurred, that happened in 2019, when there were 20 new satellites of Saturn announced. And basically, uh, surveys are currently discovering at Jupiter satellites that are, say, about 500 meters, so really small. And on Saturn, um, they're seeing things about a few kilometers because Saturn is, you know, farther away, so it's more difficult to see small pieces. Uh, but definitely, we are missing a lot of these. Um, so um, we probably have still hundreds of objects to discover, uh, which is a very good news for me as an orbit fitter. That is a job security. So um, I am not complaining for more moons. Well, those, those big old gas giants, obviously they've got diverse ecosystems, they've got moons, they've got rings. But if you go a little further out, we've got our ice giants out there. Now, you brought up the poetic name. I am partial to Uranus's moons with their named after the works of William Shakespeare and William Pope. Um, I'm sorry, Alexander Pope, not William Pope, William Shakespeare, Alexander Pope. Uh, the inner moons that are close to this planet, do they have the similar outline? Are there outer satellites in some, in some strange orbits? Well, yes and no. Um, so you have the same kind of general outline. You have the inner moons, the, the regular moons, and you have the outer moons, but both Uranus and Neptune are weird, you know, they're peculiar little systems um, or big systems. Um, so let's start, let's start with Uranus on the next slide, slide please. And we'll be moving from outside inwards. So you're seeing the realm of the outer satellites. We know only uh, nine of them at the moment. Margaret is the only prograde one. These are orbiting at huge distances from the planet. We're coming in. These are five regular satellites of Uranus. But then the story really gets interesting as when we start talking about these inner moons. Uh, there are 13 of them. They're small, but extremely densely packed orbits. So um, imagine having 13 moons that would fit within one quarter of the Earth moon distance. And these moons are kind of, you know, they're small, but they still have mass and they kind of keep bumping at each other. And to make things worse, they are in a, um, you know, some of them have integer relationship between their orbital periods. And these states are called resonances. And uh, so what that, for example, uh, there are two moons, um, there is um, uh, Caresida and Bianca. They're in a 16 to 15 orbit orbit resonance. What this means is that the inner moon, Caresida, goes around 16 times. The outer one, Bianca, goes around 15 times and they catch up. And because, you know, this happens periodically and regularly. So sooner or later, their orbits start changing enough that um, they start colliding. These moons start colliding. And, and when dynamicists run studies, and I told you they, they, they like to run these long studies for millions of years, they see that this system is kind of recyclable. Uh, it goes through periods of, um, you know, the moon's colliding, you have a temporary system of rings, and then they all coalesce again into moons. So, so we don't know how many times, you know, Uranus went to this uh, having system of rings, having system of moons, and back and forth. And even today, you have a very faint ring between the moons called Portia and Rosalind. So interesting kind of Phoenix-like system that keeps you know, going through these cycles. Well, let's keep working our way out there. Let's get to Neptune. Um, Voyager 2 flew past in 1989. I gotta love this image of Neptune's giant moon, Triton. So if we bring up number 10, mm -hmm. yeah, there it is. You can see evidence of nitrogen ice volcanoes on its surface. So how unique is Triton and are there other notable moons in the Neptune system? Well, you know, uh, Triton, as I said, it's, it's really neat. I mean, it's huge. 
it's this is 27 2700 kilometers in diameter so um and given how massive it is and everything you know this looks like a regular moon of neptune um kind of that formed with the planet itself but then you look at its orbit you know i always go back to the orbit and it tells us a very different story so let's take a look at the orbit of triton on the next slide and so, yeah, this is what you see. So you see the, these little moons in yellow. Those are your well-behaved inner moons. Everybody's in circles and, you know, <laughs> lined up with the planet equator. And then you have Triton. And Triton is obviously aligned. And not only aligned, it's going the other way. So um, the leading theory is that Triton is actually a captured object. It's a captured Kuiper Belt object, something similar to Pluto. And this capture happened early in the solar system history, and as a result, it completely destroyed the original population of the moons of Neptune. And let's take a look at the close-up on the next slide of the inner moons of Neptune. So next slide, please. Yes, so these are not original moons of, of Neptune. This is, these are again, uh, Neptune probably ended up, uh, uh, they, the original population probably collided between themselves. Uh, Neptune had a system of rings, and then this is what happened afterwards. They coalesced from these rings into, again, clumps that we call moons. Um, there are seven of them. Again, very tightly packed system. Um, the entire system would fit within one third of the distance from Earth to our moon. The, um, they orbit really fast, like Proteus, um, um, the, the outermost moon. It takes it a little bit less, a little bit more than one Earth day. Uh, to orbit orbit the planet, but but you know weird weird little system. But even this bigger puzzle, I am going to show you on the next slide. And let's see, next slide. Yes, this is moon called Nereid. And um, if you remember in the beginning of your talk, I, I was showing you my fit to orbit of Nereid. Uh, there are these those residuals. And Nereid, there is theory. You know, it has this very distant, elongated orbit. It's a prograde moon, and uh, the theory is that it could be the last original moon of Neptune that Neptune had before capture of Triton, and that it got scattered into this distant orbit after kind of Triton barged into the system. Um, Nereid is fairly large, it's about 360 kilometers, and it's orbiting around the planet just under one Earth year, about 360 Earth days. Um, I don't want to forget about my outer satellites, so let's go to the next slide because that kind of, um, this is probably my, you know, the favorite system of the outers. Um, I already mentioned, you know, so Neptune has this, the largest hill sphere where it can capture its satellites. And this is what I mean large. You see the scale here? This is one astronomical unit, so this would be between distance from the uh, sun to the Earth. Uh, there are only five of them that we know of. There are definitely more out there, but they're very hard to find because they're very faint. They're not that large and, and surveys, you know, really have to dig deep to find them. Um, the This one that you particularly see, one, this one called Nesso. Nesso takes 27 years to orbit around uh, Neptune. And we actually have only data for like 10 years. So a lot more data to be collected here, a lot more to learn. Um, and, and I'm saying this is, um, you know, the, it's, it's really a great story with these outer moons of, of Neptune. A lot of great information tonight and a lot more information to come down the road as you, as you keep studying and exploring these. As we're getting closer to our audience questions, um, is there anything else you'd like to say about the work that you do? Well, you know, so far I was telling you why orbits are important in order to learn about, um, you know, the science system, science of the system, about the origin of the moons and their dynamical evolution. But, um, you know, orbits are very practical things as well. They're important for the missions uh, because in order to fly a mission, you need to know where your targets, your destinations are. Um, so uh, let's take a look at the next slide. Um, because I want to tell you about one of my favorite missions, and that is New Horizons. That the spacecraft ended up flying through the system of Pluto, exactly through the bullseye of the system, in uh, 2015. Um, and spacecraft at that time was nine and a half years 
on the road so a long time and it was moving incredibly fast this was like you know bad from hell it was like 13.8 kilometers a second um and so you rush 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 to get to pluto and then all the data are collected within like several hours so those are your best data the highest resolution ones and you need to know where everybody is in order to correctly point your camera and you also you know you want to know that you're not going to collide with something as you're going through so every mission has a similar story like that. It's, it's you know, in incredible feat of engineering. It takes hundreds of people and, and many years and many years to complete. But um, ultimately, they all start, you know, with the same thing. They, they, they need to know where their destinations are. And uh, in a solar system dynamics group, um, you know, this is we are we are the map makers. Um, so we like to think that we are very important for the missions. Um, and, um, you know, I, I always like kind of to say that the starting story of every mission becomes, you know, begins with the same sentence. So kind of something like, in the beginning, there was a map. So. In the beginning, there was a map. I love that. Lindsay, the chats have been busy. What questions do they have about map making in these orbits out there? What's our, what's going on with our audience? Absolutely, Marina, I have to say, I am not the only one who's been over the moon about your talk. So Shavash on LinkedIn asks, is there a probability of Earth catching a natural satellite and perhaps would it orbit in an irregular manner? Oh, yes, uh, we have mini moons. So Earth has mini moons. And just recently, one such object was captured. So Earth knows to capture these uh, tiny little asteroids. Um, and uh, the last one, and I don't remember exactly, it was like, it was very recent. It was it was 2020 something. Uh, but you know, these moons spend about several months to a, a year uh, orbiting in a very, very regular orbits. And then they take off and um, they start orbiting the sun again. Uh, those could be great targets for uh, space missions uh, because it's, um, you know, it's, it's easy to get to them. Um, and, you know, perhaps you could, you know, perhaps something like that we are going to see, um, you know, sometimes in the future. Awesome. Marina, Paul on Facebook is asking, would it be reasonable to assume that some of the moons of Jupiter are a part of what used to be a ring. Yeah, so the um, so Jupiter has a ring. Um, it has, um, um, you know, there is a Io is spewing a whole bunch of particles, uh, and also the inner moons um, that I that I mentioned that are orbiting closer to the planets than Io. They're also sources of a material. They they're thought to be sources of material that are creating this this very faint rings of of Jupiter. Great, uh, Fidelo on YouTube ask if you, Marina, could pick any target for a probe mission, what would it be? Oh, so many targets, so many targets. Well, um, Triton would be a natural choice. Um, that is a weird moon. As I said, you kind of have uh, a Kuiper Belt object um, caught around Neptune. Um, and I would also, you know, narrate always kind of piques my interest because um, it could be an original satellite of Neptune. So, so, so I, it's, it's, it's perhaps a very, you know, different object. Um, so it would be interesting to, to, to Triton. I think, I think Triton would be, would be something that I would like, but there are many other moons. Thank you. Uh, Dean on Facebook would like to know how large are the objects that you found? So I'm not sure objects. Um, so I don't know. So I can tell you if he's asking about current surveys uh, around Jupiter, I mentioned that the outer moons of Jupiter that are currently being found, they're about 500 meters in size, so quite small. And Saturn, um, outer moons of Saturn, they are um, slightly larger because as I said you can't go as deep. Saturn is further away. So surveys have been finding um, objects that are about um, you know a few kilometers in size. And, and we are estimating there should be you know probably hundreds of such objects. 
Thank you. Uh, Zapfan on YouTube asks, are any captured interstellar objects among these retrograde moons? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a good one. So, um, I am not, I think there could be some studies, um, out there that are wondering about that question. I think that I even, I think there was this, a moon of Jupiter that they were maybe speculating, but, but I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to guess because as I said it's, 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 it's in the literature. People are very interested, you know, so far we've had two interstellar objects visiting our solar system. Um, they come in, they came, you know, they move at such incredible speed and they come in and out so fast. It would be really not easy to capture such thing, even in heliocentric orbit, let alone, um, it would have to be perfect storm that a, a, a you know, a planet. Did you know that if you were born after 2000, during your entire life, there has been someone living in space? That's thanks to the International Space Station, which celebrated its 20th anniversary of continuous human habitation in 2020. You've probably heard a lot about the incredible science that happens on board the station, but the outside is actually prime real estate for all kinds of experiments and technology development too. The International Space Station is a great platform to demonstrate service and technology because it provides power, data, there's robotics in space. With Tech on Deck, we'll be talking about some key experiments that have taken place outside in the harsh environment of space, which will help us advance human exploration. Nexus is NASA's Exploration and In-Space Services Project Division at the Goddard Space Flight Center. The goal of the division is to usher in a new era of more sustainable, affordable, and resilient space flight, both near the Earth, around the Moon, and deep into the solar system. Many members of the Nexus team started off with the Hubble telescope servicing missions. We've taken that technology, applied that to robotic servicing. From robotic refueling missions that will help spacecraft live longer and journey farther to autonomous navigation systems, NASA's Exploration and In-Space Services Division has taken advantage of the wonderful opportunity Station offers to test new technologies. As we look to exploring our solar system and beyond, and establishing a sustained human presence in space beyond low Earth orbit, Many of these technologies will play a key role. We use the robots and space station to demonstrate the technologies needed to enable satellite servicing in the future. We've also used the robots and space station to do some of the more repetitive tasks or the dangerous tasks that astronauts um, shouldn't be doing, like going outside the space station to try to look for ammonia leaks. Uh, robots are very good at moving fine, delicate positions, moving back and forth, uh, doing those sorts of tasks that would be challenging for humans to do. In order to live in space, astronauts will first need to reach their far out destinations like Mars. This will require refueling and replenishment of oxygen supplies, things the robotic refueling missions worked to demonstrate on station. They will also need to be able to construct, maintain, and repair their habitats, as well as adapt to unforeseen circumstances. Because we're in space and low-Earth orbit, we have lighting conditions that are representative of um, objects in space, and so allows us to launch tools and modules into orbit, uh, put them on the space station, and then use those robotic technologies and all the infrastructure that comes with the space station to mature those technologies in a way that's much, much less expensive than if we try to launch our own satellite and demonstrate those uh, for the first time uh, not using the space station. For these endeavors, Nexus's work with astronaut tools 
satellite servicing, and on-orbit assembly and manufacturing will do the trick. We develop the technologies that are needed to advance exploration in ways you can service satellites in the future, uh, build satellites and build structures on orbit, uh, refuel satellites on the way to other planets, uh, repair those satellites much like we do on that side of space station. Uh, both humans and robots are used to maintain uh, habitats in space. We're developing technologies that can be used by NASA and others uh, to make those a reality. The International Space Station is the perfect testing ground for technologies that will be used to propel humans farther than we've ever gone before. The station is helping us build the necessary foundation to make it possible. Outside of the International Space Station, space can be a lonely place. Most satellites are designed to live their lives alone, and we have yet to find life outside of Earth. This means that when we launch a spacecraft or satellite, for the most part, it's on its own and has a limited lifespan based on when critical items like fuel run out or something breaks. You wouldn't throw away your car if it ran out of gas, and thanks to the advent of modern-day robotics, software, and computing power, we will soon be able to apply that logic to satellites. We are on the cusp of breaking the one-and-done paradigm that exists for most satellites. An important step in that direction is NASA's Robotic Refueling Mission, or RRM, demonstration on the International Space Station. Because refueling a satellite that was not designed to be refueled has never been done before, practice is key. With that in mind, the first two phases of RRM took place on station from 2011 to 2017 and tested the tools, technologies, and techniques to refuel and repair satellites in orbit. RM and RM Phase 2 were designed to demonstrate end-to-end -end refueling of the spacecraft, as well as the first steps of cryogenic refueling or replenishment. We wanted to use the robot on the International Space Station to be able to demonstrate the technologies and techniques to do this refueling, so we built innovative tools to bridge the gap between the robot and the payload interfaces. Consisting of a module or box affixed to the outside of station and robotic tools, the demonstrations use station's Dexter robot to operate tools and test servicing tasks such as cutting and peeling back protective thermal blankets, unscrewing caps, turning valves, transferring fluid, inspection, and intermediary steps leading up to refueling. Once we were all done, we were able to transfer fuel end-to-end -end through a spacecraft fill and drain valve that wasn't designed to be robotically refueled. The RRM demonstration helped test and prove technologies that will make refueling satellites not designed to be refueled possible, something that will be further demonstrated by NASA's on-orbit servicing, assembly, and manufacturing one mission. But it also helped to lay the groundwork for designing future satellites in a way to make them more easily serviceable. These missions were important because we needed to demonstrate in orbit that this technology was ready. There were a lot of people that felt that at the time of RM, that the technology was so far in the future that they didn't feel what we were talking about was possible. So we needed to demonstrate in orbit this technology so that we could start changing the paradigm and incorporate these technologies into the future spacecraft designs and missions. RRM Phase 1 and 2 were all about preparing an interface for refueling, which in many ways is half the battle. To robotically refuel a satellite, you need to perform a series of highly dexterous tasks to even access the valve. The next step is to actually perform refueling tasks, which is what the next phase, RRM3, has been demonstrating on station over a series of operations since 2018. RRM is a critical piece of the sustainable spaceflight puzzle that helps us with the ability to robotically refuel, repair, and maintain satellites in both near and distant orbits well beyond the reach of where humans can go today. For generations, Mars has beckoned. Now, the red planet is within our reach. But how do we get there? The key is in the details and in the technology. First and foremost, you need fuel. This is not only true for getting to Mars, but for any form of deep space exploration. Being able to replenish fuel on a long-duration journey means massive amounts aren't needed up front, 
freeing up space for other important things. Enter Robotic Refueling Mission 3, or RRM-3 for short. This demonstration launched to the International Space Station in December of 2018 and has helped us develop tools and techniques needed to replenish cryogenic fluid in space. Transferring cryogenic fluids has never been done before in space. These super cold fluids can be used as propellants, coolants, or for life support systems. Being able to replenish these fluids that run out, otherwise known as consumables, is an important part of the Sustainable Exploration Roadmap. Not just for Mars, but for NASA's Artemis program, which will land the first woman and the next man on the moon. Since refueling cryogenic fluids in space has never been done before, RM3 tested the technologies and techniques needed to make that possible. First, we sent the RM3 payload and its three main tools to Space Station, where astronauts assembled the parts. When I was uh, living aboard the International Space Station in the spring of 2019, I was fortunate enough to take part in the uh, small, very small part in the robotic refueling mission three. Uh, and my job was to unload the components of the actual RRM-3 from one of our visiting vehicles. And we take it into our Japanese experimental module, the GEM, where we have an airlock. And right inside of the airlock, we unpacked all of the uh, boxes, much like you would a piece of uh, furniture that you had to assemble yourself at home. So unpacked all of the pieces, we did a checkout, uh, we worked with the ground, we got everything assembled, and then we placed it into the Japanese airlock. And from there, we were able to put it outside of the International Space Station. So um, my involvement in RRM3 was the physical final assembly of the actual components. RM3 was delivered to the space station by a SpaceX Dragon on the company's 16th commercial resupply services mission and installed on the outside of station by the Canadian robot Dexter. Dexter then picked up the tools from the JEM airlock and installed them onto the RRM3 payload. The ground operations team was now ready to begin operating the three tools to test how they would work in space. For the first set of operations, conducted in August 2019, Dexter used one of the RRM3 tools to prepare the RRM3 module's interface for transferring cryogenic fuel. The second set of operations was then conducted in October 2020. For these, Dexter used one of the remaining two tools to insert an 11-foot-long hose in an open port and the other snake-like camera inspection tool simultaneously to verify the hose's position in the inside of RM3's tubing. This marked the first time that Dexter had tools in both arms working the same tasks simultaneously. The RRM3 demonstration added experience and information to NASA's knowledge base on the storage and transferring cryogenic fluids in space. It is currently still on station where it will conduct one final set of operations in mid-2022. For getting to the moon, Mars, and beyond, cryogenic fluids will be used as propellants and to maintain life support systems for astronauts. The Mars atmosphere is made up of carbon dioxide, which could be converted to liquid oxygen, a type of cryogenic fluid that could be used both as propellant and for breathing. Astronauts may be able to fuel rockets or replenish their oxygen supplies using compounds found in the Martian atmosphere. A tool on the Mars Perseverance rover called Mars Oxygen In-Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, or MOXIE, is set to demonstrate the first ever conversion of Martian carbon dioxide to oxygen which is another important piece of the puzzle. In order to make a sustained human presence in space a reality, humans and robots will have to work together using technologies like those developed by RM3 and MOXIE. A lot of people ask about, uh, you know, whose job is exploring outer space? Is it robots or is it humans? And I believe that uh, it requires teamwork between robots and humans and that our exploration is not complete or even possible possible without both. So robots can go farther, uh, they're less expensive, and um, they can go for longer periods of time. They don't require as much maintenance. You don't have to feed and care for a robot, much like you do if you send me back to space. So like the Mars rovers, the Galileo that uh, explored Jupiter and its moons, the Hubble and the soon-to-be James Webb Space Telescope, 
they're doing mission they're doing missions in locations that humans to this point don't have the capability to go there's also something very important about humans wanting to know what it's like to be there you know it, it's not enough for humans to take a picture of mount everest or antarctica and say oh okay that's what it looks like the human condition is we are we are born to explore we're born to say what if what's just beyond what we know uh, and what is it like to be there and so the human side of space exploration first of all it's orders of magnitude closer to earth uh, we cannot have not been able to send humans nearly as far as we've been able to send uh, robotic probes um, but they're two very different missions and they serve a different type of curiosity mars and deep space are calling human explorers and rm3 is a step toward helping nasa answer that call Though it sounds complex, the idea is simple. Having the ability to refuel will allow NASA to embark on longer journeys to explore the depths of our solar system. Did you know there's a three-eyed raven currently perched on the International Space Station? Not an actual bird, but rather a technology payload that is helping NASA develop a relative navigation system, or autopilot, for spacecraft. Launched to station in 2017 aboard a SpaceX Dragon on the company's 10th commercial resupply services mission for NASA and installed on the outside of ISS by station's Dexter robot, Raven is equipped with three distinct camera vision systems, visible, infrared, and LiDAR. Combined with NASA-developed software algorithms, this rotating module of technology keeps a weather eye on arriving spacecraft. Raven's head, containing its three eyes, or cameras, is always on the swivel, which is made possible by its integral gimbal. Raven is an on-orbit test bed that was built to mature technologies related to uh, relative navigation sensors and algorithms. Uh, Raven was launched to the International Space Station aboard a SpaceX Dragon capsule in February 2017. Uh, and it's been operational on the space station since that time. So using three different sensors on Raven uh, that are on a movable gimbal platform, Raven can track the incoming visiting vehicle to station uh, all the way from very, very far, the far away, all the way up to where they dock with the space station. So basically at any given time, Raven can tell you where the incoming visit visiting vehicle is in space relative to the space station and what attitude or pointing direction it is. Raven sends the data it collects from tracking and observing incoming spacecraft to its processor or brain called SpaceCube. This information then tells Raven how it needs to move to continue to track the spacecraft and gauge relative distance and position. NASA engineers have taken what they've learned from multiple Raven observations over the years to adjust and fine tune the relative navigation system as needed so it's ready for the upcoming on-orbit servicing, assembly, and manufacturing one mission, which will robotically refuel a satellite, among other things. Raven is a sensor system that can image an object, process those, process those images on board in real time with advanced algorithms, and calculate the pose of the object relative to itself. These factors come together to create something like spacecraft autopilot. Much like a self-driving car can maintain cruise control based on the speed of the vehicle it follows, two free-flying spacecraft will be able to dock with one another using this technology. Though this operation is similar to the autonomous docking of visiting spacecraft to station, Raven's unique application is necessary for docking two satellites with the challenges of each moving and rotating in every direction during the rendezvous and docking phase. Using that information to then guide the first spacecraft to autonomously rendezvous with and dock with the second spacecraft. So that means finding it in space, aligning with it appropriately, and then bringing the two vehicles together without smashing them into and destroying each of them, all without human intervention. This capability is the kind of thing you need for docking with spacecraft that were not originally designed to be docked with and serviced, which happens to be a vast majority of them. That's why Raven's time on station is critical for the future of on-orbit servicing, assembly, and manufacturing, or OSAM. The OSAM-1 mission will use Raven's relative navigation capability to autonomously, meaning no humans involved, 
rendezvous and dock with the satellite, and then telerobotically refuel it. This will be the first time in history a spacecraft not originally designed to be serviced will be refueled as a means to extend its operational life. RAVEN is also important for future exploration missions. RAVEN's technologies can be applied to future NASA missions because if humans want to make a footprint in the solar system beyond low Earth orbit, uh, which is where the International Space Station is located, we're going to have to rely on some form of autonomous docking technologies in the future. Uh, whether it be an unmanned cargo vehicle meeting up in orbit around the moon, uh, refueling tankers located in geosynchronous Earth orbit, or a return vehicle arriving on Mars in advance of a crewed landing, all of these feats will require the technology we're developing with RAVEN. Using its three eyes, RAVEN is looking to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Relying on highly robust autonomous systems becomes more crucial the further you move away from Earth as the communications time increase drastically. Once you move past low Earth orbit, it becomes very impossible for humans on Earth to do these highly complex maneuvers in real time. It's more efficient to allow computers to perform these sequences autonomously without human intervention. Although RAVEN has successfully concluded its main mission objectives, it remains on station. Meanwhile, its team on the ground is using what they've learned to develop more never-before-seen technologies that will enable future space exploration. Before I started uh, digging in that, one, that other bag, here you go. Yeah, no problem. Uh, if you need to fix something in space that wasn't designed to be fixed, it's going to take all the experience you can get. With that in mind, when the International Space Station's Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, or AMS, needed repairs, NASA's Johnson Space Center and Goddard Space Flight Center used their joint expertise to make it happen. At Goddard, that expertise resides in NASA's Exploration and In-Space Services Division, or NEXUS, which evolved from the office that was responsible for the Hubble Space Telescope servicing missions. Key to these missions was the development of specialized tools. While you've probably heard of Hubble, you may not be as familiar with AMS, so let's start there. Designed for a three-year mission of sifting through cosmic ray particles, AMS has been looking for signs of dark matter from its position on station since 2011. Hundreds of researchers have used the data collected to investigate the source of the mysterious substance to help us better understand the origins of the universe. To continue this important data collection, AMS needed an upgrade due to general wear and tear from the harsh environment of space, specifically a new cooling system. A repair could extend its life beyond what was originally planned. Sounds easy enough, right? In fact, due to the instrument's complexity and the fact that it was not designed to be repaired, even gaining access to the system to replace it was difficult. AMS's design did not incorporate the kinds of interfaces that make spacewalks easier, or have the ability to be serviced with traditional multi-purpose tools. And so, over the course of four years, NASA got to work designing and developing some of the most complex spacewalks since the Hubble servicing missions of the 90s and early 2000s to fix AMS. The AMS tools themselves were unique. They were built specifically for this task, a task that was never intended to be performed on a spacewalk. And so that required a lot of thinking about how we were going to get inside so that we could access the tubes that we needed to cut into and then install the new thermal control system, um, but also how to put handling aids on it so that we had a place to um, attach our, our tethers, to attach our foot restraints, to have handholds, have a place to attach equipment that we needed out there. NASA developed 20 specialized tools to make the job possible, and on November 15, 2019, astronauts Andrew Morgan and Luca Parmitano got to work. On this first spacewalk, astronauts needed to get access. By design, five of the tools could be seen floating off into space, attached to the debris shield that was removed to give the astronauts access to the heart of AMS. The debris shield handling aid was one of the first tools that Luca installed on the EVA and this gave us a handhold um, to install on the debris shield to work from uh, but also a handle for me to hold on to ultimately when we jettisoned it overboard uh, to the aft side of the ISS which was a lot of fun to do. The astronauts continued with three more spacewalks over the next two months using all of the specially designed tools. 
One such tool was the Tube Cutting Guide, which was a direct result of multiple practice sessions at Johnson Space Center facilities like the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. While practicing, astronauts communicated the need for a way to identify and verify the correct tubes to cut, since they all look the same to the astronauts' eyes within the spacesuit. After we had removed the debris shield and the VSB cover, now we have the tubes exposed and we actually had to cut into those tubes in order to pull out the correct ones to connect with the new thermal control system, the new pump. In order to do that, we had to be very sure of the tubes that we were cutting. These ingenious tube cutting guides installed over the top of the tubes and made sure that we knew and we were communicating correctly with the ground team to make sure that we were cutting the correct tube at the right time. In January 2020, Luca Parmitano and Drew Morgan completed the fourth and final spacewalk to repair AMS. Because of their work and the ingenuity of tool designers and engineers, the instrument is now back in commission and able to continue to collect data about the origins of our universe for years to come. People from Goddard and JSC spent a lot of time developing these tools with their knowledge and the support of astronauts like Chris Cassidy. And we are very thankful that we were privileged to use those tools and to put them to a successful use. Thank you very much. Testing our mega moon rocket and ground systems, preparing the James Webb Space Telescope for science, and testing an instrument for future X-59 research. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. From April 12th to 14th, NASA conducted a modified wet dress rehearsal for the agency's Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft on Launch Pad 39B at our Kennedy Space Center in Florida, ahead of the uncrewed Artemis I moon mission. The multi-day wet dress rehearsal focused on loading fuel into the rocket's core stage tanks, refining countdown procedures, and validating critical models and software interfaces. In addition to the two recent test runs for wet dress rehearsal, this modified test allowed teams to practice operations critical to launch success ahead of the Artemis I mission. On April 7th, the mid-infrared instrument, MIRI, aboard the James Webb Space Telescope, reached a cooling milestone as it prepares for science this summer. With the assistance of a cryo-cooler, the instrument reached its final operating temperature of less than 7 kelvins, minus 447 degrees Fahrenheit. That's just a few degrees above the lowest temperature matter can reach. Webb's four science instruments, including MIRI, initially cooled off in the shade of the tennis court-sized sun shield, but making the final temperature drop is essential for the observatory's only mid-infrared instrument that will play a key role in understanding the origins of stars and planets. NASA conducted a series of flight tests at our Armstrong Flight Research Center in California to evaluate improvements made to a shock sensing probe designed to measure the unique shock waves that our quiet supersonic X-59 aircraft will generate during flight. The probe was mounted on the nose of a NASA F-15 research aircraft to measure shock waves from a NASA F-18 using flight techniques that will test the X-59's shock waves during the future acoustic validation phase of quiet supersonic flight. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope has determined the size of the largest icy comet nucleus ever seen by astronomers. The estimated diameter of behemoth comet C-2014 UN271 is approximately 80 miles across, making it larger than the state of Rhode Island. Using a series of five Hubble images taken of the comet in January 2022, combined with a computer model of the surrounding dusty coma, scientists revealed a massive but measurable star-like nucleus that is about 50 times larger than what's found at the heart of most known comets. On February 14th, 
NASA's Lucy spacecraft obtained a series of calibration images with its four visible light cameras. While the first test images were taken shortly after launch, the February tests were much more extensive. Using its instrument pointing platform, Lucy pointed at 11 different star fields to test camera performance and sensitivity, as well as the spacecraft's ability to point accurately in different directions. Lucy, which launched in October 2021, is the first space mission set to explore a diverse population of small bodies known as the Trojan asteroids. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, follow us on the web at nasa.gov slash twan. The long-range purpose of unmanned exploration of the planet is the development of technology which will lead to eventual manned exploration. Power, go. System, go. Propulsion, go. Avionics, go. Flight software, go. Scientifically, our objective is to assist in answering two basic questions. What, if any, life forms exist on the planet and how has the solar system been formed? Telecom. Go. Fault protection. Go. Uplink. Go. Phase lead. Go. 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 We are ready for the event. How do you hear me? Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? I've got you loud and clear. How me? Got you loud and clear as well. Please stand by for opening remarks. Hi, my name is Kalise Roberts. My question is, do you hear sounds in space? Hello, Clarice, how are you doing? We do hear sounds in space. We are inside of a spaceship that has air in it, and therefore we can hear, we need air to be able to hear it. So uh, when we're in a space suit, we are out in space, but still we have a little bubble of air in our, our, in our helmets. And so, yes, I can hear my fan going inside my spacesuit. Any sound my spacesuit generates, I can hear. But in the vacuum of space, outside our spaceship, outside of my spacesuit, can't hear a thing. There's no air, and therefore it's completely silent. Hi, my name is Whitney. My question for you is, what is the most unusual thing you've seen in space?
That is hard to answer. The most unusual thing I've seen in space, because we see amazing and delightful things every day, even inside of our space station. But the thing that surprised me the most, I think, was I was looking out the window, and something went flashing right by the space station, it looked like. Turned out it was a shooting star, but it was towards the Earth. It was between the space station and the Earth. I was very surprised to see a shooting star below me instead of looking up in the sky at night. Hi. My name is Grace, and my question is, do you feel any pressure, like from your clothes, while in zero gravity? Very interesting question. Yes, you can feel your clothes, but you feel it in different places. My shirt right now is kind of uh, rising up and touching my, the bottoms of my arms. And so I can feel clothes on me, but it just feels, feels like it's touching me in different places than it would if I were standing on the ground or sitting on the ground. Hi, my name is Keon Weir. My question is, have you found any evidence of plant life in space? Well, you may know that we grow plants here on the space station. We've done that many times before. Um, so outside of the space station on other planets, on other planetary bodies or asteroids, there's been no evidence that NASA or others have found of plant life. Uh, no evidence of life, as least as we know it, there yet. However, the building blocks for life, such as carbon molecules and slightly complex carbon um, uh, atoms and molecules we have found. We found methane on Mars, for instance. We found evidence, potential evidence of having water on another planet before, on Mars, for instance. So that means that the building blocks of life do exist on other planets and other places, and it just remains to be seen if we're going to find life, such as plants or anything more complex than that, elsewhere in our solar system or in the universe. And my question is, how would you describe the sunset and sunrise in space? Well, it's very fast. The sunset and the sunrise is up here. It only takes a few seconds to go by. As you uh, probably know, we experience about 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every 24-hour period, every day. And it just takes a few seconds to go by. But it's very beautiful because it's a very bright light. The sun uh, just comes straight into our windows and into our eyes. You don't even want to look at it. But then you see a beautiful blue ribbon of the atmosphere as the sun starts to rise. And then you can see the Earth start to glow below us with colors and clouds that you've seen from Earth. Pink in the clouds and deep blues. And then it looks like morning. And then you have a bright daylight and then the sunset looks a little bit like it does on Earth, except it's happening below us out the window with uh, beautiful golds and reds. And then suddenly the sun is gone and we're in darkness. Hi, my name is Anthony. My question is, can you bring animals into space? Yes, we can bring animals in space. We've done that before. We've brought uh, mice up here before. We've brought uh, insects. A uh, in number of animals that we've actually studied since we've been here uh, on previous missions as well. And it's uh, very important to understand how all animals live up here, including humans. And so the space station can support that life. And uh, we have everything we need to be able to have uh, animals live up here with us and to be able to study them. And it's kind of nice uh, sometimes when we have those extra crewmates aboard. Hi, my name is Makai Ware. And my question is, are there any other plants that can support life? We don't know if there are other planets that can support life, but we want to find out. And the James Webb Telescope is up there to look for one thing, to look for that, look for signatures in uh, planets that are orbiting other stars. It seems that there is evidence that Mars could have in the past supported life because there is evidence that water used to be on Mars. Given the chance with so many stars and so many planets, I think one of the, these days we're going to find out that, yes, there is evidence for life on another planet. But we'll wait and see. It'll be a very exciting discovery. 
Hi, my name is Diane, and my question is, do you stargaze in space? We try to stargaze in space. We're very busy. And to look at the stars on the space station, because it's bright inside with the lights on, we have to go to a window and wait for a while for our eyes to adjust to the darkness. If we have enough time to do that, which might take about five minutes, then we can see some beautiful stars. It's uh, probably see more stars than if you were to go outside of a city into a field somewhere on a cold winter night and look up on the cloudless sky and see uh, millions and millions of stars. It looks a bit like that. The difference is that the stars don't twinkle. So it's a very surprising when you look at them. There's no atmosphere for the starlight to come through. And the planets look like steady red colored dots, which is quite surprising as well. So when we get a chance, we try to stargaze in space. Hi, my name is Kaylin Njoku and my question is, when did you learn how to play the guitar and can you play in space? I started playing the guitar when I was 17 years old, once I had gotten to college. Um, and I do have a guitar here with me. I didn't bring it up. There's just one already up here. So I have had a chance to play just a little bit. There's not a lot of time to play guitar, but it's fun when I get a chance to play. Hi, my name is Angela. My question is, what would you consider to be the most challenging adjustment you have to make to travel to space and to stay at the International Space Station? So there are a lot of adjustments to make, not only leaving Earth, but then living in zero G. The hardest part about leaving Earth, probably an adjustment you have to make is saying goodbye to all your friends and family. The hardest part about coming to the space station is you arrive and it's almost like you're starting life all over again. You have to learn how to dress. You have to learn how to eat without getting food all over yourself. You have to learn how to go to the bathroom. You have to learn how to move around. I'm holding myself down with my toes right now and I had to learn how to do that and get adjusted to it. So just doing the day-to-day -day things and on top of that getting a lot of work done as we do in the laboratory up here on the space station. Putting that all together is, is quite challenging and quite an adjustment when we get to the space station. Hi, my name is Cortez. My question is, since you orbit the Earth 16 times per day, how do you know what time to go to sleep and wake up? Well, you might not be surprised to find out we go to sleep and wake up when the ground and mission controls around the Earth when they tell us to. So uh, we've all decided to set our time at, at Greenwich Mean Time, which is about the time that London is in. And so we just set our clocks to that. And humans are, are pretty adaptable, so we're able to change our, our clock for wake up or going to sleep uh, whenever we need to. So uh, that's what we do. We wake up at... Uh, Greenwich Mean Time at about 6 a.m. The ground tells us to, so our alarms go off then and we get to work. Hi, my name is Tyler, but you can call me Ty. My question is, how do you avoid collisions with moving objects in space? Hi, Ty. There are a lot of really smart people with very powerful radars that are watching almost everything that's orbiting the Earth and tracking them for us. It's called the uh, Space Surveillance Network. So what they're doing is tracking objects, and if they think an object is getting close to the space station, they have a lot of complex mathematical algorithms that say, hey, there's this chance, they put a number to it, there's this amount of chance this object is going to hit the space station. And so we've decided, and, and NASA management and others have decided that if, it, if the risk is getting them to be a little bit too high, we might have to move the space station out of the way. Fortunately, as the object gets closer, we get a better idea uh, if it really is going to hit the space station. And usually we don't have to move to get out of the way, but sometimes we do. But those powerful radars are very essential now in the modern uh, space age for us to be able to stay up here safely in space. Hello. My name is Roy Swordman, and my question is, what is your daily schedule on the space station? 
Hi, Royce. Uh, every day is busy and every day is different. And every five minutes sometimes is different. I've done about 15 totally different things today already. Usually we do what you would do on a day, wake up, brush our teeth, eat breakfast. Uh, we kind of do a little bit of homework, maybe read the news, but then we go to work and we'll be working, I think, uh, uh, a total of about 14 hours a day. Work includes exercising. We have to spend about two and a half hours a day exercising. Uh, but we have our meals like you do on the ground, and at the end of the day, we have a little bit of time to talk and enjoy each other's company, but we're pretty tired, and so we go to bed at that point. Hi. My name is Sayla, and my question is, are you doing any research on how microbial life develops in space? Hi, Sayla. Yes, as a matter of fact, we do, and we're doing it uh, right now. There's an experiment called Biofilms, which we're trying to understand how these uh, bacterial mats or bacteria that all fit together in a flat plane uh, that can grow on things, uh, especially with water in them on the ground, can happen in space as well. We want to understand how that works because we'd like to protect the hardware and ourselves from this bacteria that grows. So. Uh, it turns out, though, that cells grow differently in space because there's no gravity and there's also radiation hitting them. And that's actually important for understanding how bacteria grow on the ground as well. So we've been discovering a lot of things because of this unique environment, high radiation and uh, n unable to feel the effects of gravity. We've been able to learn quite a bit about how bacteria live and grow. My name is Nadir Williams, and my question is, what projects are you currently working on while aboard the International Space Station? Hi, Nadir. It's kind of hard to choose. Um, what to tell you about. I just last week was working on this combustion chamber. It's actually a, a big chamber that's protected from us, but and we're protected from it, but that's where we can start fires, small fires to, with a lot of cameras and sensors to totally understand how a fire forms in zero G. And that's pretty important for understanding how fires propagate on the ground as well. And this is the only place we can remove the effects of gravity. I was involved in a skin study trying to figure out how skin ages. It seems like with all the radiation up here that uh, we age maybe and our skin ages probably faster than it does on the ground. So I had skin cells that I was working with and, and giving them food and letting them grow and, and scientists on the ground are going to study those as well. I've done a lot of uh, ultrasound experiments up here and some of my favorite are the capillary flow experiments that we've done in the past to understand how fluid moves with uh, under capillary uh, force control and that has a wide implications on uh, space engines and even medical devices on earth but there's experiments going on all the time hi my name is king demetrius and my question for you today is how do you work out in space with zero gravity Well, it's really important for us to stay um, in shape, keep our bones and muscles strong, because they would waste away since we don't feel the pressure of gravity. We have three main devices, a stationary bike. It looks like a stationary bike, except it doesn't have a seat because there's nothing to sit on. We have a treadmill. It's on the wall, actually, and that treadmill uh, allows us to practice walking and continue to run and stay in shape that way. We have uh, bungees that hold us down tight. Well, one of the best machines is our weightlifting machine, and that one uses vacuum pistons to push against us, kind of like a, if you were trying to open up a clamshell, pushing us to, uh, together from both sides, and we have to hold it up. And we can get up to 600 pounds uh, of pressure on that so we can keep our spine and our legs and our core muscles strong. Hi, my name is Jeffrey, and my question is how you get back to Earth. Hi, Jeffrey. Just to my right here and on the side is a spaceship. It's a SpaceX Dragon capsule. That is how I'm going to get back to Earth. We're going so fast right now with a lot of energy, 17,500 miles an hour. And that spacecraft has an engine in it that will slow us down so Earth's gravity can pick us up and let us fall back down through the atmosphere. And then the atmosphere itself and the friction from that because we hit it so fast is going to slow us down the rest of the way until the parachutes can open and we'll land in the ocean. Hi, 
My name is Jaden, and my question is, how do you maintain your mental health being away from your family? That's a great question. The, um, we have lots of things here that are just wonderful. Uh, I can make a phone call to just about anyone th that I want if I know their phone number. And so I talk to my wife and my daughter most every day. And I get a chance to have a video conference, much like we're having right now with them once a week. And we have email as well, so we can stay in contact. And that's really important so that even though I'm away, I can keep up with the news at home, the news of the family. And it really helps us to feel uh, more connected to the earth. I've never felt lonely up here because of all these things that we have. I might feel alone, but never lonely. Hi, my name is Jessica. My question is, how do you get accepted into the astronaut program? Well, you can get accepted probably by starting right now at the age that you are, by studying hard, taking care of your body, taking care of yourself, being involved in some sport, uh, and joining clubs, being a part of a group of people, particularly in a leadership role where you have to make decisions, uh, particularly decisions that have consequences. All those things are not easy to do. So it takes years and years and even decades to learn how to do them. Government form you fill out, but uh, Go ahead and apply. I think NASA would love to hear from you. And there's a several stage pro process after that. They do a physical, make sure you're healthy, and then you might have a chance to join the astronaut office. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.
I have a, a feather in my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather. When did the exploration of space begin? At what time did man first conceive the journey to the moon? For thousands of years, the astrologers, the philosophers, the writers of fiction have dreamed of such a journey, a long, impossible dream. But soon, the dream will come true. In this sixth decade of the 20th century, the first men will land and walk upon the surface of the moon. to the moon is not an isolated event. It is the result of a decade of research and discovery in space exploration. At NASA research centers, scientists, engineers, and technicians developed and tested new families of scientific satellites, unmanned spacecraft, which would extend man's senses where he could not yet see, or hear, or touch. Spacecraft which took scientific equipment and experiments into the unknown darkness and sent back the light of new knowledge. From these satellites, man has learned the nature of microscopic particles in space. He has measured air density at great altitudes, discovered how electrons deflect radio waves in the ionosphere, and where radiation belts encircle our planet. He has determined the true shape of the Earth, and mapped it more precisely, made new measurements of solar energy, and sent telescopes into the night for a first clear look at the stars. Some were joint efforts to add to man's knowledge. The combined scientific quest of other nations and the launch technology of our own. The early scientific satellites carried only instruments into space. Later, they would carry life, plants and animals, ranging from microorganisms to primates. These biosatellites told us how weightlessness, radiation, velocity and pressure affected life in the new environment called space. As man learned more about the Earth and near space, he sought to know about his neighbors in the solar system. Probes were hurled through interplanetary space to the neighborhood of Venus and Mars. Nearing Venus, our spacecraft reported the atmosphere to be very dense, the surface hot enough to melt lead. These investigations told scientists that on Venus there is little likelihood of life as we know it. NASA also sent deep space probes sailing across uncharted seas more than 360 million miles to look for a brief but wondrous moment at our nearest planetary neighbor, Mars. We learned that Mars is probably more like the moon than Earth, pockmarked with craters, with little or no magnetic field or gravity. A 
As important as the return of scientific information was the new confidence gained in our technological maturity that man could design and control such complex operations across millions of miles of interplanetary space. Over the past decade, scientists also developed complex new instruments to probe the intimate secrets of the long, mysterious moon. Television cameras took us live and close up to the lunar surface. Our spacecraft landed softly in the lunar seas. They examined the moon's color and sampled its chemical composition. sunset on the surface of the moon, saw the sun eclipsed by the earth, and looked back at his own planet a quarter of a million miles away. Other spacecraft circled the moon, photographing its yawning craters and soaring peaks, mapping more than 95% of its entire surface. studies prove that man could land and walk upon the lunar soil. In this first decade of the space age, the science and technology which was used to explore outer space was also applied to practical benefits here on Earth. Down-to-Earth satellites provide a constant watch on the world's weather serve as beacons for navigation by ship or plane, send voice and picture from any point on Earth to any other. In 10 years, we have come from a few experimental weather satellites to an operational system capable of night and day observations around the world. Today, satellites take portraits of storms that span half a continent and transmit them to meteorologists in many nations. They have detected hurricanes and typhoons and given valuable hours of warning to those who live and work in their pathways. Man has also learned to communicate by satellite first with a great balloon that served as a reflector in the sky for earthbound transmitters. For most of the past decade, it provided millions around the world with their first glimpse of a man-made star zooming across the sky. Other satellites followed that could perform increasingly complicated communication tasks. Today, the technology proved out by these first families of satellites has been put to commercial use in an operational system which is available not only to television networks and businesses, but to people everywhere. All the world has been united to witness historic moments. Communication satellites have provided a valuable bridge to scientists working at distant points in the world. But space research was not the only mission of NASA. The first A in the name of this new organization stands for aeronautics. An airplane without wings. The lifting body. Someday, such a vehicle may be used to bring man back from space through the fiery re-entry of the Earth's atmosphere to a landing on the runway of tomorrow's airport. In 10 years, 
The field of aeronautics has kept pace with man's desire to fly ever higher, faster, and farther. Research has gone forward in jet noise, sonic boom, and aircraft safety. Hypersonic aircraft have been designed and built to fly to the dark edges of space. But the journey to the edge of space was not far enough. Man needed bigger rockets with greater power, the ability to cross the threshold of space for himself. In the 1960s, manned space travel became a reality. Many men here on Earth helped ready the systems which would take a few men across that frontier. The astronauts, star sailors on a formidable sea, conditioned themselves for the new phenomena of space. Then came the day when the first man was ready. Astronaut Alan Shepard became the first American to enter space. Many astronauts would follow on longer voyages into space. John Glenn, first American to orbit the Earth. The experience of each added more knowledge to the textbook for all of those who would come after them. From these first flights came important information about the men, their spacecraft, and the facilities and personnel who supported them. Man could withstand the force of gravity many times his own weight. Man could live for extended periods, weightless in the vacuum of space. Man could maneuver his own spacecraft in orbit, make scientific measurements, take photographs of the space around him and the Earth below. 76, Houston is standing by. Roger, understand. Station keeping at 120 feet. Man could locate other spacecraft hundreds of miles across the ocean of space. Man could rendezvous and dock with spacecraft sent into orbit ahead of him. Okay, uh, we're going to cycle our stop on switch. Uh, Roger. Okay, Houston, we have Man 
could perform complex scientific and technological experiments in space. Man could walk and work outside his spacecraft. man hundreds of miles above Earth. Yet he dreamed of more distant and demanding voyages, expeditions which would require bigger rockets and more sophisticated spacecraft, larger crews and longer times. And so, man began his preparations for the moon, and the nation was ready to meet the challenge. Behind the spaceman have stood thousands of engineers, scientists and technicians, all part of the team dedicated to building and testing the many components which contributed to the dream. America called upon its industry and its institutions, placed new demands and offered new challenges to the establishments of our time. Education contributed ideas and experiments, scientific expertise and manpower. Industry solved thousands of insoluble problems, found new methods and new materials when they were needed, achieved new heights in quality control and rates of performance. Sometimes there were failures and accidents that claimed men's lives. The astronaut pilot of this research vehicle landed safely. continued the work to be done. Youth witnesses the culmination of a dream. Here in this building at the Kennedy Space Center, the mighty Saturn V rocket is ready. This is the vehicle which will thrust three Americans toward the moon in the greatest voyage of this century. adventure begins here at one mile per hour. A giant slowly and ponderously inching its way toward the pad, carrying with it the plans and performances of multitudes of people.
A series of test flights with the Saturn V rocket was essential to man's landing on the moon. 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. 5, 4, we have ignition. began with Apollo 8. Three days and 238,000 miles away from Earth, the pioneers of Apollo 8 came face to face with the lunar landscape. later came the second manned mission in the Saturn V rocket, the Earth orbital flight of Apollo 9, to test further the men and the new machine called the Lunar Module. Despite illness and anxious moments, the mission was successful. The command and lunar modules could separate across the vastness of space and could come safely together again. Two 
of the astronauts entered the lunar module and took it down to within 50,000 feet of the lunar surface. The final and most critical tests were completed successfully. The Sea of Tranquility now awaits the arrival of the first men from Earth. Monitor descent. Descent. Helium monitor select switch to supercritical position. Supercritical. Three men will make the journey. Astronauts Neil Armstrong, Edwin Aldrin, and Michael Collins. They will share some of the experiences of those who preceded them. The launching, Earth orbit, rendezvous and docking, lunar orbit, separation of the command and lunar modules. Astronaut Collins will remain aboard the command module in lunar orbit. Astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin will land on the moon. Here on Earth, they have rehearsed the activities they will perform. Ten short years, we have come a long way, but man's journey into space has just begun. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. But in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. We make this judgment affirmatively, it will be an entire nation. Failure is an option. It's where you learn from your mistakes and get back up again and try again. My name is An Nguyen and I'm bringing new capabilities to small spacecraft. CubeSat are a class of small satellites. This is a spacecraft. People have been adopting them all the way from elementary schools to NASA and commercial ventures. If we want to go beyond Earth, we need these capabilities. We are the first to fly these technologies. They are risky. You know, you can get creative to do the test that you want to do. If one of these spacecraft goes out of commission, then we send up a few more. This is what we've done. We've qualified all these components in space, and we've qualified this technology that it can be done on a CubeSat. As humans, we're so interested to see what's out there, what can we do. Me and my NASA friends here, we go exploring a lot. Multi-day rafting trips, backpacking trips, we go scuba diving together. It's kind of that same exploration. What could we do to push the boundaries?
Space Launch System is the next newest, biggest rocket that we're going to build. And it's not just a replacement for the Space Shuttle. This rocket is going to carry us much further than the shuttle would go. It's NASA's next big rocket for um, deep space exploration. The SLS is a national capability that provides um, a unique access to space that America has not had in 40 years. A large launch vehicle like this um, really opens the door to destinations beyond. It's not limited by destination. It's only limited really by imagination. What we're focused on here at this center is the propulsion system. And uh, that consists of two solid rocket boosters and a core with some tanks that feed uh, some liquid rocket engines in the middle. And then the astronauts sit on the top in the Orion um, uh, spacecraft. One of the things we recognized for SLS is we had to be affordable. So we had to do things differently, more efficiently, and smarter. We're all conscious about saving money doing it uh, more affordable than we have in the past. But at the same time, we can't sacrifice reliability or safety. The system uses a um, significant amount of heritage hardware, which is things that we've evolved from the Space Shuttle program. The Space Shuttle had two kind of candle-looking things, which are the solid rockets. Those are kept, and those are used on SLS. We've added a segment uh, to the four-segment solid rocket boosters that we had on shuttle. That gives it more power, more thrust, and it helps this larger rocket get off the ground. What those boosters are for is just to get you going. They burn for a couple of minutes, and then they fall to the ground. Then your liquid engines, you're up high enough, your liquid engines can carry your vehicle to as high as you want to go, and if you have additional stages, like we're going to have one, then you can go further out into space. Right now, the inventory that we've got uh, consists of 14 engines that have flown on shuttle. We've got one engine that was assembled and still needs green run testing or certification testing. We looked at all the spares. As we collected the spares, we determined that we could assemble a 16th engine. So we'll have 16 engines that we'll be able to use for flight. We are making tremendous progress. We've got all of our prime contractors on board. Um, we're testing engines, we're testing solid rocket boosters, our avionics systems. J2X has set, uh, recently set a record at Stennis. Uh, when we were testing, it was the first liquid oxygen engine to get to a full duration test in four tests. We were developing this booster under the ARI program, and, and we're moving that into the SLS vehicle. The motor itself has been through three development firings, which are full-scale motors tested out in Utah, um, um, and we've gotten a lot of good data, engineering data, from those tests. This is an adapter that goes between the bottom of the Ryan capsule and the top of the Space Launch System rocket that we're developing here at Marshall. It's been specifically designed to give strength to the adapter so that it can take the loads in flight and still be lightweight. This shape started out as a series of flat panels. Um, the isogrid pattern was machined into the surfaces. Then they were formed, it was called bump, in a process called bump forming, to make them into the shape that we need here. And we weld three of these segments together to form the cone that you see behind me. We just, uh, you know, delivered the first crew module uh, to the ONC building at KSE. We started a lot of the uh, parts onto the outside of the uh, CM, and we've actually put it in what we call the bird cage, so we can locate all those parts, you know, within, you know, thousands of an inch to make sure that uh, everything is going together okay putting, you know, wiring inside of it, putting tubes for the, you know, for the propulsion system, putting valves and pumps, and so all of that happens in stages right there uh, in the ONC building. We have uh, on contract with USA, United Space Alliance, to build uh, our harnesses. They're set up shop in the ONC, and so their little shop delivers to, to the big shop. 
Federal protection is very difficult in, in re-entry vehicles to, to test and to model. I mean, really, you have to, you have to fly it to really understand what's going to happen. We're building ceramic thermal insulation tiles for the back shell of the capsule. Uh, we're building thermal barriers for the capsule, and we're building multi-layer insulation for that capsule. I'm the heat shield design lead. So we're designing and building the heat shield for the future Orion missions. The heat shield right now is in uh, our big 20 by 20 router. It's a five axis router and uh, right now it's machining uh, the interior bowl, if you will, of the heat shield. To cut out that heat shield on the, on the router it could take weeks of machine time uh, running multiple shifts. It's the biggest heat shield uh, ever constructed. The other component is the heat shield skeleton, so that's the piece of the titanium substructure, the backbone that makes up the, the carrier structure itself. Another unique thing is all the hand drilling that we're doing, so it's not automated by a router in this case, and it all has to be, be hand, hand drilled by technicians on the inside. 200 plus titanium parts all match drilled together. So we have a a uh, tool that puts all the pieces in the right spot and then we drill and high lock them all together. MCC is transforming from uh, supporting space shuttle and space station to a platform that will support space station and MPCB or Orion. In order to adapt to the future, we need to go to a more modern system. KSC will, will operate the vehicle all the way up until launch. We'll operate the vehicle until splashdown and the recovery forces come in and take over after that. Firing Room 1 is the launch control room we're going to use for Orion SLS for EM-1 missions. We've been working with the Orion program to get the spacecraft data so we can, we can process it with our software in the firing room and we will be flight following that mission out of Fire Room 1. We refitted the room, we redid it, putting the sound suppression carpeting on the walls, making it kind of a more comfortable place to work. So we're aiming for about 50 people in Fire Room 1 for an EM-1 mission. We are actually using Fire Room 1 right now to test Pad B uh, subsystems. This pad is going to be a, almost like a complete new pad because we will have refurbished each and every system that it's inside of that. We're gonna have the vehicle uh, launch from the mobile launcher, and not only launch from the mobile launcher, but have a tower that, that will have all the services attached to the vehicle. The tower is gonna be on the mobile launcher. The vehicle will be assembled at the VAB. It's a return to a concept that we knew that worked very well during the Apollo years when the mobile launch platform had a tower on it. We knew that the VAB was designed to accommodate a launch tower on a mobile launch platform. We have to make sure that the, v the VAB can remain adaptable and accommodate different vehicle architectures. And now we have a clean VAB uh, shell, per se, the, the infrastructure, so that we can accommodate the, the new hardware, the new vehicle access with uh, new platforms. And that is the first phase that we're doing now. And once the vehicle is ready with all the connections, the only thing we got to do is move the vehicle to the pad, do the connections to the mobile launcher. And once we do those connections, we're ready to launch. There was a time where I had to explain what a crawler was. Um, if you didn't work out here at the Space Center or if you weren't in the Central Florida area, a lot of people just, uh, you know, somehow the, the vehicle got out to the pad. We knew what to expect from a, a load perspective with the new vehicle, the larger rocket and things along those lines. And that goes from the crawler lifted load, the hydraulics, also to the crawler way. Um, we're going to have to increase uh, the load capability for the crawler way itself uh, with the rock. What we've essentially done is keep all the same hydraulic components, but just in, uh, increase the size, the diameter of the hydraulic cylinders. Last November, we actually took a, took a ride out with the completed crawler 2 after the pad and tested out the systems and a couple punchless items, but everything worked great. The control system had been upgraded. The, uh, the, cabs, the driver's cab consoles had all been replaced. The brakes had all been replaced. 
Uh, nearly every subsystem had some kind of work done to it. The traction support elements, uh, each of the, the four corners has 22 rollers that are about the size of a car, to be honest with you, and uh, we're changing out all of those and enlarging those as well. What I love doing is reminding the outside world, whether it's within our government or especially the media, that has a perception that we're in a lull, that there's nothing going on, that the, you know, the space program's shutting down, to kind of dispel that rumor and say, no, this is the, the far opposite for us. We are utilizing this inter-program time frame to make all the modifications and all the infrastructure changes that it will help bring that agency vision into reality. Many of us feel the country wants to go forward, and, and, and NASA has a big following, and every time I talk to people, they're excited about NASA. Enabling people to go beyond where they have ever gone before and look and discover things that they didn't even know existed is just, it's just a real honor. It's been a pleasure to be involved with this project, and I can't say enough for the team that's put this together. I'm privileged to work this program. I think most people who are working it today feel the same way. I can't believe they pay me for this job. It's just wonderful. It's great. Very rarely do you get the opportunity to kind of literally from the ground up put together a factory whose sole purpose is to go make history and do exciting things for not just NASA but for America and for the whole world. We're in the process of getting the factory ready for SLS production. And in that process, there's a series of new tools that we've been in, uh, installing in the factory. Now we have not just put in new tooling, there's some legacy tooling that we're using. Most of the external tank buildings are being reused. We have a lot of construction going on for those, getting ready for a rocket that's the uh, same diameter, but a little bit longer. Not only are we using the legacy knowledge, the lessons learned, we're also incorporating new technologies. The, the tool that today is in the vertical friction stir welding center and its, its job is to produce the um, cylinders that make up the parts of the tank that will be stacked. And that is going to be the tool that joins every panel on every barrel for the, the rocket. This device will actually do the weld in a single pass and then also do inspection. So these are the large barrel sections of the, the core stage that will be the foundation or the beginning rocket that will actually take our crews beyond the moon and, and really propel us into space. Here at Marshall, we've designed the interface hardware in between the Orion capsule and that upper stage. The MSA, I think, is a great example of a couple things. One, it's actually a piece of hardware that we're flying on an early test, but we're also going to fly for the long term. So this is the same design that we'll use when Orion's on the SLS and we're actually flying people. Today, we've been taking the two unique pieces of hardware uh, that are supposed to have a common interface, basically lowering them together, bolting, and making sure that they fit. Well, we're going to test a lot of the key systems on Orion and also for SLS with the upper stage of the MSA that are going to be used when we uh, fly people into deep space. Most recently, we've been involved with NASA with the SLS development using our unique forming technology along with our other core processes in terms of machining, welding, heat treating, and inspection technologies. Really is a one-stop shop is what you, way you would describe it. Right behind me, you have the first cap, first weld development cap, or I think you call it the weld confidence cap. The production order will start deliveries in 2014. Spincraft also builds the domes for the upper stage Delta IV vehicle, which will be used for the EFT-1 flight, as well as the first two production flights of the SLS program. For the SLS PDR, our primary role is the overall communication and outreach support that we provide back to Todd May's office for SLS. We provide all of the communication support for that particular team, that program and project. Well, it's a preliminary design review, and uh, primarily it's a technical review to make sure that the design is acceptable and at the appropriate level of maturity. There's a lot of discussions, there's a lot of meetings across the board from technical, cost, schedule, performance data, safety, human factors. It's like a health check on the program. Um, those of us that are working on the program, uh, we've got our head down, we're, we're doing our 
pieces. Um, and, and sometimes when you're working real close to things, you don't necessarily see everything. So there's so many moving parts and so many things going on at the agency, um, as well as the center, that to show people that we are moving in the right direction to pull together the complete story of where we are as a program. Watching at it from a higher level uh, headquarters viewpoint, it's just gratifying to see the the accomplishments that the, that the teams have made and continue to make every day. For CT2, we're doing modifications, not only to make it last another 20 years, but also to upgrade the load capacity. The main project we're working on right now is the roller replacement project, which is the roller assembly. It's actually the rollers, the shafts, the bearings that support the crawler. Actually, if you go there, you'll see trucks A and C jacked up and on uh, cribbing. And that's the first time in the career of the crawler it's ever actually been jacked off the ground. So that the guys have easy access to the, um, the rollers, roller assemblies. And they're in the process now of removing the old rollers, old shafts and old parts. Um, once they've uh, done the line boring, that's when they'll start assembling the new rollers and the new shafts and the new bearings and the new sleeves and the new adapters and new plates. So there's quite a bit of work and that work will go well from August through October. So there's gonna be a lot of trucks delivering a lot of steel uh, here at Kennedy. We started actually the new design for flame deflector as well as a refurbishment of the flame trench and that's because of the new requirements for SLS and uh, commercial vehicles. We've started the demolition of the flame deflector. We've got concerns of, you know, due to age and the debonding of the flame trench structure, this would possibly be a safety hazard for, um, you know, our new program. And that's why we had to go in and do a new design and refurbish this flame deflector and flame trench. These pieces here, they're not just one program, it's not just one mission, it's part of a capability that will enable this country to be a leader in space, to continue to take people from the Earth well beyond low Earth orbit out into deep space. And this is the hardware that will do that over multiple decades in the future. So the work that's been accomplished so far is primarily structural type work, right? It's a lot of drilling, a lot of secondary structure installation, mechanical structures, the support structures. The next step is starting to install the subsystems. When we actually perform the welding on tubes for propulsion in the environmental controls and life support systems, um, those have to be at a higher level of cleanliness. When you look at the facility, um, there are these very large walls that are that are on the perimeter of the structure itself, and, and those are called HEPA filter walls. We can perform clean room work for the tubing um, concurrently uh, while on the outside doing more standard clean room. So our goal is next summer sometime um, to turn the vehicle over, early summer, over to the ground operations organization so they can start their processing. Well, the service module is attached below the crew module and it has the prop tanks and the engine, radiators, solar panels. The service module it all came in pieces. You know, there's 49 composite panels on the, on the SM. The actual structure itself is aluminum. That's the core skeleton where these composite panels were attached to. After it, the CM releases and the CM returns to Earth, the, the SM will just burn up with the, with the upper stage of the uh, Delta IV. We performed two primary tests so far. The proof pressure test, which is just the pressure vessel, and that is, that is put into the proof pressure cell. It, it's, it's pressurized in a relatively high pressure. We're testing how well the vehicle was built. And then the follow-on test is the static loads test where the vehicle goes through eight different loads test cases. And so the vehicle is put under, under pressure, it's put under tension, it's put under compression. The whole intent is to simulate similar conditions that the vehicle would experience, say, in flight, in launch, in, in, and also in landing and recovery.
we, we usually get the abort motor first, and for this mission, the abort motor is inert, uh, being a nominal flight. We're going to have instrumentation on it to, again, understand more about the loads and environments that we expect to see in flight, but it will be an inert uh, propellant that's cast into the motor. This time we got the jettison motor next, and that's the only live component of this vehicle. We do a, a nominal jettison, the jettison motor fires, the last separates from the CM, and the CM continues on its mission. You know, one of the challenges of any new system is understanding the loads uh, as you send up through the atmosphere and, and the dynamics, the acoustics, and uh, we'll be able to gather a lot of that information. The back shell, it looks, though, though it looks the same as what we flew on shuttle, it is different. We kind of took the best aspects and put them together to meet uh, Lockheed Martin's requirements for, for the Orion capsule. Two major things we're trying to accomplish here. One of them is to prevent micrometeorite damage when we're on orbit for long duration. The other, would, of course, is, is the re-entry aspect. The skin that you see on the capsule, what you would see on orbit, sits on top of a composite substrate, what we call the back shell panel. That, that, that when combined together gives you the complete back shell. There's some sections that have some very complex geometry. So what we're going to do for the first time is take a substrate that's built by Lockheed Martin and put it together with the tiles that are manufactured by Jacobs and, and validate the fit up. Like any test vehicle, you're, you're heavily instrumented. We're gonna come back with a tremendous amount of data on how, how the system performed. This first flight test of Orion is really to, to understand how the heat shield performs and that heat shield being going final manufacturing at Textron. Textron's had a long association with NASA and working in the uh, space area for space protection. Uh, the technology today has advanced tremendously. Our manufacturing technology has advanced, but ironically, we're still using a material that has proven itself for the last 40 years. Avcoat is a uh, very efficient ablator, and as an ablator, uh, what it does, it allows us to protect the capsule from the high heating that occurs during re-entry. There is no material, non-ablator material, that can handle that kind of heat. You have to shed away uh, the heat. Basically, what you're doing is you peel off the layers of the heat shield. You're taking heat with it. When we apply Avcoat to the heat shield, uh, we bond the honeycomb onto the carrier structure and then we inject the Avcoat ablative material into the cells. The honeycomb acts as a, a crack arrestor and gives it rigidity and, and strength as a whole. We know we're on the critical path for the Orion program and so our employees are literally working all hours, all days of the week to make sure that we get our schedule. We know there'll be more heat shields coming and we're very excited about that. Our job is to make sure they're perfect. The development programs I find uh, uh, just awesome because this is where you're coming up with the new ideas, you're creating the, the new vehicles, you're, 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 pushing, you're pushing the boundaries in essence. You can feel that we're going to go do this. The hardware is starting to come, the Orion hardware is getting ready for its first flight test down at the Kennedy Space Center. The excitement is here. We are really ready to get going. So we are far from being out of space. We are really getting ready to go into space. That's so rewarding to see our focus into what's next because this really is our future. I know the day that we fly this thing, there are going to be thousands of people that are going to be excited that are working on this and the NASA workforce and the contractor workforce. We're going to be proud of the work that this team has done and I think we're going to be proud of our country too. It's going to be a pretty exciting time. I'm ready to build a rocket and we are ready and we want to build it on time. We are SCAN. We are advancing today's space communication and navigation services and technologies to meet tomorrow's challenges. SCAN is committed to ensuring vital space communications through a network of complex ground stations and tracking data relay satellites. Together, these systems enable continuous communications and global coverage for space programs. Every space mission delivers terabytes of vital information for the process of scientific discovery. Our extensible 
and expandable communication and navigation infrastructure provides a resilient space framework that can meet the growing requirements of our users. We develop, operate, manage, and engineer pioneering solutions. Transformational technologies in satellite communications are underway. Cognitive systems will enable autonomous satellite networks and optical communications will increase our ability to send and receive data to the vastness of space. We are developing these and other technologies to advance explorations of Earth, the lunar region, and beyond. Spectrum, the medium that enables communications and navigation through coordination we ensure efficient use of this limited resource. We work with PT partners to provide space missions accurate position and timing information. The most exciting part of this journey lies ahead, collaborating with commercial industry on major advancements in space communications. Our next generation of visionaries are creating a bright future, enabling Artemis lunar communications and a pathway to Mars. NASA Space Communications and Navigation. Scan. Exploration enabled. We've all seen the Martian, and we know we need breathable oxygen to survive on Mars. What's up, Watney? It turns out it's a lot better to be able to extract it from the atmosphere of Mars, then bring it with you on the trip over, if you have the technology. Let's see how close we are on this episode of Crazy Engineering. I'm here with Jim. He's going to teach us how to get oxygen on the surface of Mars. Jim, can you tell us where we are right now? Absolutely. This is the JPL Mars Oxygen in situ Resource Utilization Laboratory. We call this the MOXIE Lab for short. The MOXIE instrument is a demonstration mission designed to prove that we can produce pure oxygen on the surface of Mars. If it's successful, NASA may opt to send a dedicated mission to produce oxygen for humans to use in the future. So how do we make oxygen on the surface of Mars? It's actually a fairly easy process. Basically what we do is we take Mars atmosphere, we run it into a unit called a solid oxide electrolysis unit, which is basically a fuel cell in reverse. Wait a second, reverse fuel cell? How does that work? So this is a solid oxide electrolysis unit. What happens is, is we have Mars atmosphere enter in this line, goes into the SOXI unit. It's then heated up to 800 degrees Celsius. We inject energy into the cathode and anode. And then what happens is, is oxygen is separated from the CO2 and comes out this line over here. This line here is the waste gases that's left over from the catalyst process. To test this technology, you're going to need some Martian atmosphere. Where on earth are you going to find that? We know the composition of Martian atmosphere. It's 95% CO2 with some trace gases. And there are companies here on Earth that will mix that gas for us. We call it Mars Mixed Gas, and we use it for most of our testing. Well, what if we land on top of a mountain or down in a valley? The conditions for extracting oxygen are totally different. We've got to test for all of that. So the way we test for it is we design an instrumentation system that covers all of the conditions of the instrument. Lower pressures, higher pressures, clogging filters, oxygen purity, all of that stuff. Why don't we just bring the oxygen with us when we go to Mars? It's very difficult to bring something from the surface of the Earth to the surface of Mars, and it costs millions and millions of dollars. So it's much easier and better for us if we try to get that resource from the planet. Well, it's obviously a huge challenge, but we're both really optimistic up here. We're excited to see it on the Mars 2020 mission. Check back soon for some more crazy engineering. Heads up, Watney. 